Section One of the Macdermots of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Newfeld. The Macdermots of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section One. Ballycloran House as first seen by the author. In the autumn, 1840, business took me into the west of Ireland, and, amongst other places, to the quiet little village of Drumsna, which is in the province of Connaught, County Leitrim, about seventy-two miles west-northwest of Dublin, on the mail-coach road to Sligo. I reached the little inn there in the morning by the said mail, my purpose being to leave it late in the evening by the day-coach. And as my business was but of short duration, I was left, after an early dinner, to amuse myself. Now, in such a situation, to take a walk is all the brightest man can do, and the dullest always does the same. There is a kind of gratification in seeing what one has never seen before, be it ever so little worth seeing, and the gratification is the greater if the chances be that one will never see it again. Now, Drumsna stands on a bend in the Shannon. The street leads down to a bridge, passing over which one finds oneself in the county Roscommon, and the road runs by the well-wooded domain of Sir G. K. Moreover, there is a beautiful little hill, from which the domain, river, bridge, and village can all be seen, and what further agreements than these could be wanted to make a pretty walk? But, alas, I knew not of their existence then. One cannot ask the maid at an inn to show one where to find the beauties of nature. So, trusting to myself, I went directly away from river, woods, and all, along as dusty, ugly, and disagreeable a road as is to be found in any county in Ireland. After proceeding a mile or so, taking two or three turns to look for improvement, I began to perceive evident signs on the part of the road of retrograding into laneism. The county had evidently deserted it, and though made for cars and coaches, its traffic appeared to be now confined to donkeys, carrying turf home from the bog, in double kishes on their back. Presently the fragments of a bridge presented themselves, but they were too utterly fallen away from their palmy days, and in their present state afforded but indifferent stepping-stones over a bog stream, which ran, or rather crept, across the road. These, however, I luckily traversed, and was rewarded by finding a broken-down entrance to a kind of wood on the right hand. In Ireland, particularly in the poorer parts, to rank among which County Leitrim has a right which will not be disputed, a few trees together are always the recognized sign of a domain, of a gentleman's seat, or the place where a gentleman's seat has been, and I directly knew that this must be a domain. But, ah, how impoverished, if one might judge from outward appearances! Two brick pillars, from which the outside plaster had peeled off and the coping fallen, gave evidence of former gates. The space was closed up with a loose-built wall, but on the outer side of each post was a little well-worn footpath, made of soft bog mould. I, of course, could not resist such temptation, and entered the domain. The road was nearly covered with that short dry grass which stones seemed to throw up, when no longer polished by the wealthier portion of man or brute kind. About thirty feet from the gap a tall fir had half fallen and lay across the road, so that a man should stoop to walk under it. It was a perfect barrier to any equipage, however humble, and the roots had nearly refixed themselves in their reversed position, showing that the tree had evidently been in that fallen state for years. The usual story, thought I, of Connaught gentlemen, an extravagant landlord, reckless tenants, debt, embarrassment, despair, and ruin. Well, I walked up the deserted avenue, and very shortly found myself in front of the house. Oh, what a picture of misery, of useless expenditure, unfinished pretense, 
and premature decay. The house was two stories high, with large stone steps up to the front door, with four windows in the lower and six in the upper story, and an area with kitchens, etc., below. The entire roof was off. One could see the rotting joists and beams, some fallen, some falling, the rest ready to fall, like the skeleton of a felon left to rot on an open gibbet. The stone steps had nearly dropped through into the area, the rails of which had been wrenched up. The knocker was still on the door, a large modern lion-headed knocker, but half the door was gone. On creeping to the door sill, I found about six feet of the floor of the hall gone also, stolen for firewood. But the jousts of the flooring were there, and the whitewash of the wall showed that but a few, a very few years back, the house had been inhabited. I leaped across the gulf, at great risk of falling into the cellar, and reached the bottom of the stairs. Here my courage failed me. All that was left was so damp and so rotten, so much had been gradually taken away, that I did not dare to go up. The doors on the ground floor would not open, the ceiling above me was all gone, and I could see the threatening timbers of the roof, which seemed only hanging till they had an opportunity of injuring someone by their fall. I crept out of the demi-door again, and down the ruined steps, and walked round the mansion. Not only was there not a pane of glass in the hole, but the window frames were all gone. Everything that wanted keeping was gone, everything that required care to preserve it had perished. Time had not touched it, time had evidently not yet had leisure to do his work. He is sure, but slow. Ruin works fast enough unaided, where once he puts his foot. Time would have pulled down the chimneys, ruin had taken off the slates, time would have bulged the walls. Ruin brought in the rain, rotted the timbers, and assisted the thieves. Poor old time will have but little left him at Ballycloran. The gardens had been large. Half were now covered by rubbish heaps, and the other half consisted of potato patches, and round the outhouses I saw clustering a lot of those wretched cabins which the poor Irish build against a deserted wall, when they can find one, as jackdaws do their nests in a superannuated chimney. In the front there had been, I presume, a tolerably spacious lawn, with a drive through it, surrounded on all sides, except towards the house, by thick trees. The trees remained, but the lawn, the drive, and the flower patches, which of course once existed there, were now all alike equally prolific in large brown dock weeds and sorrels. There were two or three narrow footpaths through and across the space, up to the cabins behind the house, but other marks of humanity were there none. A large ash, apparently cut down years ago, with the branches still on it, was stretched somewhat out of the wood. On this I sat, lighted a cigar, and meditated on this characteristic specimen of Irish life. The sun was setting beautifully behind the trees, and its imperfect light through the foliage gave the unnatural ruin a still stronger appearance of death and decay, and brought into my mind thoughts of the wrong, oppression, misery, and despair to which some one had been subjected by what I saw before me. I had not been long seated when four or five ragged boys and girls came through the wood, driving a lot of geese along one of the paths. When they saw me, they all came up and stood round me, as if wondering what I could be. I could learn nothing from them. The very poor Irish children will never speak to you. But a middle-aged man soon followed them. He told me the place was called Ballycloran. He did not know who it belonged to. A gentleman in Dublin received the rents, and a very stiff gentleman he was, too and hard it was upon them to pay two pound tin an acre for the garden there, and that half covered with the old house and the bricks and the rubbish, only on behalf of the bog that was convenient, and plenty of the timber, though that was rotten, and elegant outhouses for the pigs and the geese, and the old bricks of the wall were good manure for the praties. 
This, in all my farming, I had never dreamt of. But times was very hard on the poor, the praties being ninepence a stone at Carrick all last summer. God help the poor, the creatures, for the gentlemen, their real friends that should be, couldn't help themselves now, let alone others, and so on. Now speaking of his sorrow and poverty, and again discanting on the elegance of his abode. I could only learn that a family called the McDermott's had lived there some six or seven years back, that they were an unfortunate people, he had heard tell, but he had not been in the country then, and it was a bloody story, etc., etc., etc. The evening was drawing on, and the time for my coach to come was fast approaching, so I was obliged to leave Ballycloran, unsatisfied as to its history, and to return to Drumsna. Here I had no time to make further inquiries, as Mr. Hartley's servants always keep their time, and very shortly the four horses clattered down the hill into the village. I got up behind, for McSee, the guard, was an old friend of mine, and after the usual salutations and strapping of portmanteaus and shifting down into places, as McSee knows everything, I began to ask him if he knew anything of a place called Ballycloran. Deed then, sir, and I do, said he, and good reason have I to know, and well I knew those that lived in it, ruined and black and desolate as Ballycloran is now and between Drumsna and Boyle he gave me the heads of the following story. And, reader, if I thought it would ever be your good fortune to hear the history of Ballachloran from the guard of the Boyle coach, I would recommend you to get it from him and shut my book forthwith. End of section 1. Ballachloran House as first seen by the author. Section two of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Newfeld. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section two. The McDermott family. Maxie's story runs thus. About sixty years ago, a something McDermott, true Milesian, pious Catholic, and descendant of King Somebody, died somewhere, having managed to keep a comfortable little portion of his ancestors' royalties to console him for the loss of their scepter. He, having two sons, and disdaining to make anything but a stated gentleman of them, made over in some fictitious manner, for in those righteous days a Roman Catholic could make no legal will, to his eldest the estate on which he lived, and to the youngest that of Ballycloran, about six hundred as bad acres as a gentleman might wish to call his own. But Thaddeus, otherwise Thaddy McDermott, being an estated gentleman, must have a gentleman's residence on his estate and the house of Ballycloran was accordingly built. Had Thaddy McDermott had ready money, it might have been well built. But, though an estated gentleman, he had none. He had debts, even when his father died, and though he planned, ordered, and agreed for a house, such as he thought the descendant of a Connaught prince might inhabit without disgrace, it was ill-built, half-finished, and paid for by long bills. This, however, is so customary in poor Ireland that it but little harassed Thaddy. He had a fine, showy house with stables, etc., gardens, an avenue, a walk around his domain, and his neighbors had no more. It was little he cared for comfort, but he would not be the first of the McDermott's that would not be respectable. When his house was finished, Thaddy went into County Galway and got himself a wife, with two thousand pounds fortune, for which he had to go to law with his brother-in-law. The lawsuit, the continual necessity of renewing the bills with which the builder in Carrick on Shannon every quarter attacked him, the fruitless endeavour to make his tenants pay thirty shillings an acre for half-reclaimed bog, 
and a somewhat strongly developed aptitude for patine, sent poor Thady to another world rather prematurely, and his son and heir, Lawrence, came to the throne at the tender age of twelve. The Galway brother-in-law compromised the lawsuit, the builder took a mortgage on the property from the boy's guardian, the mother gave new leases to the tenants, Larry went to school at Longford, and Mrs. Mack kept up the glory of Ballycloran. At the age of twenty, Lawrence, or Larry, married a Milesian damsel, portionless but of true descent. The builder from Carrick had made overtures about a daughter he had at home, and offered poor Larry his own house as her fortune, but the blood of the McDermott's could not mix with the lime and water that flowed in the builder's veins. He therefore made an enemy where he most wanted a friend, and brought his wife home to live with his mother. In order that we may quickly rid ourselves of encumbrances, it may be as well to say that during the next twenty-five years his mother and wife died. He had christened his only son Thaddeus after his grandfather, and his only daughter had been christened Euphemia after her grandmother. He had never got over that deadly builder, with his horrid percentage coming out of the precarious rents. Twice, indeed, had writs been out against him for his arrears, and once he had received notice from Mr. Hyacinth Keegan, the oily attorney of Carrick, that Mr. Flannelly meant to foreclose. Rents were greatly in arrear. His credit was very bad among the dealers in Mohill. With Carrick he had no other dealings than those to which necessity compelled him with Mr. Flannery the builder, and Larry McDermott was anything but an easy man. Thaddy was at this time about twenty-four. As had been the case with his father, he had been educated at a country school. He could read and write, but could do little more. He was brought up to no profession or business. He acted as his father's agent over the property, by which I mean to signify that he occupied himself in harrowing the tenantry for money which they had no means of paying. He was occasionally head-driver and ejector, and he considered, as Irish landlords are apt to do, that he had an absolute right over his tenants as feudal vassals. Still they respected, and to a certain extent loved him, for why wasn't he the master's son, and wouldn't he be the master himself? And he had a regard, perhaps an affection, for the poor creatures. Against any one else he would defend them, and would they but coin their bones into pounds, shillings, and pence, he would have been as tender to them as a man so nurtured could be. With all his faults, Thaddy was perhaps a better man than his father. He was not so indomitably idle. Had he been brought up to anything, he would have done it. He was more energetic, and felt the degradation of his position. He felt that his family was sinking lower and lower daily. But as he knew not what to do, he only became more gloomy and more tyrannical. Beyond this, he had acquired a strong taste for tobacco, which he incessantly smoked out of a dudeen, and was content to pass his dull life without excitement or pleasure. Euphemia, or Femi, was about twenty. She was a tall, dark girl, with that bold, upright, well-poised figure which is so peculiarly Irish. She walked as if all the blood of the old Irish princess was in her veins. Her step, at any rate, was princely. Femi also had large, bright brown eyes and long, soft, shining dark hair, which was divided behind and fell over her shoulders, or was tied with ribbons. She had a well-formed nose, as all coming of old families have, and a bright olive complexion. Only the olive was a little too brown, the skin a little too coarse, and then Femi's mouth was, oh, half an inch too long. But her teeth were white and good, and her chin was well turned and short, with a dimple on it large enough for any finger Venus might have put there. In all, Femi was a fine girl, in the eyes of a man not too much accustomed to refinement. Her hands were too large and too red, but if Femi got gloves sufficient to go to mass with, it was all she could do in that way. And 
though Phoebe had as fine a leg as ever bore a pretty girl, she was never well shod. Her shoes were seldom clean, often slipshod, usually in holes, and her stocking. But no, I will not further violate the mysteries of Phoebe's wardrobe. But if the beautiful girls of this poor country knew but half the charms which neatness has, they would not so often appear as poor Phoebe too usually appeared. Like her brother, she was ardent and energetic, if she had aught to be ardent about. She was addicted to novels, which she could get from the dirty little circulating library at Mohill. She was passionately fond of dancing, which was her chief accomplishment. She played on an old spinet which had belonged to her mother, and controlled the motions and actions of the two barefooted damsels who officiated as domestics at Ballycloran. Such was the family at Ballycloran in the summer of 1830, and, though not perfect, I hope they have charms enough to make a further acquaintance not unacceptable. End of section two. The McDermott Family. Section three of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arlene Stebbins. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section three. The Tenantry of Ballycloran. Daddy said old Macdermot as he sat eating stirabout and thick milk over a great turf fire one morning about the beginning of October. Daddy, will you be getting the money out of them born devils this turn, and they owing it some two, some three years this November, bad cess to them for tenants. Daddy, I say, shouted or rather screamed the old man as his son continued silently eating his breakfast. Daddy, I say, they have the money at all at all, any of them, or is it stubborn they are? There's Flannelly and Keegan with their d papers and bills and costs. Will you be making out the hundred forty-two pounds seven shillings six pence before Christmas for the hellhounds? Or it's them will be masters in Ballycloran. Then let the boys see the landlord they'll have over them that time. Well, Larry, said the son, unless in a passion he always called his father by his baptismal name, or rather by its abbreviation. What's the use going on that way before the girls here, and Feemy too? Feemy, however, was reading the mysterious assassin, and paying little heed to her father's lamentations. When we are done and the things is out, we'll have a look at the rent book, and send for the boys to come in. And if they haven't it, why but Brady must go round again, and see what he can do with the potatoes and oats, and the pigs, but the times, Larry, is very hard on them. Too hard entirely, so it is, poor things. Poor things, said the father. And ain't I a poor thing? And won't you and Feemy be poor things? Hard times, too. Who is the hard times hardest on? See that sneaking old robber flannelly that goes and my father. Good father for him with such a house as this that's falling in this day over his son's head, and it not hardly fifty years built bad luck to it for a house. See that old robber Flannelly who's been living and thriving on it for all them years, and a stone or a stick not as good as paid for yet, and he getting two hundred a year off the land from the creators of tenants. True enough it was that Mr. Joe Flannelly, of Carrick on Shannon, whatever might have been the original charge of building the Ballycloran mansion, now claimed two hundred pounds a year from that estate, to which his ingenious friend and legal adviser, Mr. Hyacinth Keegan, usually managed to add certain mysterious costs and ceremonious expenses, which made each half-year's rent of Larry Macdermott's own house about a hundred and forty pounds, before the poor man had managed to scrape it together. To add to this annoyance, Mr. Macdermott had continually before his eyes the time, which he could not but foresee was not distant, when this hated flannelly would come down on the property itself, 
insist on being paid his principal, and probably not only sell, but buy Ballycloran itself. And whither then would the Macdermots betake themselves? Often and often did Larry in his misfortunes regret the slighted offers of Sally Flannelly's charms and cash. Oh, had he but then condescended to have married the builder's daughter, he would not now have been the builder's slave. But Sally Flannelly was now Sally Keegan, the wife of Hyacinth Keegan, Esquire, attorney, who, if he had not the same advantages as Larry in birth and blood, had compensation for his inferiority in cash and comforts. When the poor man thought of these things, and he did little else now but think of them, bitterly, though generally in silence, he cursed him whom he looked upon as his oppressor and incubus. It never occurred to him that if Mr. Flannelly built the house he lived in, he should be paid for it. He never reflected that he had lived to the extent of and above his precarious income, as if his house had been paid for, that instead of passing his existence in hating the Carrick tradesman, he should have used his industry in finding the means to pay him. He sometimes blamed his father, having an indefinite feeling that he ought not to have permitted Flannelly to have anything to do with Ballycloran, after building it, but himself he never blamed. People never do. It is so much easier to blame others, and so much more comfortable. Mr. Macdermott thus regarded his creditor as a vulgar, low-born bloodsucker, who, having by chicanery obtained an unwarrantable hold over him, was determined, if possible, to crush him. The builder, on the other hand, who had spent a long life of constant industry, but doubtful honesty, in scraping up a decent fortune, looked upon his debtor as one who gave himself airs to which his poverty did not entitle him, and was determined to make him feel that though he could not be the father, he could be the master of a real gentleman. After the short conversation between father and son, the breakfast passed over in silence. The father finished his stirabout, and turned round to the blazing turf to find consolation there. Feemy descended into the kitchen to scold the girls, give out the dinner, if there was any to give out, and to do those offices, whatever they be, in performing which all Irish ladies, bred, born, and living in moderate country houses, pass the first two hours after breakfast in the kitchen. Thaddy took his rent-book and went to an outhouse, which he complimented by the name of his office, at the door of which he was joined by Pat Brady. Now, Pat was an appendage unfortunately very necessary in Ireland to such an estate as Macdermott's, and his business was not only to assist in collecting the rents, by taking possession of the little crops and driving the cows or the pig, but he was, moreover, expected to know who could, and who could not, make out the money, to have obtained, and always have ready, that secret knowledge of the affairs of the estate, which is thought to be, and is so, necessary to the managing of the Irish peasantry in the way they are managed. Pat Brady was all this. Moreover, he had as little compunction in driving the cow or the only pig from his neighbour or cousin, and in selling off the oats or potatoes of his uncle or brother-in-law, as if he was doing that which would be quite agreeable to them. But still, he was liked on the estate. He had a manner with him which had its charms to them. He was a kind of leader to them in their agrarian feelings and troubles, and though the tenants of Ballycloran half feared, they all liked and courted Pat Brady. The most remarkable feature in his personal appearance was a broken nose, not a common ordinary broken nose, such as would give it an apparent partiality to the right or left cheek, nor such as would, by indenting it, give the face that good-natured look which Irish broken noses usually possess. Pat Brady's broken nose was all but flattened on to his face, as if it had never lifted its head after the fatal blow which had laid it low. He was strong-built, round-shouldered, bow-legged, about five feet six in height, and he had that kind of external respectability about him, which a tolerably decent hat, strong brogues, and worsted stockings give to a man, when those among whom he lives are without such luxuries. When I add to the above particulars that Pat was chief minister, adviser, and confidential manager in young Macdermott's affairs, I have said all that need be said. The development of his character must be left to disclose itself. "'Well, Pat,' began his master, seating himself on the solitary old chair, which, with a still older-looking desk on four shaking legs, comprised the furniture of Macdermott's rent office, 
"'What news from Mohill to-day? "'Was there much in the fair at all?' "'Well, Your Honour, then, for them as had money to buy, "'the fair was good enough. "'But for them as had money to get it, "'it was as bad as them that were afore it, "'and as them as is likely to come after it. "'Were the boys in it, Pat? "'They were, Your Honour, the most of them. "'Well, Pat, oh, they were just there, that's all.' Tim Brady should have got the top price for that oats of his pat. Maybe he might, Master Daddy. What did he get? There should be twelve barrels there. Eleven or thereabouts, Your Honour. Did he sell it all yesterday? Divil a grain, then, at all at all, he took to the fair yesterday. Bad manners to him, why didn't he? Why, he owes. And Thaddy turned over the old book. Five half years this gale, and there's no use gammonin. Father must get the money off the land, or Flannelly will help himself. I knows, Master Thaddy, I knows all about it. Tim has between five and six acres, and he owes twenty-two pound tin. His oats is worth maybe five pound fifteen, from that to six pound, and his cow about six pound more. That's all Tim has, barring the brats and the mother of them. "'And he knows right well, Your Honour, if he brings you the price of the oats, "'you wouldn't let him off that way, for the cow should folly the oats, as is natural. "'The cabin would be sized next. "'So Tim says, if you choose to take the corn yourself, you can do so, well and good, "'and save him the trouble of bringing it to Mohill. "'Did the widow Reynolds sell her pig?' "'She did, Your Honour, for two pound tin.' and she owes seven pound and dan coolahan dan didn't cut the oats good or bad i'll cut it for him then was old tierney there he war your honour and i was telling him your honour'd be with wantin the money this week and i asked him to stip up a friday mornin and says i mr tierney for since he made out the mare and the old car it's mr tierney he goes by "'It's a fine season anyway for the corn,' says I. "'The Lord be praised, and the hay all saved on them elegant bottoms of yours, Mr. Tierney. "'The master was glad to hear the cocks was all up afore the heavy rain was come. "'Well, Pat,' says he, "'I'll be at Ballycloran on a Friday place, God. "'But it's little I'll have with me but myself, "'and if the master likes the corn and the hay, "'he may just take them, af it's blazing to him. "'For the devil a cock or grain will I sell, and the price is so bad. "'Obstinate old fool, why, Paddy must have the money. "'Money, to be sure he has the money, Mr. Daddy. "'But maybe he'd be the bigger fool if he gave it to your father. "'Do the boys mean to say they won't pay the rent at all? "'They mean to say they can't, and it's nearly through for them. "'Was Joe Reynolds at the fair, Pat? He wore not, that's to say, he wore not at the fair, but I seen him in the evening, with the other boys from Drumlish, at Mrs. Mulrady's. Them boys has always the money when they want a drop of whisky. By dad, if they go to Mulrady's with the money in their pockets on a Tuesday, where's the wonder they come here with them empty on a Friday? Fetch me a call for the pipe, Pat. Whilst Pat walked into the kitchen for a lighted piece of turf, he Bernice coal, to kindle his patron's pipe, Daddy stuck said pipe in his jaw, and continued poring over the unsatisfactory figures of the Ballycloran rent-book. "'I tell you what it is, Pat,' said he, after finishing the process of blowing and drawing and throwing the coal on the earthen floor, and pressing down the hot burning tobacco with the top of his forefinger repeatedly, "'Mr. Joe Reynolds will out of that. I told him so last April, and a divil of a penny of his we've seen since. He don't do the best he can for us, and my belief is he injures the others, eh, Brady? And he looked up into Brady's face for confirmation or refutation of this opinion. But that gentleman, contrary to his usual wont, seemed to have no opinion on the matter. He continued scratching his head and swinging one leg while he stood on the other. Thaddy, finding that his counsellor said nothing, continued. 
Joe Reynolds will out of this time, do you hear? What has he on that bit of land of his? Prate is mostly, Mr. Thady. He had half an acre of weight. He parted on the ground that old Tierney, he old Tierney money. And so the tenants buy the crops from one another, and yet won't pay their own rents. Well, my father's to blame himself, if he'd put a man like Keegan over them, or have them let the land to some rough hand as would make them pay, divil a much he need care for flannelly this day. And you'd be for putting a stranger over them, Mr. Thady, and they that would stand between you are all Aram, or the master, or the old master afore him, because of the dirty money, and because a blackguard and a black ruffian like Flanley has an old paper signed by the master, or the like. And as for Mr. Hoysynth Keegan, I'm thinking the first time he goes collecting on the lands of Drumlish, it's a warm welcome he'll be getting. At any rate, he'll have more creates in his carcass than in his pocket that day. That's very fine talk, Pat. But if Keegan had them, he'd tame them, as he has others afore. Not but I'd be sorry they should be in his hands, the robber bad as they are. But it'll come to that, whether or no. How's my father to get his money for Flannelly? D Flannelly was Brady's easy solution of the family difficulties. Let him take the house he builds and be d to him. And if we can't build a better one for the master and Miss Feeney and you without his help, me Brady's joke me. Boy, Dad, if he take the house and leave his ground, he's my welcome, and say it merely felt the bad. But the land will stick to the house, and mark me when the old flannelly dies, and the devil die along with him, Mr. Keegan of Carrick will write himself, O oh, yes, St. Keegan, Esquire of Ballycloran. May I never see the day, and he and I alive, amen said Brady, as he crossed himself, in sign of the sacred truth of his wish. But I think, Mr. Thady, when you come to consider of it, you'll find plenty of means of keeping Mr. Keegan and Mrs. Keegan out of the parlour of Ballycloran. But about Joe Reynolds, your honour was saying, I was saying that devil another potato he should dig in Drumlish, nor another grain of corn shall he sow or rape, that's what I was saying. Well, Mr. Thady, you're the master, thank God, and if you say so, it must be done. But Joe Reynolds is not that bad either. He was saying, though, at Mrs. Mulready's that he expected little from your honour, but just leave to go where he liked, and leave the cow and the praties behind him. What were they saying at Mulready's bat? They were only just passing their remarks, Your Honour, about how thick you are this time back with Captain Usher, and Miss Feemy too, and the Maester, and that when the likes of him wore as one of the family, it's little he likes of them that would be getting now from Ballycloran, only hard words, and maybe a help to Carrick Gale. Because Captain Usher visits at Ballycloran, is that any reason why he should interfere between my father and his tenants? Sara o one av me knows then, Mr. Thady, only that the tenants is no good friends to the captain. Nor why should they, any he goin' through the country with the lot of idle blackguards, with arms and guns, seizing the poor devils for nothing at all, only for tryin' to make out the rent for your honour, with a rifle of poteen, that's queer of friendship. Aye, and it's the truth I'm telling you, Mr. Thady, for he's no friend to you or yours. Sure isn't Pat Reynolds in Ballyanna more bridle on his account, and two other boys from the mountains behind Drumnish, because they found a trifle of half malted barley up there among em, and be the same token Joe was saying if the friend of the family were persecuting them that way, and putting his brother in gaol, was the master wouldn't raise a finger barring for the rent, the sooner he and his were off the estate, the better he'd like it. For Joe said he'd not be fighting again his own master. But when you were not his master any more, then let every one look to hisself. 
Whilst Brady was giving this short expose of the feelings displayed at the little whisky shop in Mohill on the previous fair day, young MacDermot was pulling hard at the Dudheen, as if trying to hide his embarrassment in smoke. Brady paused for some time and then added, "'Joe mostly leads those boys up at Drumlish. "'An hard to lead they are. "'I'm thinking Captain Usher, with all his revenue of peelers and his guns, "'may meet his match there yet. "'They'll all him, av he goes on much farther. "'As sure as my name's Pat, they'll get the worst of that, Brady. "'Not that I care throw in for him and his company. "'It's true for you. "'He is persecuting them too far.' what with the revenue police, the constabulary police, and the magistrate's warrants. They won't let them walk to Mass quietly next. I didn't care what they did to Master Miles, but they'd have the worst of it in the end. And it's little you ought to care for the same captain, Master Thaddy, have you at all. It's little he's making of Miss Feemy's name with the police captain, and the young Gager, and young James Fitzsimon, when they're over there at the bally in the morgue together, and great nights they have of it, too. Though they all have it in Moyle he's to marry Miss Feeney. If so, indeed. But then he isn't a black Protestant. Sorrow take them for Protestants. There's Hyacinth Keegan calls himself a Protestant now. His father warn't ashamed of the old religion when he sarved processes away to Drumshabot. And what were the gentlemen saying about Feeney, Pat? Oh, your honour, how could I know what gentlemen is saying over their punch together? Only they do be saying in Ballinamore that the captain don't speak that decently of Miss Feemy, as if they were to be man and wife, sorrow blister his tongue the day he'd say a bad word of her. Faith, he'd better take care of himself if it's my sister he's playing his game with. He'll find out, though. There ain't much to be got worth havin' at Ballyclora now, as long as there's a MacDermot in it. He may still get the treatment the blackguard deserves, if he plays his tricks with Feemy. Pat saw that his object had been gained. He suspected that no warm feelings of friendship existed in his master toward the aforesaid captain, and he was determined there should be none if he could help it. He was not wrong in his surmises, for from the constant visits of Miles Usher to Ballycloran, People had for some time been saying that he meant to marry Feemy. They now began to say that he ought to do so. While her brother and his minister are discussing that subject and others, settling who could pay or who should pay, at the convocation of tenants to be held the coming Friday, and who couldn't and who should be ejected and who not, we will obtain a little insight into Captain Usher's affairs, and account for the residence of so gallant a gentleman in the little town of Mohill. End of section 3. The Tenantry of Ballycloran Section 4 of The MacDermots of Ballycloran This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson The MacDermots of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope Section 4 Miles Usher Everyone knows that Ireland, for her sins, maintains two distinct, regularly organised bodies of police, the duties of the one being to prevent the distillation of poteen, or illicit whisky, those of the other to check the riots created by its consumption. These forces, for they are in fact military forces, have each their officers, sub-officers, and privates, as the army has, their dress, full dress, and half dress, their arms, field arms, and house arms, their barracks, stations, and military regulations, their captains, colonels, and commanders in chief, but called by other names, and in fact each body is a regularly disciplined force only differing from the standing army by being carried on in a more expensive manner. The first of these, that for preventing the distillation of poteen, commonly called the revenue police, was, at the time of our story, honoured by the services of Miles Usher. He held the office of one of the sub-inspectors in the county of Leitrim, and he resided in the town of Mohill. 
He had a body of about five and twenty men under him with a sergeant and his duty was as I have before said to prevent the distillation of poteen This was only to be done by seizing it when made or in the process of making and as a considerable portion of the fine levied in all cases possible from the dealers in the trade became the perquisite of the sub-inspector or officer effecting the seizure the situation in a wild lawless district was one of considerable emolument consequently gentlemen of repute and good family were glad to get their sons into the service and at the present time a commission in the revenue police is considered if not a more fashionable at any rate a more lucrative appointment than a commission in the army among these officers some of course would be more active than others and would consequently make more money but it will be easily imagined that however much the activity of a sub-inspector of revenue police might add to his character and standing at headquarters it would not be likely to make him popular in the neighbourhood in which he resided miles usher was most active in the situation which he filled whether an impartial judge would have said that he was too much so would be a question difficult to settle as i have no impartial judge on the subject to whom i can refer but the persons among whom he lived thought that he was at the time i allude to about ten years ago a great deal of whiskey was distilled in the mountains running between the counties of Leitrim and cavan and in different parts of the county Leitrim. father matthew's pledge was then unknown the district is a wild country not much favoured by gentlemen's residences and very poor and although it may seem to be an anomaly it will always be found to be the case that the poorer the people are the more they drink and consequently captain usher as he was usually called in the neighbourhood found sufficient occupation for himself and his men now the case is different the revenue police remain but their duties have in most districts gone and they may be seen patrolling the roads with their officers accompanying them being bound to walk so many miles a day it is very seldom one hears of their effecting a seizure and their inactivity is no doubt owing to the prevalence of father matthew's pledge of total abstinence miles usher was a protestant from the county antrim in the north of ireland the illegitimate son of a gentleman of large property who had procured him the situation which he held he had been tolerably well educated that is he could read and write sufficiently understood somewhat of the nature of figures and had learned and since utterly forgotten the latin grammar he had natural abilities somewhat above par was good-looking strongly made and possessed that kind of courage which arises more from animal spirits and from not having yet experienced the evil effects of danger than from real capabilities of enduring its consequences Miles Usher had never yet been hit in a duel, and would therefore have no hesitation in fighting one. He had never yet been seriously injured in riding, and would therefore ride any horse boldly. He had never had his head broken in a row, and therefore would readily go into one. He cared little for bodily pain if it did not incapacitate him. Little, at least, for any pain he had as yet endured, and his imagination was not strong enough to suggest any worse evil. And this kind of courage, which is the species by far most generally met with, was sufficient for the life he had to lead. But the quality in which Usher chiefly excelled, and which was most conducive to give him the character which he certainly held in the country for courage, talent, and gallantry, was his self-confidence and assurance. He believed himself inferior to none in powers of body and mind, and that he could accomplish whatever he perseveringly attempted. He had, moreover, an overwhelming contempt for the poor, amongst whom his duties so constantly brought him. And it is not, therefore, wonderful that he was equally feared and execrated by them. I should also state that Miles Usher, had had sagacity enough to keep some of the money which he had received and this added not a little both to his reputation and standing in the country and also to the real power which he possessed for in connaught ready money is scarce and its scarcity creates its importance this then was Feemy's lover and she certainly did love him dearly he had all the chief ornaments of her novel heroes 
he was handsome he carried arms was a man of danger and talked of deeds of courage he wore a uniform he rode more gracefully talked more fluently and seemed a more mighty personage than any other one whom Feemy usually met besides he gloried in the title of captain and would not that be sufficient to engage the heart of any girl in Feemy's position let alone any Irish girl to whom the ornaments of arms were always dear but whether he loved her as truly might I fear be considered doubtful if so why were they not married Larry McDermott was too broken-hearted a man and too low-spirited to have objected to miles on the ground of his being a Protestant It was not that he was indifferent about his religion But he had not heart enough left to be energetic on any subject In other respects miles was more than a match for his daughter in the present fallen condition of the family But the matter had not even been mentioned to him by his daughter or her lover Usher was constantly at Ballycloran Was in the habit of riding over from Mohill only three miles almost daily when disengaged Giving his horse to Patsy the only male attendant at Ballycloran and staying the whole morning or the evening there without invitation and Larry if he never seemed particularly glad at any rate never evinced any dislike to his visits Whatever war the sub-inspector might wage against run spirits in the mountains and bogs He always appeared on good terms with it at Ballycloran and as the McDermott's had but little else to give in the way of hospitality This was well Young Thady could not but see that his sister was attached to Usher But he knew that she could not do better than marry him and if he considered much about it He thought that she was only taking her fun out of it as other girls did and that it would all come right Thady was warmly attached to his sister He had had no one else really to love he was too sullen at his prospects too gloomy from his situation To have chosen for himself any loved one on whom to expend his heart He was of a disposition too saturnine though an Irishman to go and look for love when it did not fall in his way and All that he had to give he gave to his sister but it must be remembered that poor Thady had no refinement how should he and though he would let no one injure Feemy if he could help it He hardly knew how effectually to protect her His suspicions were now aroused by his counselor Pat Brady But the effect was rather to create increased dislike in him against Usher than to give rise to any properly concerted scheme for his sister's welfare on the evening previous to the fair at Mohill mentioned in the last chapter Captain Usher with a party of his men had succeeded in making a seizure of some half malted barley in a cabin on the margin of a little lake on the low mountains Which lay between Mohill and Cash Carrigan He had as in these cases was always his practice Received information from a spy in his pay who accompanied him dressed as one of his own men to prevent any chance of his being recognized This man's name was Kogan and he had been in the habit of buying illicit whiskey from the makers at a very cheap rate and Carrying it round to the farmers houses and towns for sale Whereby he obtained considerable profit, but at considerable risk With this employment captain Usher had made himself acquainted and instead of seizing the man whilst in possession of the whiskey he had sounded him and finding him sufficiently a villain had taken him into his pay as a spy This trade Kogan found more lucrative even than the former But also more dangerous as if detected he might reckon on his death as certain He still continued to buy the spirits from the people but in smaller quantities He offered lower prices and though he nominally kept up the trade it was more for the purpose of knowing where the poteen was than of buying and selling it It was not wonderful therefore that more seizures than ever had been lately made and that the men were getting more cautious and at the same time more irate and violent in their language In the present instance the party had come on the cabin in question unawares Not that they might not have been noticed, but that the people were confident of not being suspected No whiskey had been run there and the barley had only lately been brought in to have kishes from another cabin where it was not thought to be safe 
Three men and an old woman were found in the cabin when Captain Usher entered with three of his own men. On being questioned, they denied the existence of either whiskey, malt, or barley. But on searching, the illicit article was found in the very kishes in which it had been brought. They were easily discovered, shoved into the dark chimney corner, farthest from the door. That I may never see the light, began the old woman, if I thought it were anything but the turf, and just the kishes that Barney Smith left there the morn. And he say nothing of the barley, and bring all these troubles on me, and Yehona, the like of him, the spalpeen. Never mind my trouble, my dear, said Usher. It is little we think of the trouble of easing you. And who's Barney Smith, ma'am? Oh, then Barney's just my daughter's own son, and he coming down from the mountains with turf, and said he must lave the kishes here, till he just went back round Loch Sheen with the ass he'd borrowed from Paddy Byrne, and he'd be, and very good-natured it was of him to leave you the malt instead of the turf. And who are you, my good men? The men had continued smoking their pipes quietly at the fire without stirring. We be strangers here, your honour, said one. That is, not strangers just, but we don't live here, your honour. Where do you live, and what's your names? I and Joe Smith live just lived down the way just on the road to Cash, about half a mile out of this, and Tim Reynolds, he lives away at Drumleash, on Mr. McDermott's land, and my name's Paddy Byrne. Oh, oh, so one of you is father of the lad who brought the donkey, and the other the owner of it, and you neither of you knew it was in the kishes. Sorrow I know, your honour. You see, Barney brought them down here with from the mountains when we weren't in it. And it was some of the boys up there was getting him to get away the malt unknownst, hearing of your honour, maybe. Ah, yes, I see. Whose land is this on? Councillor Webb's, your honour. Who holds the cabin and potato garden? I do, your honour. Just for my wife's mother, you see. But I live down towards Cash. Ah, very good-natured of you to your wife's mother. I hope the three of you have no objection to take a walk to Mo Hill this evening. Oh, can't, oh, can't, it's ruined will be, your honour, and that I may never see the light if the boys knew it, and your honour wouldn't have the death of an old woman on ye, the old woman was exclaiming, while the police began seizing the malt and making prisoners of the men. Carol, see and get an ass to put these kishes on, said Usher. Colleen, put a rope across these fellows' arms. I suppose they'll go quiet. It was now full time for the men to arise when they found that the rope was to be fastened across their arms which meant that a rope was to be fastened on the right arm of one, passed behind his back, fastened to the arm of the second, and so behind his back, to the third. Smith and Byrne, the former of whom, in spite of his protestations to the contrary, was the inhabitant of the cabin, had given the matter up as lost. But as the other, Tim Reynolds, did in fact reside at Drumleash, he thought he might still show some cause why he should not be arrested for visiting his friend Joe Smith. Your honour won't be after taking an innocent boy like me, began Tim, that knows nothing at all at all about it. Sure, your honour knows the master, Master Tady, down at Ballycloran. He will tell your honour I had nothing in life to do in it. Then you don't know yourself I live with Joe Reynolds down at Drumleash, and war only up here just gagging with the old woman and the boys, and knew nothing in life. How could I about the malt, Captain Usher? Oh, no, Mr. Reynolds, of course you could not. How could you, as you justly observe, particularly being the brother of that inoffensive character, Mr. Joe Reynolds, and you living too on Mr. McDermott's property? You and your brother never ran whiskey at Drumleash, I suppose. Why should a tenant of the McDermott's escape any more than one of Councillor Webb's? No, your honour, and course not. Only you being so thick with the master and that like, and have he spake a good word of me, and why shouldn't he? and i know in nothing at all about it perhaps your honour i'm sorry mr reynolds i cannot oblige you in this little matter but that's not the way i do business come along killeen hurry it's getting damp cold in here with this captain usher walked out of the cabin and the two men followed each having an end of the rope smith and byrne followed doggedly but silently but poor reynolds though no lawyer could not but feel that he was unjustly treated and I will go to jail then, just for coming up to see old widow Byrne, Captain. Yes, Mr. Reynolds, as far as I can foresee, you will. Then, Captain Asher, 
it's you'll be sorry for the day you were treating that way an innocent boy that knows nothing at all all about it do you mean to be threatening me you ruffian no captain asher i doesn't threaten you but there is them as does and it's this day's work or this night's that's all the same will be the black night work to you it's the like of you that makes ruffians of the boys about they isn't left the mains of living not even of getting the dry praties and when they tries to make out the rint with the whiskey which is not for themselves but for them as is your own friends you hunts them through the mountains and bogs like worried foxes and not only that but for them as does it and them as does not be doing it is all the same and it's little the master or for the like of that the master's daughter either will be getting from being so thick with such as you harrying and seizing his tenants just for your own fun and diversion mind i'm not threatening you captain usher but it's little good you or them as is in ballycloran will be getting for the work you're doing now what are you pulling at mister you think i can walk of myself without your hauling and pulling like a gossoon at a pig's hind leg the last part of tim's eloquence was addressed to the man who held the foremost end of the rope and who was following his officer at a rapid pace captain usher made no further answer to his remonstrating prisoner but marched on rapidly towards carrick after the advance party with whom was cogan the informer he after having pointed out the cabin of course did not wait to be recognized by its occupiers this capture was the subject of the discussion held on the fair day at mulready's whiskey shop in mohill at which joe reynolds the prisoner's brother had presided as Brady informed Thady McDermott, or at any rate had taken the most noisy part. To tell the truth, our friend Pat himself had been present all the evening at Mulready's, and if he had not talked so loud, he had said full as much as Joe. The latter was naturally indignant at the capture of his brother, who, in fact, at the time was living in his cabin, though he did hold an acre or two of ground in the same townland as Joe Smith and the widow Byrne. He was not, however, engaged in the poteen making there, and though at the moment of the entrance of the police the party were all talking of the malt which had in fact been brought from Burns' cabin to that of his mother and brother in law, Reynolds had really nothing to do with the concern. His known innocence made the party more indignant, and they consequently swore that among them it put an end to our poor friend Usher, or as Joe Reynolds expressed it, will hold him so there aren't a bit left in him to hole now for the benefit of the ignorant i may say that holing a man means putting a bullet through him the injuries done by the police were not however the only subject discussed at mulready's that night ribbonism about eighteen thirty blank was again becoming very prevalent in parts of ireland at any rate so said the stipendiary magistrates and the inspectors of police and if they said true county leitrim was full of ribbon men and no town so full as mohill consequently the police sub-inspector of ballinamon captain greenough had his spies as well as captain usher and joe reynolds was a man against whom secret information had been given joe was aware that he was a marked man and consequently if not actually a ribbon man was very well inclined to that or anything else which might be inimical to jails, policemen, inspectors, gaugers, or any other recognised authority. In fact, he was a reckless man, originally rendered so by inability to pay high rent for miserably bad land, and afterwards becoming doubly so from having recourse to illegal means to ease him of his difficulties. He and many others in the neighbourhood of Mo Hill, somewhat similarly situated, had joined together bound themselves by oaths and had determined to become ribbon men their chief objects however at present were to free themselves from the terrors of captains usher and greenough and to prevent their landlords ejecting them for non-payment of rent it would be supposed a man of pat brady's discernment station and character would not have wished to belong to or have been admitted by so desperate a society but he nevertheless was not only one of them but one of their leaders and it can only be supposed that he had his raisins all these things were fully talked over at mulready's that night 
the indignities offered to humanity by police of every kind the iniquities of all protestants the benefits likely to accrue to mankind from an unlimited manufacture of potine and the injustice of rents were fully discussed on the latter head certainly brady fought the battle of his master and not unsuccessfully but not on the heads that he had a right to his own rents but what he was to do about flannelly if he did not get them and sure boys what would the old master do and what would mr tady do without the rint among ye an old flannelly dunning about him with his bonds and his bills and mortgages how do you like to see the good old blood that's in it now driven out by the likes of flannelly and keegan and them to be masters in ballycloran that's all very well pat and we'd be sorry to see harem come to mr larry and the young masters along of such born robbers as them but is them dearer to us than our own flesh and blood as long as they and the like of them stand between us and want the divil a keegan of them all dare put a foot in ballycloran but who is it now rules all at ballycloran who but the bloody robber asher they go through the country for him the born ruffian may food choke him and he making little of them all the time bad manners to the like of him they say he never called an honest woman his mother will i mr brady be giving my blood for them and he putting my brother in jail and all for sitting up warming his shins at loch sheen no may this be my curse if i do and joe reynolds swallowed a glass of whiskey and you may tell mr tady pat that if he wants the boys to stick to him let him stick to them and not be helping a de ruffian to be driving the lives out of them he should be friend and maybe he will want us and that soon and if he'll stick to us now as his fathers always did sure it's little he need be fearing flannelly and keegan by gee the first foot they set in ballycloran they shall leave there for ever if Thady Macdermot will help rid his father's land of that bloody ruffian. It's little Mr. Thady loves the captain, Joe, and it's little he ever will, I think. However, you can come up, you know, on Friday, and say your own say about your brother, and the rint, and all. And so I will come, Pat, but there's all the rint I have, and Mrs. Mulready, I think, will have the best part of that. And he jingled a few half-pence in his pocket so ended the meeting previous to the conversation in macdermot's rent office end of chapter four section five father john part one of the macdermots of ballycloran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by John O'Riordan. The Reverend John McGraw was priest of parish of Drumsna at the time of which we write. This parish contains the post town of Drumsna and the country adjacent, including the townland and the domain of Ballycloran. At this time, the spacious chapel which now stands on the hill about two miles out of Drumsna had not been built, and Father John's chapel was situated on the road from Drumsna to Ballycloran. Near this he had built himself a small cottage in the quasi-Gothic style, for Father John was a man of taste. He rented also the twenty acres of land, half of this being on the MacDermot's estate. The Reverend Mr. McGrath is destined to appear somewhat prominently in this history, and I must therefore be excused in giving a somewhat elaborate description of him. He had been, like many of the present parish priests in Ireland, educated in France, he had been at college in Saint-Omer, and afterwards in Paris, and had officiated as a curé there. He had consequently seen more of French manners than society usually falls to the lot of Irish theological students in that capital. He was also, which is equally unusual, a man of good family, and from his early avocations was more fitted than is generally the case with those of his order to mix in society. He possessed also very considerable talents, and much more than ordinary acquirements, great natural bonhomie, and perpetual good temper. He was a thorough French scholar, and had read the better portion of their modern literature. 
On leaving Paris he had gone to Rome on a begging expedition to raise funds for building chapels in his own country, and there too he had been well received, and from thence he had returned to take possession of a populous parish in one of the very poorest parts of Ireland. With all his acquirements, however, in many things Father John was little better than a child. Though his zeal had enabled him to raise money for the church, he could never keep any of his own. He had always his little difficulties, and though he sedulously strove to live within his income, and never really much outstripped it, he was always in want of money. He had built his house, and unlike his neighbour had managed to pay for it, but he was always in trouble about it. The rats were in the roof, and the flooring was all warped, and his windows would neither open nor shut, and the damp would get to his books. Therefore, though his cottage was exteriorly the prettiest in the parish, interiorly it was discomfort personified. A more hospitable man than Father McGrath never lived, even in Connacht. He took a look in at dinner time as a personal favour, and whatever might be the state of his larder, his heart was always full, and the emptiness of the former never troubled him. He had not the slightest shame in asking anyone to eat potatoes and cold mutton. They all knew him, and what they were likely to get at his house, and if they did not choose, they need not come. Whoever did come had as good as he had himself. A more temperate man never lived, but he had much pleasure in seeing another man drink a tumbler of punch as any one else would have in drinking it himself. He kept under his own bed a great stone jar, always partly full, of whisky of native manufacture, and though were he alone the jar would long have remained untouched, as it was, it very often had to be refilled. Tumblers he had only two, and when his guests exceeded that number the teacups made their appearance, and he would naively tell his friends that he meant to buy tumblers when he got any money, but heaven help them, if he got into debt, the people would never be paid. His whole domestic arrangements were on a par. His crockery was the most heterogeneous and scanty description, his furniture of the most common kind, put in bit by bit, and was found indispensable. In two things only did Father John show his extravagance. First, too, his expenditure was only so to be called, in comparison with that of others around him, of the same profession. It was this, he was always dressed like a gentleman. Father John's black coat was always black, never rusty brown, his waistcoat, his trousers, his garters, even his shoes, the same. And not only did his clothes always look new, but they always were well made, as far as his figure would allow. His hat was neat, and his linen clean, his hands too were always clean, and when he was from home, always gloved, even his steady cob whom he called Paul, you know, it was rumoured that he had called him St. Paul, but the bishop objected. Together with his saddle and his bridle, they were always neat. This particular was nearly all that polish of French society had left him, and those who are accustomed to seeing Irish priests will know that this peculiarity would be striking. His other expensive taste was that of books. He could not resist the temptation to buy books, books of every sort, from voluminous editions of St. Chrysostom to Nicholas Nickleby's and to Charles O'Malley's, and consequently he had a great many. But alas, he had no bookshelves, not one. Some few volumes, those of everyday use, were piled on top of one another in his little sitting room, and the others were closely packed in great boxes in different parts of his cottage, his bedroom, his little offertory, his parlour, and many in the little drawing room, as he called it, but in which was neither a chair nor table, nor ever appeared the sign of fire. No wonder the poor man complained of the damp of his books. In all other respects, Father John was a fair specimen of the Irish priesthood. He must have been an eloquent man, for he had been sent on different foreign missions to obtain money for building chapels by preaching sermons. But his appearance was anything but dignified. He was very short and very fat, and had little or no appearance of neck. His face, however, was intelligent. He had bright, small, black eyes, a fine, high forehead, very white teeth, and short, thick, curling, dark hair. 
as i am on the subject of the church i might as well say now that his curate father cullen was unlike him in everything but his zeal for the church he was educated in manus was the son of a little farmer in the neighbourhood was perfectly illiterate chiefly showed his dissimilarity to the parish priest by his dirt and untidiness he was a violent politician the catholic emancipation had become law and he therefore had no longer that grievance to complain of but he still had national grievances respecting which he zealously declaimed when he could find a hearer repeal of the act of union was not at that time the common topic morning and night at work and at rest at table and even at the altar as it afterwards became but there were even then some who maintained that ireland would never be herself until the union with britain was repealed and among these was father cullen he was as zealous for his religion as for his politics and he could become tolerably intimate with no protestant without thinking he was specially called on to convert him a disciple less likely to make converts than father cullen it would be difficult to imagine seeing that in language he was most violent and ungrammatical in appearance most uncouth in argument most unfair he was impatient if any one spoke but himself he relied on all such arguments on his power of provoking logically that his own church was the true church and as his education had been logical he put all his arguments into syllogisms if you could not answer him in syllogisms he conceived that you must be evidently to yourself in the wrong and that obstinacy alone prevented you from owning it father cullen's redeeming point was his earnestness his reality he had no humbug about him whatever there was there was real he had no possible appreciation for a joke and he understood no ridicule you might gull him and dupe him for ever and he would never find you out his heart and mind were full of the roman catholic church and of his country's wrongs he could neither speak nor think of aught beside usher was the only protestant whom this poor man was in the habit of meeting and he was continually attempting to convert him in which pursuit usher rather encouraged him with the purpose of turning him into ridicule such were the spiritual guides of the inmates of ballycloran and its neighbourhood on the wednesday morning after the fair father john was sitting eating his breakfast in his little parlour attending much more to a book on the table before him than to the large lumps and bread and butter which he unconsciously swallowed when the old servant judy mccann opened the door and said father john please there's dennis mcgovery wanting to see your reverence below people in connacht always call the hall door and the passage below and the parlour or sitting-room above though in nine cases out of ten they are all on the same floor why then judy said father john with his mouth full bad manners to them meant i have a bit of breakfast in peace and quiet there i was at the widow burns all last night destroyed with a cold and nothing the matter were at last and now i must lose my breakfast as well as my sleep it's nothing of that sort i'm thinking father john but dennis mccoffery is after going to get married i hear oh exclaimed father john that's a horse of another colour going to get married is he and why shouldn't he and he able to support a wife let him come in judy it will be remembered that the above and below in the priest's house were only terms of compliment and as dennis mcgovery was standing in the hall that is in the open door of the very room in which judy mccann had been announcing his attendance he of course had heard what had passed therefore when father john said let him come in he wanted no further introduction but thrusting himself through the door and taking hold of a scanty lock of his hair in his forehead by way of a reverential solution he said yes your honour now laconic as this was it was intended to convey and did convey a full assent not only to judy's assertion that he was after going to get married but also to the priest's remark that there was no good reason on earth why he shouldn't seeing as that he was able to support a family yes your honour said dennis mcgovery well dennis that'll do judy meaning that judy need not listen any longer at least within the room so you are going to get married are you dennis 
Didn't Father Cullen say anything to your reverence about it then? Oh, yes, he did then. I, I didn't remember it just at first when Judy mentioned your name. Yes, your reverence, if you please, I'm going to be married. The bridegroom in this case was a man about forty years of age, who seemed certainly never to have eaten the bread of idleness, for he was all gristle and muscle, nor had he. He was a smith living in Drumsnow, and he was reputed the best shoer of horses in the neighbourhood, and consequently was, as the priest had said, able to maintain a family. In fact, Dennis had the reputation of hoarded wealth, for it was said he had thirty or forty pounds in the loan fund office at Carrick and Shannon. He was a hard-working, ill-favoured, saving man, but as he was able to keep a comfortable home over a wife, he had no difficulty in getting one. Oh, then, it pleases me entirely because you are the boy that's both able and willing to pay your clergyman respectably as you should. In course, your reverence, though the likes of a poor boy like me hasn't much. I wouldn't not be getting married decently, Father John, and of course I couldn't expect your reverence to do it for nothing. For nothing indeed. Where would I be getting my coat or my back and the roof over my head? No, the poor themselves always make out something for me, and you, Dennis, that are comfortable, would of course be sorry to set a bad example to those who are not so. Oh, then, your reverence has poking fun at me. No fun at all, Dennis. If you that have the money don't pay your priest, who is to, I'd like to know. Fun indeed, no, but it's good earnest I'm talking. And if you have a character that you wish to support and give to your children after you, it's now you should be looking to it. Dennis McGovery began twirling his hat round in his hand, bending his knees as if nonplussed. He had known well enough beforehand what the priest would say to him, and the priest too knew what answer he would get. The question in these cases is which would cajole the other the best, and of course the priest would have the best of it. This may seem odd to those who do not know the country, but did he not so, the Roman Catholic clergyman could not even get the moderate remuneration which he does receive for his laborious services. Oh, your reverence, continued Dennis with a grim smile, you know, it's the young woman or her friends as always pays the priest. And who is the young woman, Dennis? Betsy Kane, isn't it? No, no, Father John, said Dennis, blushing almost black through to his dark skin. It ain't Betsy. Not Betsy Kane? Why, she told me three weeks ago you were to be married to her. And so, so I was, your reverence, only, you see, for a mistake happened. A mistake? Was it she made the mistake, or you? Why, it weren't exactly herself then as did it. It were, were her mother. Her mother made a mistake. What mistake did her mother make? A long of a cow, your reverence, said Dennis. Seemed very slow of explaining, and Father John began to be impatient. What cow, Dennis? How did the mother's making a mistake about a cow prevent you from marrying her daughter? Why, your reverence, then, if you let me, I, I'll, I'll just explain the matter. Old Betsy Kane, that's her mother, you know, promised me the brown cow, your reverence may know, as is in the little garden behind the cabin for her daughter's fortune. And says I to her, well, may she be worth four pound tin, Mrs. Kane. Four pounds ten shillings, says she, Mr. McGovery, and you know no better than that that she, the cow, was to calf before Christmas. Well then, four pounds tin indeed, just in that matter, your reverence. Well then, I looks at the cow, and she has seems to be a party sort of cow, and I agreed to the bargain, your honour, providing the cow turned out to be with calf. Well, your honour, now it's no such thing, but it's sticking me she was entirely about the cow, so now she's got the cow and her daughter both at home, and likely to for me. And so, Dennis, you broke your promise and refused to marry the girl you were engaged to because a cow was not in calf. No, no, I, I didn't, Your Honour. That is, I, I did refuse to marry the girl. Why wouldn't I? But I didn't break my promise because I only promised providing. And you see, Father John, they were only deceiving me. 
Well, Dennis, who is it, after all, that you are going to have? Well, then, it's just Mary Brady. What? Pat Brady's sister, is it? Yes, Your Honour. And is her cow really in the family way? Ah, no, Your Reverence will make a handle of that again, me. Never mind, Dennis, how I handle the cow so long as you handle the calf. But has Mary a cow? No, Father John, she, she ain't got no cow, as I knows on. Well, Dennis, what fortune are you to get? You are not the man who would take a wife unless she brought something with her. Well, then, it's only just a pair of young pigs and a small trifle of change. A trifle of change, eh, Dennis McGoffrey? I take it it wasn't only along with the mistake of the cow that you left Betsy you came, but you found you could do better, I suppose. Well, then, it might be just a little bit of both, you see, Father John. They were the first to save me. Well, Dennis, when's the wedding going to be? Oh, then, tomorrow evening, if your reverence pleases. What? So soon, Dennis? Take care, perhaps, after all, Betsy Kane's cow may calf. You see, you would be too much in a hurry after the pigs. Sorrow to the tongue of me, then, that I ever told your reverence a word about it. But what are you in such a hurry about? Won't the pigs do as well at Pat Brady's as they will down at Drumsna? Well, you see, Father John, after tomorrow is Friday, which wouldn't do for the two legs of mutton Pat brought from Carrick with him yesterday, and the fine ham, your reverence, Mrs. McKeown, long life to her, sent up from Drumsna. And Saturday wouldn't shoot at all, seeing the boys will be mostly drunk, which may your honour wouldn't like on the morning of the blessed Sabbath. Nor on any other morning either, said Father John. Can't they take their fun without getting drink, like beasts? But drunk they'll be, of course, and why would not Monday do? Why, that's next week, your reverence. You've remained single all this time, and only jilted poor Betsy Kane last week, and you are so hot after Mary Brady that you can't wait till next Monday to be married. Or is it the pigs, Dennis? Are you are you afraid Pat may change his mind about the pigs, as you did about the cow? Oh, drat the cow now, Father McGran, you will never be easy with your joke against a poor boy. It was not about the pigs then, nor nothing of the kind, but just that I heard as how, but... Dennis began scratching his head. Your honour will be after twisting what I'll be telling you and poking your fun at me. Not I, my boy, out with it. You know nothing goes farther with me. End of section 5, Father John, part 1section six of the macdermots of ballycloran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john o'reardon the macdermots of ballycloran by anthony trollope section six father john part one it were just this your reverence as makes me so hurried about getting the thing done I heard tell that Tom Ginty, the pig jobber, had come home to Drummond from where he was away to Vatlone, and they'd be telling me he brought a trifle of money with him, and your honour knows that Mary had half given him a promise afore he went, and so, your reverence, lest there be any scrimmage betwixt Ginty and I, you see, it's as well to get the marriage done off-hand. Oh, yes, I see, you were afraid Tom Ginty would be taking Mary Brady's pigs to Athlone. That was it, was it? No, your honour, I, I were not afraid of that. But it might be as well there should be no scrimmage betwixt us, as in course there would not be, and we wants man and wife. But in course Mary has promised me now, so she couldn't go and act like that. Why no, Dennis? Not well unless, you know, she was to find your cow wouldn't have any calf, eh? Oh, bother it for a calf, then. No, for not being a calf, Dennis. Well then, Your Honour, I'll, I'll just go and speak to Father Cullen about it. Though he's not so good-humoured like, at least he doesn't always be laughing at a boy. Come back here, McGovery, and don't be a fool. Father Cullen's gone to Dromod. I think I heard him say that Tom Ginty wanted him. Is it Tom Ginty? But sure, what would Tom be doing with Father Cullen? Wouldn't he be getting his own priest? 
Well, what time will your reverence come up to Pat Brady's tomorrow? Well, get the mutton done, Dennis, about seven tomorrow evening, and I'll be with you. But you'll ask Tom Ginty, eh? Sorrow afoot, then, not Betsy Kane, Dennis. It aren't for me to be axing the company, Father John, but if Betsy likes to come up and shake her feet and take her sup, she's welcome for me. Well, that's kind of you, and you know you could be asking after that. Well, then, Father John, may it be long before I speak another word to you, barren me sins, that is. Well, Dennis, I've done. Look, you now, you have a good supper for the boys, and lots of the stuff. Let there be plenty of them in it, and don't let them come with their pockets empty. Be dad, they think their priest can live on point without any potatoes. Oh, Father John, Pat says there'll be plenty of them in it, and a great wedding, he says, he'll make of it. There's a lot of the boys over from Mohill is to be there. From Mohill, eh? Then they've my leave to stay away, said Father. I don't care how little I see of the boys from Mohill. Why, can't he get his company from Drum Snaw and the parish? Oh, sure, your reverence, and he'll do that too. Won't there be all the Ballycloran tenants? And the boys and girls from Drumleash. Oh, yes, Drumleash. Drumleash? It's as bad as Mohill, I'm thinking. It's those fellows in Drumleash that make Mohill what it is. But I suppose Pat Brady would tell me he has a right to choose his own company. Oh, Pat wouldn't tell your reverence the like of that. And he's the boy that would do it directly. And mind this, McGovery, you've the name of a prudent fellow. And when you're once married, the less you see of your brother-in-law, the better. And stick to your work in Trump's now. And so I means to do, your reverence. They won't be making me wasting my hard-earned wages at Mrs. Mulready's. Pat wanted me to be there last night of all, as I was coming out of the fair. But no, says I, if you'd like to see your sister respectable, don't be axing me to go there. If you'd like her to be on the roads and me in Carrick jail, why, that's the way I take it. Stick to that, Dennis, and you'll be the better of it. Well, I'll be down with you tomorrow evening, but mind now, two thirties in the very least, and you should make it more if you want any luck in your marriage. I'll speak to Pat, Father John. You know that it's his business, but your reverence, Father John, you'll, you'll not be saying anything now up there before the boys and girls about, you, you, you know, Betsy Kane, you know. Oh, the cow. Only, you see, if you don't come down with the money as you should, it might be an excuse for your poverty. But, Dennis, I'll take care. And if anyone should say anything there about the price of cows or the like, I'll tell them all it isn't Betsy Kane's cow who wouldn't have the calf, though she was engaged. Dennis McGovery now hurried off. Father John called for Judy to take away the cold tea and prepare to sally forth to some of his numerous parochial duties. But Father McGraw was doomed to still further interruptions. He hadn't walked above a mile on the road. He was going to Ballycloran, when coming down the avenue he saw Pat Brady with his master, Mr Thady, and of course he didn't pass by without wanting to speak to them. Well, Thady, well, Father John, as they shook their hands. Well, Pat Brady, well, your reverence. The latter made a motion with his hand towards his hat, and was the first salutation. It will be remembered that Thady and the other had just been talking over affairs in the rent office, and Thady didn't seem as though he were exactly in a good humour. So, Pat, your sister is getting married to Dennis McGovery. I'll tell you what, she might do a great deal worse. She might do what she pleased for me, Father John, but, face, I was tired enough of her myself, so you see Dennis is welcome to his bargain. What, are you going to bring a wife of your own home, then? Devil a wife, then, accent of reverence, pardon. But what would I be doing with a wife? Who'd keep the house over you now, Pat? Your sister's gone. I won't be axing a woman to keep the house over me, so Mary's welcome to go. Or she were welcome to stay, too, for me. I didn't ax her to have him, and by the apostles, when Dennis is tired of his bargain, he'll be recollecting I wasn't axing him to have her. 
Well, Thady, I suppose you and Feeney will be there, the wedding, eh? And, Pat, you must make them bring Captain Usher. Mrs. McGovery, as is to be, must have the captain at her wedding. You'll be there, Thady? Oh, Pat's been telling me all about it, and I suppose I and Feeney must go down. If Brady chooses to ask the captain, I've nothing to say, and it's not for me to ask him, and so he'd only be quizzing at all he saw. I think he might as well be away. Ah, Thady, but you never think of your priest. Think of the half a crown it would be to me. Never mind, Pat, you ask him. He'll come anywhere where Miss Feemy is likely to be, eh, Thady? Then I wish Feemy had never seen eyes on him, Father John. And can't you be doing better than coupling her name with that of his? That way, and he, he a black ruffin, and a Protestant, and filling her head up with nonsense. I thought you had more respect for the family. Well, Pat, just go down to them boys and do as I was telling you. And Pat walked off. And what more respect for the family could I have, Thady, than to wish to see your sister decently married? And Father John turned round to walk back with young MacDermot the way he was going. What better respect could I have? If Captain Usher were not a proper young man in general, your father and you, Thady, would not be letting him so much around with Feemy. And now we're on it. If you didn't mean it to be a match, and if you did not mean they could marry, why have you let him be so much at Ballycloran, seeing your father doesn't meddle much in anything now? That's just the reason, Father John. I couldn't be seeing all day who was in it and who was not. Besides, Feemy's grown now, she's no mother, and must learn to take care of herself. No, Thady, she's no mother, and no father, poor girl, that can be much use of her. Isn't that the reason you should care more for her? Mind, I'm not blaming you, Thady, for I know you do care for her, and you only want to know how to be a better brother to her. And what could she do better than marry Captain Usher? But... But isn't he a black Protestant, Father John? And don't the country hate him for the way he's riding down the poor? He may be a Protestant, Thady, and yet not black. Mind, I'm not saying I wouldn't rather see Feemy marry a good Catholic. But if she set her heart on Protestant, I wouldn't have you be again him for that. That's not the way to show your religion. It's only nursing your pride. And sure, mightn't she make a Catholic of him too? Oh, Father Cullen has tried that. Well, I wouldn't tell Father Cullen so, but I think your sister would show much more power in converting a young fellow the like of Usher than poor Cullen. And then, as to his riding down the poor, you know every one must do his duty. And if the boys will be acting against the laws, why, of course, they must bear the consequences. Not but that I think Captain Usher is too hard upon them. But, Thady, are you telling me the truth in this? Is it not that you fear the young man won't marry Feemy rather than that he will? Why, Father John, I'll tell you why, Thady. This Captain Usher has been the intimate friend in your house now for more than six months. He has been received there willingly by your father, and willingly by yourself, still more willingly by Feemy. All the country knows this. Of course, they all said Feemy was to be married to him, and who would say why she shouldn't, if her father and brother agreed? I always thought it would be a match. As I said before, I would sooner have married Feemy to a good Catholic. I would have thought myself much exceeding my duty as her priest had I said a word to persuade her against it. Now people begin to say, and you know what they say in the parish always comes to my ears, that Captain Usher thinks too much of himself to take a wife from Ballycloran and that he has only been amusing himself with your sister. And I must tell you, Thady, if you didn't know more of Captain Usher and his intentions than you seem to do, it isn't today you should be thinking of what you ought to do. Thady walked on with his head down, and the priest went on. I've been meaning to speak to you of this some days back, for your poor father is hardly capable to manage these things now, and it's the respect I have for the family, and the love I have for Feemy, and, for that matter, for you too, that makes me be mentioning it. You ain't angry with your priest, are you, Thady? 
for speaking of the welfare of your sister. If you are, I'll say no more. Oh, no, angry. No, no, Father John. In course, I ain't angry. But what can I do then? Bad luck to the day that usher darkened the door of Ballyclure and bedad. If he pays Feemy foul, he'll shortly enter no door, barring that of hell fire. Wished, Tady, wished. It's not cursing will do you any good in life, or Feemy either. And then continued the priest, seeing that poor MacDermot still appeared miserably doubtful about what to say or do. Come in here a while. They had just got to the gate of Father John's Gothic cottage. Just come in here a while, and we'll talk over what is best to do. They entered into the little parlour in which McGovery had shortly before been discussing his matrimonial engagements, and having closed the door, and this time taking care that Judy McCann was not just on the other side of it, and making MacDermot sit down opposite him, the priest began, in the least disagreeable manner he could, to advise him on the very delicate subject in question. You see, Thady, there's not the least doubt in life Poor Feme is very fond of him, and how could she not be, poor thing, and seeing no one else there, and mewed up there all day with your father, no blame to her, and in course she thinks he means all right, only she doesn't like to be asking him to be naming the day, or talking to you, or Larry, or the like, and that's natural too, but what I fear is that he's taking advantage of her ignorance and quietness, you see. And though I don't think she would do anything really wrong, nor would he lead her astray altogether. And if he did, father, I'd knock the brains out of the scoundrel, though they hung me in Carrick jail for it. I would, by God. Wish now, Tady, don't mean that at all. But you get so hot. But what I really mean is this though no actual harm might come of it, it doesn't give a girl a good name through the country for her to be carrying on with a young man too long, and that all for nothing. And Feme is too pretty and too good to have a bad word about her. And so, to make a long story short, I think you'd better speak to her and tell her if you like what I say, and then, you know, if you find things not just as they should be, Ask her not to be seeing the captain any more, except just as she can't help it. And do you tell him that he's not so welcome at Ballycloran as he was, or ask him at once what he means about your sister? It's making too little of any girl to be asking a man to marry her, but better that than let her break her heart and get ill-spoken of throughout the country too. I don't think they dare do that yet, poor as the MacDermots now are, or by heaven. There's your pride, that pride again, poor lady. Rich, high, or low, don't let your sister leave it to any one to speak bad of her, or put her in any man's power to hurt her character. At any rate, by following my advice, you'll find how the land lies. But, but you see, Father John, she mightn't exactly mind what I say. Feemy has had so much of her own way, and up to this I haven't looked after her ways, not so much as I should, perhaps, though, for the matter of that, there's been little need, I believe, but she's been left to herself. And if she gets cross upon me when I spoke of Usher, it would only be making ill blood between us. I'd sooner a deal be speaking to Captain Usher. Nonsense, Thady, do you mean to say that you are afraid to speak to your sister? when you see the necessity. By speaking to Captain Usher, you mean quarrelling with him, and that'll not do Feemy any good. Well, then, to be sure, I'll do anything you tell me, Father John, but if she doesn't mind me, will you speak to her? Of course I will, Thady, if you wish, but go and see her now at once, while it's on your mind, and though Feemy may be a little headstrong, I think you'll find her honest with you. I'll tell you another thing, Father John. Father is so taken up with Usher, and to out with it at once, he's trying to borrow a trifle of money from him. Not that that should stand in my way, but the old man gets obstinate, you know. 
Oh, then, that'd be very bad, Thady. Why doesn't he go to his natural friends for money, and not be borrowing it from a false friend and a stranger? Natural friends? And who is his natural friends? Is it Flannelly and Hyacinth Keegan? I'll tell you what it is, Father John. Feemy and her father and I won't have the roof over our heads shortly with such natural friends as we have. Ah, God knows where I'm going to make out the money by next November, let alone what's to come after that. Anything better than borrowing from Usher, my boy. Be sure, bad as the time is, the rents more than pay Flannelly's interest money anyhow. I wish you had to collect them then, Father John, and then you'd see how plentiful they are. Besides, little as is spent, or as there is to spend up above there, we can't live altogether for nothing. No, Thady, the Lord knows we can none of us do that. And to tell you the truth now, only I stopped the words in your throat about poor Feemy's business. Weren't you just going to be dunning me for the bit of rent? Out with it now. Ah, it's little heart I have now to be saying to you what I was going to do for my soul sick within me, and with all the troubles that are on me. And if it weren't for Feemy then, Father John, bad as I know I've been to her, leaving her all alone there in Ballycloran, with her novels and her trash. If it weren't for her, it's little I'd mind about Ballycloran. There's them still as wouldn't let the old man want to stir about, and his tumbler of punch, bad as they are all to us, and for me, I'd strike one blow for the country, and then, if I were hung or shot or murdered or any way, devil a care, but I couldn't bear to see the house taken off her, and she to lose the respect of the country entirely, and the name of MacDermot still on her. Oh, nonsense, Tady, about blows for your country and getting hung and murdered. You're very fond of being hung in theory, but wait till you've tried it in practice, my boy. Maybe I may. There may be many things to try me. Oh, bother, Tady, stop your nonsense now. Go up to your sister, have your talk well out with her, and then come down to me. Judy McCann has got the best half a goose, and there's a fine bit of cold ham, or any way there ought to be, as ever frightened a Jew. And when you get a tumbler of punch in you, and have told me all you've said to Feemy, and all Feemy said to you, why then, you can begin to don in earnest, and we'll talk over how we'll make out the rent. No, Father John, I'd rather not be coming down. But it's yes, Father John, and I'm not saying what you'd rather do, but showing you your duty so at five, Thady, you'll be down, and see what sort of a mess Judy makes of the goose. There was no gain saying this, so Thady darted off for Ballycloran, and Father John once more set about performing his parochial duties. End of section six, Father John, part one. Section 7 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 7. The Brother and Sister, Part 2. At the time that the priest and young McDermott were talking over Feemy's affairs at the cottage, she and her lover were together at Ballycloran. Nothing that her brother or father John had said about her, either for her or against, would give a fair idea of her character. She was not naturally what is called strong-minded, but her feelings and courage were strong, and they stood to her in the place of mind. She would have been a fine creature had she been educated, but she had not been educated, and consequently her ideas were ill-formed, and her abilities were exercised in a wrong direction. She was by far the most talented of her family, but she did not know how to use what God had given her, and therefore abused it. Her mother had died before she had grown up, and her grandmother had soon followed her mother. Whatever her feelings were, and for her mother they were strong, the real effect of this was that she was freed from the restraint and constant scolding of two stupid women at a very early age. Consequently, she was left alone with her father and her brother, neither of whom were at all fitting guides for so wayward a pupil. 
By both she was loved more than any other living creature, but their very love prevented them taking that care of her that they should have taken. Her father had become almost like the tables and chairs in the parlour, only much less useful and more difficult to move. What little natural power he had ever had could not be said to have been impaired by age, for Lawrence McDermott was not in years an old man, he was not above fifty. But a total want of energy, joined to a despairing apathy, had rendered him by this time little better than an idiot. Very soon after his coming to his property, Flannelly had become a daily and intolerant burden to him. He had in his prime made some ineffectual fight against this man, he had made some faint attempts rather to parry blows than overcome his foe, but from the time that Keegan's cunning had been added to Flannelly's weight, poor Lawrence McDermott had, as it were, owned himself thoroughly vanquished for this world. Since that time he had done nothing but complain. Joined to all this, and no wonder, he had taken to drink, not drinking in the would-be jolly, rollicking, old Irish style, as his father had done before him, but a slow, desperate, solitary, continual melancholy kind of suction, which left him never drunk and never sober. It had come to that, that if he were left throughout the morning without his whiskey and water, he would cry like a child. Whatever power he had of endurance would leave him, and he would sit over the fire whining the names of Flannelly and Keegan, and slobbering over his wrongs and persecutions, till he had again drank himself into silence and passive tolerance. Not only his hair and his whiskers, but his very face had become grey from the effect of this miserable, torpid life he led. He looked as if he were degenerating into the grub even before he died. The only visible feeling left to him was a kind of stupid family pride, which solely, or chiefly, showed itself in continual complaints that the descendants and the present family of the McDermott's should be harrowed and brought to the ground by such low-born ruffians as Flannelly and Keegan. It is odd that though Feemy often thwarted him, and Thady rarely did, and though Thady was making the best fight he could, poor fellow, for the McDermott's and Ballycloran, the old man always seemed cross to him, and never was so to her. Maybe he spent more of his time with her, and was more afraid of her. But so it was, and though he certainly loved her better than anything, excepting Ballycloran in his own name, it will be owned that he was no guide for a girl like Feemy, possessed of strong natural powers, stronger passions, and but very indifferent education. And from circumstances her brother was not much better. He had been called on at a very early age to bear the weight of the family. From the time of his leaving school he had been subjected to constant vexation. On the contrary, his pleasures were very few and far between. His constant occupation for many years had been hunting for money, which was not to be got. If his heart could have been seen, the word rent would have been found engraved on it collecting the rent and managing the few acres of land which the McDermott's kept in their own hands, were his employments, and hard he laboured at them. He was therefore constantly out of the house, and of an evening after his punch he spent his hours in totting and calculating, adding and subtracting at his old greasy book, till he would turn into bed to forget another day's woes, and dream of punctual tenants and unembarrassed properties." Alas, it was only in his dreams he was destined to meet such halcyon things. What could such a man have to say to a young girl that would attract or amuse her? Poor Thady had little to say to any one, except in the way of business, and on that subject Feemy would not listen to him. She constantly heard her father growling about his Carrick foes, and her brother cursing the tenants, but she had so long been used to it that now she did not think much of it. She knew that they were very poor, and that it was with difficulty she now and again got the price of a new dress from her brother, and when she did it was usually somewhat in this fashion. Pat Kelly owed two years' rent or so, maybe five pounds. Mrs. Brennan, the Mohill haberdasher, took Pat's pig or his oats in liquidation of the small bill then due to her from Ballycloran, 
and Feemy's credit at the shop was good again, about to the amount of another pig. It was very rarely ready money found its way to Ballycloran. On the whole, therefore, she paid little or no attention to the family misfortunes. She had used to confine her desires to occasional visits to Carrick or Mohill, for they still possessed an old car, and sometimes she could take the old mare destined to perform the whole farming work of Ballycloran and sometimes she coaxed the loan of Paul for a day from Father John, and if she could do that, could always have a novel from Mohill, and see her friends, the Miss McKeons, at Drumsna two or three times a week, she was tolerably contented and good-humoured. But of late things were altered. Feemy had got a lover. Her novels ceased to interest her. She did not care about going to Carrick, and the Miss McKeons were neglected. It was only quite lately, however, that Feemy had begun to show signs of petulance and ill-temper. When her father grumbled, she left him to grumble alone, and if her brother asked her to do any ordinary little thing about the house, she would show her displeasure. She did not attend either so closely as she used to do to Biddy and Caddy, the two kitchen girls, and consequently the fare at Ballycloran grew worse than ever. Larry always grumbled but no one marked his grumbling more than heretofore. Thady had too many causes of real suffering to grumble much at trifles, and usually passed over his sister's petulance in silence. But the truth was, her lover was sometimes cross to her. Soon after Father John and young McDermott had turned their backs on Ballycloran, Pat Brady, who stood smoking his pipe, and idly leaning against the gatepost from which, even then, the gate was half-wrenched, heard the sounds of Captain Usher's horse on the road from Mohill. As soon as he came up, Brady very civilly touched his hat. "'Well, then, long life to you, Captain Usher, and it's you enjoys a fine horse, and it'd be a pity you shouldn't have one. You are with the Carrick Harriers last Monday, I'll go bail.' "'No doubt, Mr. Brady, you would go to bail for that or anything else, but I was not there.' "'You were not! Fay, but you are in the wrong then, Captain, for they had fine sport right away behind Lord Lorton's new farms, right to boil. I wonder your honour weren't in it. Seeing you know very well I was arresting prisoners up at Loch Sheen, Mr. Brady, your wonder is wonderful. Sorrow a taste I knew then, Captain. I did hear at the fair poor Patty Smith was in trouble about a thrifle of spirits, or the like, but I didn't know your honour'd been at it yourself. If the boys, ye know, will be going again the laws, why in course they'd be the worse of it when they is took. A very true and moral reflection. Was it a note you were taking to Mr. Keegan's at Carrick from the master, about the money perhaps on Monday evening? Me and Carrick Monday evening, said Pad, a little confused. So I were sure enough, your honour, just to buy the mate for the supper as is to be for McGovery's marriage. You've heard in course, Captain, that Mary, that's my sister, is to be married to Dennis McGovery tomorrow night. Why, I didn't see it in the Dublin newspapers. Oh, your honour, the newspapers indeed. Perhaps, Captain, you'd not think it too much trouble to come down. Miss Feemy, of course, has promised Mary to be there. And Pat attempted a facetious grin. I shall be most proud, Mr. Brady. And the Captain made a mock bow but do they sell mutton at Mr. Keegan's little office door? Here Brady again seemed confused, and muttered something about Keegan's boy in messages, but he was evidently annoyed. "'Shall I take your honour's horse around, then?' said he, and Usher dismounted without saying anything further, and ran up the stone steps, at the top of which Feemy opened the hall door for him. There were two sitting-rooms at Ballycloran, one at each side of the hall, in that on the right as you entered, the family breakfasted, dined, and in fact lived. And here also Larry sat throughout the day sipping his grog, and warming his shins over the fire from morning to night. He would every now and again walk to the hall door, and if it were warm, he would slowly creep down the steps, and stand looking at the trees and the lawn till he was cold, then he would creep back again. The other room seemed to be the exclusive property of Feemy. Here she made and mended her clothes, and sometimes even washed and ironed them, too. 
here she read her novels received the two miss mckeons and thought of captain usher and here also it was that he would tell her all the soft things which had filled her young heart and made her dislike ballycloran well miles she said as soon as he was in the room and before the door was shut where were you all this time since sunday and she stood on tiptoe to give him the kiss which she rather offered than he asked who have you got in mohill then that keeps you away from feemy it's mary cassidy now what business had you shopping with mary cassidy and i was shopping with mary cassidy feemy deed then i forget it oh yes it was fair day yesterday and i saw them all in at brennan's and what did you want at brennan's miles said she playfully shaking his shoulder with her hand it's talking to that pretty girl in the shop you're after oh of course feemy i was making love to the three miss cassidys and jane thompson and old widow brennan at once but why was i there you say why then i was just buying this for mary cassidy and i wanted your opinion my pet and he took from his pocket some article of finery he had bought for his mistress oh miles how good of you but why do you be squandering your money but it is very pretty and feemy put the collar over her shoulders don't toss it now or mary cassidy won't take it from me and then it would be left on my hands for mrs brennan wouldn't take it back anyhow and he put out his hand for the article no fear miles no fear said the laughing girl running round the table it won't be left on your hands i'll wear it to-morrow at mary brady's wedding but you won't keep it from me without paying me feemy oh paying you captain usher oh i'll pay you bring in your bill and she came round to him and he took her in his arms and kissed her then at least he seemed fondly attached to her her lover was evidently in one of his best humours and feemy was quite happy i won't further violate their conversation as it is not essential to the tale and was much such as those conversations usually are feemy told her lover of the wedding and he told her that he had already been invited and had promised to go and then she was more happy for feemy dearly loved a dance though it was only a jig at a country wedding but a dance with her lover would be delightful she had only danced with him twice on the first of these occasions she had met him at a grand gala party at mrs cassidy's the wife of lord birmingham's agent in mohill where first captain usher had made up his mind that feemy mcdermott was a finer girl than pretty little mary cassidy though perhaps not so well educated and once again at a little tea-party at mrs mckeon's which had been got up on purpose by feemy's friends to ask her husband as was to be when first people said it was a settled thing oh that was a happy night to feemy for her friends then all thought that her intimacy with usher was as good a thing as could be wished for and when feemy danced the whole night with him the miss mckeons all thought what a happy girl she was and that night she was happy then he first told her she should be his wife and swore that he never had loved and never would love any but her and oh how truly she believed him why should she not was not she happy to love him and why should not he be as much so to love her if any one had whispered a word of caution to her how she would have hated the whisperer but there was no one to whisper caution to feemy and she had given all she had her heart her love her obedience her very soul to him without having any guarantee that she really had aught in return it was not because she began to doubt her lover that she was now occasionally fretful and uneasy no the idea to doubt him never reached her but nevertheless she felt that things were not quite as they should be he seldom talked of marriage though he had said enough of love and when he did it was with vague promises saying how happy they would be when she was his wife how much more comfortable her home would be how nicely she would receive her friends in mohill these and little jokes about their future menage in a married state were all he had ever said she never asked him indeed she did not dare to ask she did not like to press him and captain usher had a frown about him which somehow feemy had already learned to fear 
he treated her too a little cavalierly and her father and brother not a little he ridiculed openly all that with her hitherto had been most sacred her priest and her religion she was not angry at this she was hardly aware of it and in fact was gradually falling into his way of thinking but the effect upon her was the same it made her uncomfortable a girl should never obey her lover till she is married to him she may comply with his wishes but she should not allow herself to be told with authority that this or that should be her line of conduct now Phemie had so given herself up to her lover that she was obedient to him in all things to him even in opposition to her brother and her priest and consequently she was to a degree humiliated even in his eyes she did not feel the degradation herself but there was still a feeling within which she could not define which usually destroyed her comfort now however miles was in too good a temper and seemed so kind to her that that and her little sweet prospect of pleasure did make her happy she was sitting in this humour on the old sofa close to him leaning on his arm which was round her waist when she heard her brother's footstep at the hall door there's thady miles sit off a bit miles got up and walked to the window and thady entered with anything but a gay look he had just left father john well thady said feemy how are you thady this morning said the captain offering his hand which the other reluctantly took good morning captain usher did you hear thady i caught another of your boys with malt up at loch sheen last monday joe reynolds or tim reynolds or something he's safe in carrick i did hear you got a poor boy up there who was in it by chance and took him off just for nothing but he's no tenant of ours so i have nothing to do with it his brother joe lives on our land do you mean to tell me, Thady, you believe all that dind nonsense about knowing nothing about it, and he sitting there in the cabin and the malt hadn't been in it half an hour? I don't know what you call dind nonsense, Captain Usher, but I suppose I may believe what I please without going to Carrick Jail too for it. Believe what you please for me, Master Thady. Why, you seem to have got out of bed the wrong side this morning, or have you and Keegan been striking up some new tiff about the rinse? mr keegan's affairs with me aren't any affairs of yours captain usher when i ask you to set them right then you can talk to me about them hoity-toity mr mcdermott your affairs and mr keegan's affairs and my affairs why i suppose you'll be calling me out next for taking up a dinned whining thief of a fellow because his brother is a tenant of your father's and send me the challenge by mr brady who invited me to a party at his house just now End of section 7 The Brother and Sister Part 1「Section 8 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 8 The Brother and Sister Part 2 Thady said nothing to this, but stood with his back to the fire, looking as grim as death. "'Oh, Captain Usher,' said Feemy, "'you wouldn't be quarrelling with Thady about nothing. You know he has so much to bother him with rents and things. Will you come to Mary's wedding to-morrow, Thady?' "'Quarrelling with him? Deed then, and I will not. But it seems he wants to quarrel with me.' "'When I do want to quarrel with you, Captain Usher, that is, should I ever want,' you may be quite certain it's not in a roundabout way i'll be telling you of it no don't my boy for ten to one i shouldn't understand what you'd be after didn't you say you'd walk up to augermore miss mcdermott i'm sorry to balk feemy of her walk captain usher if she did say so it's not very often i ask her to put herself out for me but this afternoon i shall feel obliged to her not to go captain usher stared and Feemy opened wide her large bright eyes. For what reason could her brother desire her to stay indoors? "'What can you want me in the house for, Thady, this time of day?' "'Well, never mind, Feemy, I do want you, and you'll oblige me by staying.' Feemy still had on the new collar, and she pulled it off and threw it on the table. 
she evidently imagined that it had something to do with her brother's unusual request she certainly would not have put it on in that loose way had she thought he would have seen it but then he so seldom came in there well captain usher she at last said slowly i suppose then i can't go to augermore to-day Captain Usher had turned to the window as if not to notice Thady's request, and now came back into the middle of the room as if Feemy's last sentence had been the first he had heard on the subject. "'Oh, you've changed your mind, then,' said he, and his face acquired the look that Feemy dreaded. "'Ladies, you know, are at liberty to think twice.' "'But, Thady, I did wish to go to Augermore particularly to-day. Wouldn't this evening or to-morrow do?' "'No, Feemy.' and Thady looked still blacker than Miles. This evening won't do, nor to-morrow. Well, Captain Usher, you see, we must put it off. And she looked deprecatingly at her lover. His answering look gave her no comfort. Far from it. But he said, I see no must about it, but that's for you to judge. Perhaps you should ask your father's leave to go so far from home." This was a cruel cut at all the fallen family, the father's incapacity, the sister's helplessness, and the brother's weak authority. Feemy did not feel it so. She felt nothing to be cruel that came from Usher. But Thady felt it strongly. He was as indignant as if he had lived all his life among those who thought and felt nobly, but, poor fellow, he could not express his indignation as well. My sister, Captain Usher, has long been left her own mistress to go in and out as she pleases, without lay from father, mother, or brother. Better perhaps for her that she had not. God knows I have seldom stopped her wishes, though maybe not often able to forward them. If she likes she may go now to Augermore, but if a brother's love is anything to her, she'll stay this day with me. Feemy looked from one to the other. She knew well by Miles's look that he still expected her to go, and strange as it may be, she hardly dared to disobey him. But then her brother looked determined and sadly resolute, and it was so unusual in him to speak in that way. "'Well, Miss McDermott,' said Usher, seeing he could not prevail without causing an absolute break with Thady, "'your brother wants you to count the rent for him. I'm glad he has received so much. It must be that, I presume, for he seldom troubles himself on much else, I believe.' I do what I have to do and must do. God knows it's trouble enough. Do you go and do the same? Even that, bad as it is, is better than amusing my sister by laughing at me. Oh, Thady, how can you be saying such things? You see I am staying with you, and why can't you be quiet? Thady made no reply. The captain twirled his hat, and ceremoniously bowing to the lady, took his leave. Thady had screwed his courage to the sticking point while the captain was the foe with whom he had to contend, and he had carried on the battle manfully while he spoke to Feemy in the captain's presence. But to tell the truth, when he heard the clatter of his horse's feet, he almost wished him back again, or that Feemy was away with him to Augermore. He was puzzled how to begin. He could not think what he was to say. Was he to quarrel with his sister for having a lover without telling him? was he to put it on the ground that her lover was a protestant that would have been the easiest line but then father john had especially barred that was he to scold her because her lover would not marry her at once that seemed unreasonable it had never occurred to him in his indignation to think of these difficulties and he now stood with his back to the fire looking awfully black but saying nothing "'Well, Thady, what is it I'll be doing for you instead of going to Augermore this morning?' at last said Feemy, the first to begin the disagreeable conversation. When Thady looked up, thinking what to answer to this plain speech, his eye, luckily for him, fell on the new Mohill collar. "'Where were you getting that collar, Feemy?' "'And are you after making me stay at home all the blessed day, and sending Captain Usher all the way back to Mohill, and he having come over here by engagement to walk with me, this was a fib of Feemy's, and all to ask me where I got a new collar? Maybe I was, Feemy, and maybe I wasn't, but I suppose there isn't any harm in my asking the question, or in you answering it? Oh, no, not the least. 
only it ain't usual in you to be asking such questions. But if there's no harm, I ask it now. Where were you getting the collar? Well, you're very queer, but if you must know, Captain Usher brought it with him from Mohill. And if you wanted a parcel from Mohill, why couldn't you let Brady bring it, who is in it constantly, instead of that upstart policeman who'd think it more condescension to bring that from Mohill than I would to be carrying a sack of potatoes so far? There, then, you're wrong. The policeman, as you're pleased to call him, thinks no such thing. Well, Feemy, but did you bid him bring it, or did he bring it of his own accord? Feemy could now shuffle no longer, so, blushing slightly, she said, Well, if you must know then, it was a present, and there's no such great harm in that, I suppose. Here Thady was again bothered. He really did not know whether there was any harm in it or not. A week ago he certainly would have thought not, but he was now inclined to think that there was. But he was not sure, and he sadly wished for Father John to tell him what to do. "'Well, Thady, now what is it you were wanting of me?' And then after a pause she added, her courage rising as she saw her brother's falling, "'Was it anything about Captain Usher?' "'Yes, it was.' "'Well?' "'Is there anything between you and he, Feemy?' "'What do you mean by between us, Thady?' And Feemy made a little fruitless attempt to laugh. "'Well, then, you're in love with him, ain't you? There, now, that's the long and the short.' "'Supposing I was, why shouldn't I?' "'Only this, Feemy, he's not in love with you.' This put Feemy's back up. "'Deed, then, it's little you know about it, for he just is, and I love him, too, with all my heart, and that's all about it, and you might have found that out without sending him back to Mohill.' "'I wish then he'd stay at Mohill, and that I might never see him over the door of Ballycloran again.' "'That's kind of you, Thady, after what I just told you. But don't tell him so, that's all.' "'But it's just what I mean to tell him, and what I shall go over to Mohill on purpose to tell him to-morrow.' "'Good gracious, Thady, and for why?' "'For why, Feemy? Because I still want to see my father's daughter an honest woman, though she may be soon a beggar. Because I don't want to see my sister crouching under a blackguard's foot.' because I don't want the worst disgrace that can happen to a family to blacken the name of McDermott. Feemy was now really surprised. Fear at her brother's strange words brought out at once what was ever most present in her mind. Oh, heavens, Thady, sure we're to be married. It must be remembered that this was not an interview between a fashionable brother and an elegant sister, both highly educated, in which the former had considered himself called upon to remonstrate with the latter for having waltzed too often with the same gentleman, and in which any expression of actual blame would highly offend the delicacy of the lady. Thady and his sister had not been accustomed to delicacy, and though she was much shocked at his violence, she hardly felt the strong imputation against herself, as she had so good an answer for it. She therefore exclaimed, Oh, heavens, Thady, we're sure to be married. Well, now, Feemy, just listen to me. If Captain Usher means to marry you under all circumstances, I don't know you could do better. I don't like him, as how should I, for isn't he a Protestant and a low-born impudent ruffian? But you do like him, and I suppose if he marries you, it's because he likes you. If not, why should he do it? And when once married, you'll have to fight your own battles, and no joke it'll be for either of you. But if, as I'm thinking, he has no idea on earth of marrying you, no more than he has of Mary Brady, I'll be dinned if I let him come here fooling you, though you haven't spirit enough to prevent it yourself. We're low enough already, Feemy, but for heaven's sake don't be making us lower yet. Well now, Thady, is that all? And you're wrong then, as you always are, for Captain Usher has asked me to have him, just as plain as I'm telling you now, and he's no ruffian. It is you're the ruffian to him, snubbing him when he speaks good-naturedly to you. And as for being a Protestant, I suppose he's none the worse for that, if he's none the better. I don't know why you do be hating him so, unless it's because I love him. I'm not talking about my hating him or loving him. 
if he's honest to you i'll neither say nor do anything to cross him but if he does mean to marry you it's time he did it that's all did he say anything to father about it what should he be saying to him of course dada would have no objection and would you then be letting him come here as he likes and settling nothing and just maining to marry you or not as he likes and you and he talked of over the country these four months back and he talking about you just as his mistress through the country Feemy was now regularly roused. That's a lie for you, Thady, and a black lie, about your own sister, too, to say he ever spoke a bad word against me. Pat Brady was telling you that, perhaps. It's what he never did or would do, for he's as true as you are false, and it's from jealousy and just from your hate, because everybody else likes him, makes you say it. And now we are on it, Thady, I'll just tell you one thing. I'm not to do what you tell me, nor will I, for I'm much more able to manage myself than you are for me. And for all you say about him, I'd attend more to one word from Miles than to all you can say, if you stood talking all night. And talk you may, but I'll not stand and hear you. And she bounced out of the room, slamming the door in a manner which made Mr. Flannelly's building shake to the foundation. Poor Thady was signally defeated. There he stood with his back to the fire, his old and dirty hat pulled low over his brow, his hands stuck into the pockets of his much-worn shooting-coat, his strong brogues and the bottoms of his corduroy trousers covered with dirt and dry mould, with the same heavy discontented look about his face which he always now wore. He certainly appeared but a sorry mentor for a young lady in a love affair. He felt that his sister despised him, the more from her being accustomed to the comparatively gentlemanlike appearance and refined manners of her lover. There he stood a long time without stirring, and so he stood in absolute silence. He had put his pipe down when first Captain Usher left the room, and he had not resumed it, now even that he was alone. With Thady this was a sign that his heart was very full indeed, and so it was, full almost to breaking." He had come there eager with two high feelings, love for his sister, real fond brotherly affection, and love and respect for his family name. He had wished to protect the former from insult and unhappiness, and to sustain the fallen respectability of the latter, and he had only been scoffed at and upbraided by the sister he loved. For he did love her, though little real communication had ever passed between them. He had always supposed that she loved him, he had taken it for granted, and had asked for no demonstrative affection. But her manner and her words now cut him very deep. He was not aware how very uncouth his own manner had been, that instead of reasoning with her gently, he had begun by sneering at her lover, that he had taken the very course to offend her self-love, and that therefore Feemy was quite as convinced at the end of the meeting that she had a right to be angry, as he was that he was the injured party. At any rate, there he stood, perfectly baffled. His object had been to advise her, if Captain Usher did not at once declare his purpose to her family, to put a stop to his further visits. And if she refused to comply with his advice, to tell her that he should himself ask Captain Usher his intentions, and that if they were not such as he approved, he should inform him that he was no longer welcome at Ballycloran. This had seemed, though disagreeable, straightforward and easy enough before the meeting, and now that it was over he could not think why he had not said exactly what he had come there to say. To give him his due he blamed himself as much as he did his sister. He was very unhappy about it all, but he could not think how he had been so very stupid. Had he lived more in the world he would have had recourse to the common resort in cases where speech is difficult he could have written a letter to his sister. But this never occurred to him. Even had it done so, Thady's epistolary powers were very small, and his practice very limited. A memento to the better sort of tenants, as to their trifle of rent, or a few written directions to Pat Brady about seizing crops and driving pigs, was its extent. And these were written on pieces of coarse paper, which had been ruled for accounts, and were smeared rather than fastened with very much salivated wafers. 
His writing, too, was very slow, and his choice of language not extensive. A letter on such a subject from a brother to a sister should be well turned, impressive, terse, sententious. That scheme would never have done for Thady. What then should he do? If he were to go to Captain Usher now, and tell him to discontinue his visits, he would only be asked if he had his sister's authority for doing so, or his father's. Should he get, or try to get, his father's authority? The old man, he knew, was moping over the parlour fire, half drunk, half stupid, and half asleep. After thinking it over alone there in Feemy's sitting-room for an hour, he determined that all he could do was to go back again to his only friend, Father John. When Feemy slammed the door, as she did at the end of her violent oration above given, she betook herself to her bedroom and began to cry. Though she had so well assumed an air of an injured person, and had to the best of her abilities vindicated her absent lover, still she was very unhappy at what her brother had said to her. Nor in truth was it only because Thady had expressed himself unkindly about Miles, but she also could not but feel that there was something wrong. She never for a moment believed that her lover spoke loosely of her behind her back, for she never for a moment doubted his love, but she did feel that it would be more comfortable if Miles would speak, or let her speak to some of her family, if it were only to her father. Though she knew so little of what was usual in the world, still she felt that even his sanction, stupid, tipsy, unconscious as he was, would give to her attachment a respectability which it wanted now, and if a day of her marriage were fixed, though circumstances might require that it should be ever so distant, she would be able to talk much more satisfactorily of her prospects to Mary Cassidy and the Miss McKeons. Besides, if she could bring matters to this state, she could so triumphantly prove that Thady was wrong in his unhandsome conjectures, and she determined before she had done thinking on the subject, to give Miles a few hints as to her wishes. The next day he would be sure to come to Ballycloran on his way to McGovery's wedding, and he would probably ask why Thady had prevented their walk to Augermore, and then she would have a good opportunity of saying what she wanted. End of section 8, The Brother and Sister, Part 2section nine of the mcdermott's of ballycloran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the mcdermott's of ballycloran by anthony trollope section nine chapter seven the priest's dinner party thady as i said walked off to the priest's cottage to partake of the relics of a goose and seek counsel of his friend, but it was not Father John's dinner hour yet, and he found no one in but Judy McCann. He walked into the priest's little parlour, and sat down to wait for him, again meditating on all the evils which hung over his devoted family, and sitting thus he at length fell fast asleep. Here he slept for above an hour, when he was awakened by the door opening behind him, and in jumping up to meet Father John, as he thought, he encountered the lank and yellow features, much-worn dress, and dirty, moist hand of Father Cullen. "'Were you sleeping, then, Mr. Thady, before Father McGrath's fire? Deed, then, I dare say you've been walking a great sight, for you look jaded. I am not that fresh myself, for I've been away to Loch Sheen, to Widow Burns. Bad luck to the creatures, there's nothing but sick calls now, and my heart's broken with them, so it is.' Thady's only answer to this was, "'How are you, Father Cullen?' He wished him back at Maynooth. "'Well, I hope Father McGrath isn't far off, then,' and he looked at a watch nearly as big as a church clock, "'for I'm very hungry, and my, it's only twenty minutes to six. This gave Thady the very unwelcome intelligence that Father Cullen meant to dine at the cottage. "'And now the pony's lamed under me,' and I had to walk all the way to Loch Sheen in the dirt and gutter. Thady's mind was full of one subject, and he could not interest himself about the curate's misfortunes in the lameness of his pony and the dirt of his walk. 
and bad manners to them commissioners and people they sent over bothering and altering the people. Couldn't we have our own parishes as we like, and fix them ourselves, but they must be sending English people to give us English parishes, altering the mirrings just to be doing something. You know, Thady, the far end of Loch Sheen up there? Yes, Father Cullen, I know where Loch Sheen is. Well, that used to be Cash Carrigan Parish, and Father Comins, that's the parish priest in Cash, don't live not two miles all out from there, and the widow Burns is six miles from where I live out yonder, if it's a step, and yet they must go and put Loch Sheen into this parish. Father Cullen's misfortunes still did not come home to McDermott. He sat looking at the fire. There's that poor old woman, too, up there, left to starve by herself, the creature, now they've gone and put her two sons into jail. I wonder what the country'll be the better for all them boys being crammed into jail. I wished they'd kept that usher down in the north when he was there. He's fitter for that place than County Leitrim, anyhow. What's that about Captain Usher, Father Cullen? Sure you didn't hear he put three more of the boys into jail Tuesday evening, and one of them off drum leash? Heard it, of course I heard it and more than I'll be hearing it, too. Oh, Father Cullen, wherever that usher came from, I wished they'd kept him there. Thady's earnestness in this surprised the young priest. Why, I thought you and he were so thick, but I'm glad it's not so much so. Why would the like of you be making so free with a Protestant like him? Did you break with him then, Mr. Thady? McDermott by no means desired to admit Father Cullen into the conference about his sister. The strong expression of his dislike had fallen from him, as it were, involuntarily. He therefore turned off the question. Oh, no, break with him. Why would I break with him? But you can't think I like to see him driving the boys into the jail like sheep to the shambles. What business had they sending Tim Reynolds into jail? There'll be noise enough in the country about that, Father Cullen. There'll never be noise enough about that, and such like cruelties till he and all the sort is put down entirely in the country, and that'll only be when the country rights herself as she should do, and, by God's blessing, will still, and that you and I, Mr. Thady, may live to see it. The further expression of Father Cullen's favorite political opinions was here interrupted by Father John's quick, heavy step on the little gravel walk. "'Well, boys,' said he, sitting down and pulling off his dirty gaiters and shoes before the fire. Waiting for the goose, eh? He gad, when I found out what time it was, I thought you'd be bribing Judy to divide it between you. Cullen, you look awfully hungry. I'd better set you down at the ham first, or you'll make terrible work at the half-bird, for a half is all there is for the three of us. Well, Judy, let's have the stew." The dinner was now brought in, and Father John talked joyously, as though nothing was on his mind, and yet we know the sad conversation he had had with young McDermott that very morning, and that Thady was there chiefly to tell the upshot of his mission, and Thady's face was certainly no emblem of good news. He had also had a sad morning's work with his curate, his parishioners were in great troubles, the times were very bad on them, many of them were in jail for illegal distillation, more were engaged in the business, and were determined so to continue in open defiance of the police. Many of them were becoming ribbon men, or at any rate were joining secret and illegal societies. Driven from their cabins and little holdings, their crops and cattle taken from them, they were everywhere around desperate with poverty, and discontented equally with their own landlords, and the restraints put upon them by the government. All this weighed heavily on Father John's mind, and he strongly felt the difficulty of his own situation. But he was not the man to allow his spirits to master him when entertaining others in his own house. Had only Cullen or only Thady been there, he would have turned his own mind to that of his guest. But as their cases were so different, he tried to cheer them both. Egad, Thady, here's another leg. Come, my boy, we've still a leg to stand upon. Cullen has just finished one, and I could have sworn I ate the other yesterday. See, did Judy put one of her own in the hash? Ex pede herculeum. You'd know it so anyway by the toughness. Lend me your fork, Thady, or excuse my own. 
Well, when I get the cash from Dennis's marriage, I'll get a carving knife and fork from Garley's. Not but what I ought to have one. Judy, where's the big fork? Why, didn't your reverence smash it entirely, drawing the cork from the bottle of sherry wine you got for Dr. Blake the day he was here about the dispensary business? This little explanation Judy bawled from the kitchen. It is true for you, Judy. So I did. And bad luck to the day, and Dr. Blake, too. That same day, Thady, cost me three good shillings for a bottle of bad wine, my old fork, and a leg of mutton and all for I thought I'd be able to come round the doctor about his coming down to Drumsna here once a week regular, and when he'd ate my mutton and drank the sherry, he just told me it was not possible. He'd sooner be making maybe twenty or thirty poor sick creatures be walking five or six miles than he'd ride over to see them, though it's little he'd think of the distance av he'd a feet a touch." For the matter of that, Cullen, I think yourself would go quicker to a wedding than you would to a sick call. Deed, I know myself I like the part of the business where the cash is. In course, Mr. McGrath, I'd go with more spirit, but not a foot quicker, nor so quick. Maybe I'd grumble at the one and not the other, but what the church tells me I'll do, if it pleases God to let me. Oh, Cullen, you'd make me think I was admonishing you. A fine martyr he'd make, wouldn't he, Thady? Cullen, who took everything in downright earnest, clasped his dirty hands and exclaimed, If the church required it, and it was God's will, I hope I would. Well, well, but it'll be just at present much more comfortable for all parties you should square round a little and take your punch. Come, Thady, are you going to be a martyr too? It's a heathenish kind of penance, though, to be holding your tongue so long. Come, my boy, you were to bring the ticket about the rent with you. Thady opened his ears at the word rent, but before he'd time to make any suitable reply, Judy was removing the things, Father John was pulling back the table, and pushing Cullen into a corner by the fire. Now, Judy, the fire under the pump, you know, out with the groceries. See, but have I any sugar, then? Sorrow a bit of lump, but moist and plenty, Father John. Well, my boys, you must take your punch with brown sugar for once in your life, and what's the harm? What we want in sugar will make up in the whiskey I'll be bound. Judy, bring the tumblers. Out came the tumblers, that is, two tumblers, one with a stand, the other with a flat bottom, and a teacup with a spoon in it. The teacup was put opposite Father John's chair, and the reverend father himself proceeded to pour a tolerable modicum of spirits out of the stone jar into a good-sized milk jug, and placed it on the table. "'Isn't it queer, then, Thady, I can't get a bottle, or a decanter, or anything of glass to remain in the house at all? I'm sure I had a decanter, though I didn't see it these six months.' "'And wouldn't it be odd if you did, Father John? Wasn't it smashed last February?' smashed why i think everything gets smashed well now mr thady to hear his reverence going on the like of that said the old woman appealing to mcdermott and wasn't it himself sent the broth down in it to widow green the latter end of last winter and didn't the foolish slip of a girl her granddaughter go to hate it over the hot coals for the old woman just as it was and in course the hate smashed the glass and why wouldn't it and the broth was all spilt but isn't the jug just as good for the spirits, your honours? Well, well, boiling mutton broth over a turf fire, in my cut decanter. Optat epphipia bos pigar. That'll do, Judy, that'll do. And the old woman retreated with a look of injured innocence. Father John sniffed the whiskey. Fumum bibire institute. It's the right smell of the smoke. Come, Cullen, make your punch. Come, Thady, don't be sitting there that way. And he proceeded to make a most unpalatable looking decoction of punch in his teacup, to which the moist sugar gave a peculiarly nasty appearance. But all Father John's attempted jovialities and preparations for enjoyment could not dispel the sadness from Thady's face or the settled solemnity from Father Cullen's visage. He never joked and rarely conversed. When he did speak, it was usually to argue or declaim, and Thady, even in his best times, 
was but a sorry companion for such a man as Father John. There the three of them sat, with their eyes fixed on the fire, all drinking their punch, it is true, but with very little signs of enjoying it. How long they remained thus, I am unable to say, but Father John was getting very tired of his company, when they were all three startled by a sharp rap at the hall door, and before they had had time to surmise who it was, Captain Usher walked in. Now, though neither Father John nor his curate were very fond of Usher, they both were tolerably intimate with him. Indeed, till lately, when the priest began to think the gallant captain was playing his fair parishioner false, and the opinion was becoming general that he was acting the tyrant among the people, Father John had rather liked Usher than not. He was lively, and if not well educated, he had some general comprehension of which no others of those the priest knew around him could boast. He had met him first very frequently at Ballycloran, and since dined with him at Mohill, and had more than once induced him to join the unpretending festivities of the cottage. There was nothing, therefore, very singular in Captain Usher's visit, and yet, from what was uppermost in the mind of each of the party, it did surprise them all. Father John, however, was never taken aback. Ah, my darling, and how are you? Come to see we are drinking Parliament and not cheating the king. Although they were drinking potheen, and though Usher might, doubtless, have put a fine of from five to fifty pounds on the priest for doing so, Father John knew that he was safe. It was at that time considered that no revenue officer would notice potheen if he met it, as a guest. People are rather more careful now on the matter. Oh, Father John, I never bring my government taster with me when I am not on service. But if you've any charity, give me an air of the fire and a drop of what's going forward, all for love. How are you, Father Cullen? And he shook hands with the curate. How are you, Thady, old boy? and he slapped Macdermot on the back as though they were the best friends in the world. "'How are you, Captain Usher?' said the former, sitting down again as though the captain's salutation were a signal for him to do so, and as if he did not dare to do it before. Nor would he. Father Cullen had been told that he should stand up when strangers came into a room, that it was a point of etiquette, and there he would have stood, though it had been ten minutes, if Usher had not addressed him. Thady did not get up at all. In fact, he did not know what to do or say. He had been waiting anxiously, hoping that Father Cullen would go, and now the difficulties in his way were more than doubled. Captain Usher, however, took no notice of his silence, but, sitting down by Father John, began rubbing and warming his hands at the fire. "'Well, may I be didn't begging your reverence's pardon, if this isn't as cold a night as I'd wish to be out in, and as dark as my hat. I say, Thady, this'll be the night for the boys to be running a drop of the stuff. There'd be no seeing the smoke now, anyhow. I was dining early at Carrick, and was getting away home quick as I could, and my mare threw a shoe, luckily just opposite the forge down there. So I walked up here, Father John, and I told them to bring the mare up when she shod. I'm glad the mare made herself so agreeable. Come, Judy, another tumbler here. By the by, then, Cullen, you must take to a teacup like myself. You're used to it. And Captain Usher, you must take brown sugar in your punch, though you are not used to it. If I could make lump sugar for you, I'd do it myself directly. Oh, what's the odds? I'm so cold I shan't feel it. And without any apology, he took poor Father Cullen's tumbler, who emptied the rest of his punch into a teacup. "'Well, Thady, and who do you think there was at Hoosens but Keegan, your friend, you know, and a very pleasant fellow he is in his way, but how he does abuse you Catholics!' "'Well, Captain, and it's little good you'll hear any of us say of him, so that's all fair,' said Father John. "'Take it that way, so it is, but I thought I heard some of you at Ballycloran say he was once a Catholic.' said Usher, turning to Thady. Your father was telling me, so I think. He seemed determined to make Thady say something, but he only muttered an affirmative. Whoever said so, said wrong, began Father Cullen, rising up and putting his hands on the table, as if he was going to make a speech. 
Whoever said so said wrong. His father was a Catholic, and his mother was a Catholic, but he never was a Catholic. And how could he, for he never was a Christian? And as he sat down, he turned round his large obtruding eyes for approval. Oh, if you go on that high ground, you'll lose half your flock. We are glad to get them whether they are Christians or not, so long as they are good Protestants. So you see, Keegan's good enough for us. And what could he do, poor fellow? If you wouldn't have him, he must come to us. Oh, then, Father John, he's satisfied to say men become Protestants when they are no longer fit to be Catholics. Was that the way yourself became a Protestant, Captain Usher? If I'm to be dinned for that, you know, it is my father's and mother's fault. I ain't like Keegan. I didn't choose the bad road myself. Oh, but it wasn't for yourself to choose the good road? Didn't you say you knew ours was the old church as it stood always down from Christ? If you do go wrong, you don't do it from ignorance, but you do it willfully, and your soul will howl in hell for it. Captain Usher only burst out laughing at this little outbreak, but Father John exclaimed, Whist, whist, Cullen, none of that here. If you can take any steps towards sending Captain Usher to heaven, well and good, but don't be sending him the other way while the poor fellow is over his punch. Never mind, Father John. I and Father Cullen are very good friends, and I think he'll hear me read my recantation yet. But he can't do it to-night, as here's my mare. I must go by Ballycloran, Thady. Will you walk as far as the avenue with me? Thank you, Captain Usher. I'll not be going out of this just yet. Ah, well, I see you're out with me for the tiff we had this morning. He's angry now, Father John, just through my telling him he couldn't count all the money he'd received this week. Father John observed the different manners of the young men towards each other, and from Thady's silence was quite sure that matters had gone amiss between them. "'I didn't know it before then, Captain Usher,' said Thady, "'but if you must know, I've business to spake to Father John about.' "'Oh, well, open confession's good for the soul. I hope he'll absolve you for your bad temper. "'It's I am to get the absolution if I can this time. It's the old story.' "'Captain, a thrifle of rent that's owing, nothing more.' "'Well, it's all one to me. Good night to you all.' And Captain Usher rode away home to Mohill. Father Cullen reseated himself by the fire, and again assumed his gaze at the hot turf, just as he was before Usher came in, and looked hopelessly immovable. Thady shifted about uneasily in his chair, then got up and walked around the room, and then sat down again but the curate wouldn't move. At last Father John ended the affair by saying, "'Any more punch, Cullen?' "'Thank you, no, sir.' "'Then just go home, there's a good fellow.' Cullen rose up, not the least offended. Nothing would offend him. Took his hat and did as he was bid. At last Thady and Father John were left alone. "'Now, my boy,' said the priest, as he put on more turf, We'll be alone for half an hour, or it is odd. Well, you spoke to Feemy? I did spake to her, Father John, but I'd better have left it alone, for when I began she only snubbed me and told me she'd manage her own business. But, oh, Father John, I fear it will be a bad business. She told me she loved him, and that he had gone so far as asking her to marry him, and all that. But as far as I could learn, it was only just talk that but I could say nothing to her, for she got the better of me, and then flew out of the room, saying it did not matter what I said. And then McDermott told the priest exactly what had passed, how headstrong Feemy was, how infatuated she was with her lover, and how regardless of what any one could say to her on the subject. And now, Father John, what on earth shall I do at all, for the heart's broken in me, with all the troubles that's on me? I'll tell you what, Thady, don't be falling out with Captain Usher, anyway not yet, for he may mean honestly, you know, though I own my heart doubts him, but take my advice and don't be falling out with him yet. I'll see Feemy to-morrow, and if she won't hear or won't heed what her priest says to her, I'll tell you what we'll do. One woman will always listen to another, and I'll ask Mrs. McKeon to speak to Feemy, and tell her the character she'll be giving herself. 
Mrs. McKeon has daughters of her own, and when I remind her that Feemy has neither mother, nor sister, nor female friend of any kind, she'll not be refusing me this, disagreeable though it may be to her. And now, Thady, do you go home to bed, and pray to God to protect your sister. And remember, my boy, that though you may have reason to be displeased with her, as I said, she has neither mother nor sister. She has no one to look to but yourself, and if there is much in her to forgive, there are many causes for forgiveness. Thady silently shook hands with his friend and went home, and whether or no he obeyed the priest's injunctions to pray for protection for his sister, that good man himself did not go to sleep till he had long been on his knees, imploring aid for her and the numerous unfortunates of his flock. End of Section 9 the Priest's Dinner Party Section 10 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lynn Thompson The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope Section 10 Miss McDermott at home At any rate the priest's admonitions had this effect on Thady that when he came in to breakfast after his morning avocations He spoke to Feemy whom he had not seen since their stormy interview of yesterday with kindness and for him gentleness But she seemed only half inclined to accept the proffered olive branch Thady's morning salutations couldn't go far towards putting a young girl in good humour, for even now that he meant to be gracious, it was only, Well, Feemy, how's yourself this morning? And will you be ready for Mary Brady's wedding? But her answer, Oh, in course. Will you take your breakfast there? Showed him that she had not forgiven his aspersions against her lover, for the breakfast passed over in silence with the exception of Larry's usual growls. Thady, therefore, when he had swallowed his potatoes and milk, betook himself again to Pat Brady and the fields. Larry was left alone to sleep, if he could, over the fire, and Feemy betook herself to her own parlour, and proceeded to penetrate farther into the mysteries of the mysterious assassin. There she sat, a striking contradiction of that proverb, which we so often quote with reference to young ladies, and which so seldom can be quoted with truth. Beauty unadorned, adorned the most. Usher would not come till the evening, and her hair was therefore in papers, and the very papers themselves looked soiled and often used. Her black hair had been hastily fastened up with a bit of old black ribbon, and a comb boasting only two teeth, and the short hairs around the bottom of her well-turned head were jagged and uneven, as though bristling with anger at the want of that attention which they required. She had no collar on, but a tippet of different material and colour from her frock was thrown over her shoulders. Her dress itself was the very picture of untidiness. It looked as though it had never seen a mangle. The sleeves drooped down, hanging despondingly below her elbows, and the tuck of her frock was all ripped and torn. She had trod on it, or someone else had done it for her, and she had not been at the trouble of mending it. It was also too tight, or else Feemy had not fastened it properly, for a dreadful gap appeared in the back, showing some article beneath which was by no means as white as it should be. But then, wasn't it only her morning frock? In front of it, too, was a streaked mark of grease, the long-since deposited remains of some of her culinary labours. Her feet were stuffed into slippers. Truth compels me to say that they would more properly be called shoes down at heel. Her stockings were woefully dirty, and, horror of all horrors, out at the heels. There she sat, with her feet on the fender, her face in her hands, and her elbows on her knees, with her thumb-worn novel lying in her lap between them. There she sat, how little like the girl that had eclipsed Mary Cassidy at the ball at Mohill. Poor though Feemy was, she could make out a dress and a handsome dress for such an occasion as that. 
Then every hair on her fine head had been in its place. The curls of her rich brown hair were enough to win the heart of any man. The collar round her fair neck had been beautifully washed and ironed, for her own hands had been at work on it half the morning. Her white long gloves had been new and well-fitting, and her only pair of silk stockings had been scrupulously neat. Her dress fitted her fine person as though made by Carson, and she had walked as though she knew she need not be ashamed of herself. But now, how great was the contrast! No girls know better how to dress themselves than Irish girls, or can do it with less assistance or less expense, but they are too much given to morning dishevelment. If they would only remember that the change in a man's opinion and mind respecting a girl will often take place as quick as the change in her appearance, and that the contrast will be quite as striking, they would be more particular. And they never can be sure of themselves, take what precautions they will. Lovers will drop in at most unseasonable hours. They have messages to deliver, plans to propose or leave to take. They can never be kept out with certainty, and all the good done by a series of brilliant evenings, satin dresses, new flowers for the hair, expensive patterns and tediously finished toilets, may be, and often is, suddenly counteracted by one untidy head, soiled dress or dirty stocking. I will, however, return to my story. There sat Feemy, apparently perfectly contented with her appearance and occupation, till a tap at the door disturbed her, and in walked Mary Brady, the bride-elect. "'Well, Miss Feemy, and how's your beautiful self this morning? "'And how are you, Mary, now the time is coming so near?' Mary Brady was a very tall woman, being about the same height as her brother, thirty or thirty-three years of age, with a plain, though good-humoured-looking face, over which her coarse hair was divided on the left temple. She had long, ungainly limbs, and was very awkward in the use of them, and though not absolutely disagreeable in her appearance, she was so nearly so, that she would hardly have got married without the assistance of two small pigs and a thrifle of change, which had given her charms in the eyes of both Ginty and Dennis McGovery. Oh, Miss Feemy, and I'm fretting so these two days, that is, ever since Dennis said it was to be this blessed day. The Lord help me, and I with it all on my shoulders, and the divil of a one to lend a hand the least taste in life. Why, Mary, what can there be so much to do at all? Och, then, haven't I my white dress to get made, and the pair of sheets to get hemmed, for Dennis says hidden weren't large enough for him and I, and here the Amazon gave a grin of modesty, and you know it was part of the bargain I was to have a pair of new sheets. Dennis had kept this back from Father John in the inventory of his bride's fortune. And isn't there the supper to get ready, and the things in the house to ready, and all? And then when I'd done that, it were all for nothing, for the wedding isn't to be at Pat's at all. The wedding not to be at Brady's? Where is it to be, then? Oh, just at Mrs. Meehan's shop below, at the lock. Oh, that's better still, Mary. We won't have so far to go in the mud. That's just what the boys were saying, miss, and they be so much more room, and there's so many to be in it, they couldn't all be in it, at all at all at home. So you see we is to be married in the room inside, where the two beds is, and they is to come out of it, and the supper is to be there, miss, you see, and the most of the drinking, and then we'll have the big kitchen comfortable to ourselves for the music and the dancing. And what do you think? Pat has got Seamus na Pabria, all the ways out of County Mayo, him that makes all the pipes through the country, miss, and did the music about O'Connell all out of his own head, miss. Oh, it'll be the most elegant wedding entirely, miss, anywhere through the country this long time back. When one is to be married, it's as well to do it decently as not, ain't it, miss? Oh, that it is, Mary, and yours will be quite a dash. Yours will be the next, you know, Miss Feemy, and that will be the wedding. But there's one thing that bothers me entirely. Well, out with it at once, Mary. I suppose you want to borrow the plates and knives and forks and things. Oh, that's in course, Miss Feemy, and it's very good in you to be offering them that way before I ask the loan of them at all. But that ain't all. You see, I'm so bothered entirely with them big sheets, and they not half finished, and not a taste in life done to the cap of me yet, and the praties and vegetables to get ready. 
and the things to dress and not a soul to lend me a hand at all unless just mrs mehan's bit of a girl and she's biddy readying the rooms and so miss feemy if you'd just let biddy slip up for the afternoon you know catty could be doing for you down here and then miss i'd be made entirely well mary i suppose she must go up then one thing's certain you can't be getting married every day why no miss that is certain for even if dennis were to die away like and in course he must one day for he ain't quite so young now i would have to be waiting a little miss before i got my second mary brady had been above thirty years getting one husband she was therefore probably right as to the delay she might experience on obtaining a second well mary biddy may go with you long life to you miss and about the things then you know the plates and the knives and the glasses oh mary i'll not have you bringing the glasses down there at all sure mrs mehan's glass is enough of her own and she selling whiskey you may take the knives and forks and the plates though you must leave us enough for ourselves and there ain't so many of them in it after all well miss feemy that's very good of you now and you'll be bringing your own sweetheart with you won't you dear and it's i'd be sorry you'd be at my wedding and no one fit to dance with your father's daughter oh if you mean captain usher he told me pat asked him himself and he'd sure be there and who else should i mean alanna sure isn't he your own beau and ain't you to be married to him miss feemy nonsense mary well now but sure you wouldn't be ashamed of telling me isn't you going to have him miss but mustn't i wait to be asked like another sure mary you didn't go asking dennis mcgovery did you no then indeed i didn't darling and glad enough he was to be axing me well and mustn't i be the same oh in course but miss feemy the captain's been up here courting at ballycloran now these six months sure he's axed you before this miss feemy feemy was rather puzzled she didn't like to say she was not engaged she had a presentiment mary brady was fishing to find out if the report about captain's inconstancy was true and as matters stood she did not exactly like to say that the affair was arranged well mary then i'll tell you exactly how it is but mind i don't want it talked about yet for reasons so you won't say anything about it if i tell you ach then is it i sorrow a word in life shall any one be the better of me and you know miss feemy i wouldn't tell you a lie for worlds well then it's just this way i and the captain is engaged but there's reasons for him why he couldn't be married just immediately so you see that's why i don't want it talked about ah well dear i knew there was something of that in it a nice handsome gentleman like the captain wouldn't be treating the likes of you that way what way mary why they do be saying who do be saying why just through the country people you know miss who must always have their gag they do be saying that's only some of them you know miss who don't be quite friendly to ballycloran that the captain don't mean to be married at all and is only playing tricks with you and that he's a schemer and i knew you wouldn't be letting go on that way and so i said to pat feemy didn't quite like all this it was a corroboration of, of what her brother had said for though the captain had certainly promised to marry her he had never thought it necessary to ask her she knew the matter did not rest on a proper footing and though she was hardly aware of it she felt the indignity of the probability of being jilted being talked over by such persons as pat brady your brother mary might have saved himself the trouble of telling lies about either the captain or me not of course that i care oh it won't pat miss said it only he heard it you know miss through the country well it don't signify who said it but don't you be repeating what i told you is it i miss sorrow a word miss will any one hear from me of it would i tell a lie about it but i'll be glad to see the day you're married for that'll be the great wedding through the country oh laws this exclamation was not a part of the last speech but was a kind of long-drawn melancholy sigh which did not take place for some minute or two after she had done speaking during which time feemy had been thinking of her own affairs quite forgetful of mary brady and her wedding my mary what are you sighing about well then miss feemy and isn't it a dreadful thing to be leaving one's home and one's friends like and to be going right away into another house entirely miss and altogether the thoughts of what is the married life at all frets me greatly why you needn't be married unless you like it mary 
Oh, Miss Feemy, that's in course too. But then a young woman is behoved to do something for her family. But you haven't a family, you know, Mary, now. No, but Miss Feemy, Alanna, you know the chances is I shall have now I'm to be married, and it's for them, the little innocents, I does it. The strength of this argument did not exactly strike Feemy, but she thought it was all right and said nothing. And then the troubles of a married life, darling, suppose them is too many for me. What'll I do at all? I wonder, Miss Feemy, will I get any sleep at all? Indeed, Mary, I was never married, but why shouldn't you sleep? Deed then, Miss, I don't just know. But they do be saying that Dennis is so noisy at nights, so shooing all the cattle over again as he shod in the day, and counting his money. And you see, if he was hammering away the blessed live-long night that way, maybe I'd be hurted. It's too late for you to think of that now, but he'll be quieter than that, I should think, when you're with him. Maybe he will, miss, as you say. I couldn't decently be off it now. But thin, oh, laws, I'm thinking what will poor Pat be doing without me, and no one in it at all to buy his praties and feed the pigs, the craters. That's nonsense, Mary. You and he was always fighting. He'll have more peace in it when you're gone. That's true for you, miss, certainly. And that's what breaks the heart of me entirely. Too much pace isn't good for Pat. No how. He'll never do any good, you see, when he comes to have so much of his own way. Deed, then, the heart's low within me to be laving Pat this way. And Miss Brady put the tail of her gown into the corner of her eye. But, Mary, you'll have to be caring more for your husband now. I suppose you love Dennis McGovery, don't you? I'd never marry a man unless I loved him. Oh, that's in course I do love him. Why wouldn't I? For he has a nice little room all decently furnished for any young woman to go into, beside the shop. And he never has the horses at all into the one we sleeps in, as is to be. And he's a handful of money, and he can make any woman comfortable. And of course I love him. So I do. But what's the use of loving a man if he's to be hammering away at a horseshoe all night? Oh, they're making game of you, they are, Mary. Depend upon it, when he's tired working all day, he'll sleep sound enough. Well, I suppose as he will. But now, Miss Feemy, I wonder is he a quiet sort of a man? Will he be fighting at all, do you think? Really, then, I can't tell. But even if he does, they say you can make your own part pretty well when it's necessary. For the matter of that, so I can. And I don't mind a scrimmage just now and then, such as I and Pat have. If it's only to show, I won't be put under. But they do say Dennis is very strong. And I don't think I'd ever have had him if I'd known afore he'd been so mortal strong. Well, that's all too late now for you to be talking of. And take my advice, Mary. Don't be fighting with him at all, if you can help it. For from what people say of him, I think your husband, as will be, sticks mostly to his own way. And I don't think he'll let his wife interfere. But he's a hard-working man, and it'll be a great comfort to you that you'll never see your children wanting. Oh, the children, the little dears, it's of them I'm thinking. God, he knows. It's chiefly along of them as makes me do it. But, oh, laws, miss, it's a dreadful thing to come over one all at once. But it's a great comfort anyway, you're letting Biddy come down to ready the mutton and praties and things. And so, miss, as I've so much to do, you'll excuse my waiting any longer. And you and Mr. Thady and the captain, for I'm thinking the master won't be coming, will be down not later than Sivan, for Father John's to be in at Sivan exact. And who's to get the kiss, Mary? Oh, miss! The captain says he'll have a try for it anyway. Oh, that'd be too much honour entirely, miss. But if here isn't Father John coming up the avenue. And Mary hurried off into the realms underground to secure the willing assistance of Biddy. And Father John's ponderous foot up the hall steps gave Feemy anything but a pleasant sensation. She was very fond of Father John, too, but somehow, just at present, she did not feel quite pleased to see him. The doors were all open, and Father John walked into Feemy's boudoir. However, he was only Father John, and it wasn't her dress, therefore, that annoyed her. Any dress would do for a priest. After the common greetings were over, and Father John had asked after the family, and Feemy had surmised that it was either her father or her brother that he wished to see, the priest began his task. No, Feemy, my dear, it's not your father or your brother I want to see this turn, but just your own self. 
and father john sat himself down by the fire i'm come just to have a little chat with you and you mustn't be angry with me for meddling with what perhaps you'll say was no business of mine this exordium made Feemy's heart palpitate for she knew it must be about captain usher but she only said oh no father john i won't be angry with you that's my darling for you know it's only out of love for you and thady that i'm speaking and a real friend to you can't do you any harm if after all you shouldn't take his advice oh no father john and i'm sure i'm very much obliged to you father john himself hardly knew how to take the sting from the rebuke which he was aware his mission could not but convey and he was no less aware that unless the dose had a little sugar in it at any rate to hide its unprepossessing appearance even if it did not render it palatable his patient would never take it Thady you know was dining with me yesterday and we were talking over Ballycloran and old Flannelly's money matters And I was you see just making a bad tenants excuses to him and so on From one thing to another till we got talking about you Feemy in short He didn't seem quite happy about you. I don't know. I ever did anything to make him unhappy no it wasn't anything you had done to make him unhappy but he is afraid you ain't happy in yourself and feemy my dear you should always remember that though thady is rough in his manners and perhaps not at all times so gentle in his words as he should be his heart is in the right place at any rate where you are concerned though maybe he doesn't say so as often as others might he's a very fond brother to you and i'm sure i'm always very fond of him but then he's so queer but father john if i've offended thady i'll beg his pardon for i'm sure i don't want to be out with him i'm sure you don't fee me but that's not exactly it either thady's not the least in life offended with you he's not at all easy to take offence at least not with you but he doesn't think you are just at ease with yourself and to come to the truth at once he was telling me what passed between you yesterday Feemy blushed up to her paper curls but she said nothing now i'm thinking thady didn't go about saying what he wanted to say yesterday quite the way he should have done and i'm not sure i shall do it any better myself but i thought it as well to step up as i was certain you'd hear whatever your priest had to say to you i don't think the better of thady though for going and talking about me if he'd only let me alone by myself i'd do well enough it's all that talking does the harm father john Father John didn't exactly like to tell Feemy that girls in her situation were just the people that ought not to be left alone by themselves Which probably means being left alone with someone of their own choosing and that he was of the opinion that she would not do very well if left alone in that way That however was what he wished to convey to her Oh, but my dear you must think better of Thady for wishing to protect you as well as he can and you left alone so much yourself here so you know father john even blushed a little as he said it it's about this fine lover of yours we are speaking now my dear i've nothing whatever to say against captain usher for you know he and i are great cronies indeed it's only last night he was taking his punch with your brother and cullen down at the cottage you weren't saying anything to captain usher about me father john you may take your oath of that my dear I respect a lady's secret a great deal too much for that no I was only saying that he was down at the cottage last night to prove that he and I are friends and it's not out of any prejudice I'm speaking about his being a Protestant and all that not but that I'd sooner be marrying you to a good Catholic Feemy but that's neither here nor there but you've known him now a long time it's now four months since we all heard for certain it was to be a match and to tell you the truth my dear People are saying that captain usher does not mean anything serious I Think they'll drive me mad with their talk and what good will it do for you and Thady to be coming telling me what they say? This good Feemy if what they say is false and unfounded as I'm sure I hope it is and if you're so fond as captain usher Don't you think it would be as well to put an end to the report by telling your father and brother of your being engaged and Settling something about your marriage and all that I did tell my brother I was engaged father John what would you have I Tell you what I'll have I'd have captain usher ask your father or brother's consent 
There's no doubt we all know, but he'd get it. But it's customary, and in my mind it would only be decent. So he will, I dare say, but mayn't there be reasons why he don't wish to have it talked about yet? Then, Feemy, in your situation, do you think a long clandestine engagement is quite the thing for you, is quite prudent? And how can it be clandestine, Father John, when you and Thady and everyone else almost knows all about it? Feemy's sharpness was too much for Father John, so he had to put it on another tack. Well, Feemy, now just look at the matter this way one moment. Supposing now, only just for supposition, this lover of yours was not the sort of man we all take him to be, and that he was to turn out false or inconstant. Suppose now it turned out he had another wife somewhere else. Oh, that's nonsense, you know, Father John. Yes, but just supposing it, or that he took some vagary into his head and changed his mind. You must have heard of men doing such things. And why shouldn't your lover, as well as another girl's? We're all likely to be deceived in people, and why mayn't we be as well deceived in Captain Usher as others have been in those they loved as well? We'll all hope and think and believe it's not so, but isn't it as well to be on the safe side, particularly in so important a thing as your happiness, Feemy? You wouldn't like it to be said through the country that you've been jilted by the handsome captain, and that you've been thrown off by your lover as soon as he was tired of you. And that's true for you, Father John, but Miles isn't tired of me, else why would he be coming up here to see me oftener than ever? But it's that he never may be tired of you, Feemy. Take my word for it, he'll respect you a great deal more, if you'll show more respect to yourself. Well, Father John, and what is it you'd have me be doing? Why, then, I just ask him to speak a word to Thady, just to propose himself in the regular way. But Thady hates him so. No, Thady don't hate him. He's only jealous lest Captain Usher isn't treating you quite as he ought to do. But Thady is so queer in his manners, and I know Miles wouldn't like to be asking leave and permission to be courting me. But Feemy, he must like it, and you shouldn't like your lover the more for thinking so little of your brother, or for the matter of fact, of yourself either. You know, Father John, I can't help what he thinks of Thady. As to his thinking of me, I'm quite satisfied with that, and I suppose that's enough. Father John was beginning to wax wroth, partly because he was displeased with Feemy himself, and partly because Feemy answered him too knowingly. Well then, Feemy, it'll be one of the two. Either Captain Usher will have to speak to Thady and settle something about the marriage in a proper and decent way, or else Thady will be speaking to him. And now, which do you think will be the best? It's not like you, Father John, to be making Thady quarrel with Captain Usher. You know it had come to a quarrel if Thady was speaking to Miles that way, and he would never think of doing so if you didn't be putting him up to it. And that's little like you, Feemy, to be saying that to your priest, telling me I put the young men up to be quarrelling. It's to save you many a heartache and many a sting of sorrow and remorse. It's to prevent all the evil of unlawful love, bad blood and false looks, that I've come here on a most disagreeable and thankless errand, and now you tell me I'd be putting the young men up to fight. Feemy had by this time become sullen, but she didn't dare go farther with her priest. I didn't say you'd be making them fight, Father John. I only said if you told Thady not to be meddling with Miles, why, in course, they wouldn't be quarrelling. And how could I tell a brother not to meddle with his sister's honour and reputation and happiness? But now, Feemy, I'll propose another plan to you. If you don't think my advice on such a subject likely to be good, and very likely it isn't, for you see I never had a lover of my own, what do you say to your speaking to your friend, Mrs. McEwen, about it? Or, if you like, I'll speak to her, and then perhaps you won't be against taking her advice on the subject. Supposing now she was to speak to Captain Usher, from herself, you know, as your friend, do you think he'd love the girl that's to be his wife worse for having a friend that is willing to stand in the place of a mother to her, when she'd none of her own? Why, I do think it would look odd, Mrs. McEwen meddling with it. Well then, Feemy, what in the blessed name do you mean to do if you won't let any of your friends act for you? 
I think you must be very much afraid of this lover of yours when you won't allow anyone speak to him about you. Are you afraid of him, Feemy? Afraid of him? No, of course I'm not afraid of him. But men don't like to be bothered about such things. That's very true. Men, when they're false, and try to deceive young girls, and are playing their own wicked game with them, do not like to be bothered about such things. But I never heard of an honest man who really wanted to marry a young woman, being bothered by getting her friend's consent. And you think, then, things should go on just as they are. Now, Father John, only you've been scolding me so much, I'd have told you before. I mean to speak to Miles myself tonight, just to arrange things, and then I won't have Mrs. McEwen cocking over me that she's made up the match. There's little danger of that kind, I fear, Feemy, nor would she be doing so, but if you are actually going to speak to Captain Usher yourself tonight, I'll say no more about it now, but I hope you tell Thady tomorrow what passes. Oh, Father John, I won't promise that. Will you tell me, then, or Mrs. McEwen? Or perhaps I'll be telling you, you know, when I come down to confession at Christmas, but indeed I shan't be telling Mrs. McEwen anything about it, to go talking over the country. Then, Feemy, I may as well tell you at once, if you will not trust to me, to your brother, or any friend who may be able to protect you from insult, nor prevail on your lover to come forward in a decent and respectable way, and avow his purpose, it will become your brother's duty to tell him that his visits can no longer be allowed at Ballycloran. Ballycloran doesn't belong to Thady's, and he can't tell him not to come. That's not well said of you, Feemy, for you know your father is not capable of interfering in this business. But if, as under those circumstances, he will do, Thady quietly and firmly desires Captain Usher to stay away from Ballycloran, I think he'll not venture to come here. If he does, there are those who will still interfere to prevent him. And if among you all that are so set up against him because he's not one of your own set, you drive him out of Ballycloran, I can tell you I'll not remain in it. Then your sins and your sorrows must be on your own head. And without saying anything further, Father John took his hat and walked off. Feemy snatched her novel into her lap to show how little what was said impressed her and resumed her attitude over the fire. But she didn't read. Her spirit was stubborn and wouldn't bend, but her reason and her conscience were touched by what the priest had said to her, and the bitter thought for the first time came over her that her lover, perhaps, was not so true to her as she to him. There she sat, sorrowfully musing, and though she did not repent of what she thought her own firmness, she was bitterly tormented by the doubts with which her brother mary brady and the priest had gradually disturbed her happiness she loved usher as well as ever yes almost more than ever as the idea that she might perhaps lose him came across her but she began to be discontented with herself and to think that she had not played her part as well as she might in fact she felt herself to be miserable and for the first time hated her brother and father john for having made her so Father John walked sorrowfully back to his cottage, thinking Miss Feemy McDermott the most stiff-necked young lady it had ever been his hard lot to meet. End of section 10section 11 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arlene Stebbins. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 11. Mohill. We must now request our reader to accompany us to the little town of Mohill. Not that there is anything attractive in the place to repay him for the trouble of going there. Mohill is a small country town, standing on no high road, nor on any thoroughfare from the metropolis, and therefore it owes to itself whatever importance it may possess, and in truth that is not much. It is, or at any rate was, at the time of which we are writing, the picture of an impoverished town, the property of a non-resident landlord, 
destitute of anything to give it interest or prosperity, without business, without trade, and without society. The idea that would strike one on entering it was chiefly this. Why was it a town at all? Why were there, on that spot, so many houses congregated, called Mohill? What was the inducement to people to come and live there? Why didn't they go to Longford, to Cavan, to Carrick, to Dublin, anywhere rather than there, when they were going to settle themselves? This is a question which proposes itself at the sight of many Irish towns. They look so poor, so destitute of advantage, so unfriended. Mohill is by no means the only town in the west of Ireland that strikes one as being there without a cause. It is built on the side of a steep hill, and one part of the town seems constantly threatening the destruction of the other. Every now and again, down each side of the hill, there is a slated house, but they are few and far between, and the long spaces intervening are filled with the most miserable descriptions of cabins, hovels without chimneys, windows, door, or signs of humanity, except the children playing on the collected filth in front of them. The very scraws of which the roofs are composed are germinating afresh, and, sickly green with a new growth, look more like the tops of long-neglected dung-heaps than the only protection over Christian beings from the winds of heaven. Look at that mud-hovel on the left, which seems as if it had thrust itself between its neighbours. So narrow is its front. The doorway, all insufficient as it is, takes nearly the whole facing to the street. The roof, looking as if it were only the dirty eaves hanging from its more aspiring neighbour on the right, supports itself against the cabin on the left, about three feet above the ground. Can that be the habitation of any of the human race? Few but such as those whose lot has fallen on such barren places would venture in. But for a moment let us see what is there. But the dark misery within hides itself in thick obscurity. The unaccustomed eye is at first unable to distinguish any object, and only feels the painful effect of the confined smoke. But when, at length, a faint struggling light makes its way through the entrance, how wretched is all around! A sickly woman, the entangled nature of whose insufficient garments would defy description, is sitting on a low stool before the fire, suckling a miserably dirty infant, a boy whose only covering is a tattered shirt, is putting fresh, but alas, damp, turf beneath the pot, in which are put to boil the potatoes, their only food. Two or three dim children, their number is lost in their obscurity, are cowering around the dull dark fire, atop of one another, and on a miserable pallet beyond, a few rotten boards propped upon equally infirm supports, and covered over with only one thin black quilt, is sitting the master of the mansion his grisly, unshorn beard, his lantern jaws and shaggy hair are such as his home and family would lead one to expect. And now you have counted all that this man possesses. Other furniture he has none, neither table nor chair, except that low stool on which his wife is sitting, squatting on the ground, from off the ground like pigs, only much more poorly fed. His children eat the scanty earnings of his continual labor. And yet for this abode, the man pays rent. The miserable appearance of Irish peasants, when in the very lowest poverty, strikes one more forcibly in the towns than in the open country. The dirt and filth around them seem so much more oppressive on them. They have no escape from it. There is much also in ideas and associations. On a roadside or on the borders of a bog, the dusty color of the cabin walls, the potato patch around it, the green scraws or damp brown straw which form its roof, all of the opportunances, in fact, of the cabin seem suited to the things around it. But in a town this is not so. It evidently should not be there. Its squalidness and filth are all that strike you. Poverty, to be picturesque, should be rural. Suburban misery is as hideous as it is pitiable. Again, see that big house, with such pretensions to comfort, and even elegance, with its neat slated roof, brass-knocker on the door, verandas to the large sashed windows, and iron railing before the front. 
Its very grandeur is much more striking, that from each gable end hangs another cabin, the same as those we have above described. It is true that an entrance for horses, cars, and carriages has been constructed, as it were through one end of the house itself, otherwise the mansion is but one house in the continuous street. Here lives Mr. Cassidy, the agent, a fat, good-natured, easy man with an active, grown-up son. Everyone says that Mr. Cassidy is a good man, as good to the poor as he can be. But he is not the landlord, he is only the agent. What can he do more than he does? Is the landlord, then, so hard a man? So regardless of those who depend on him in all their wants and miseries? No, indeed, Lord Birmingham is also a kind good man, a most charitable man. Look at his name on all the lists of gifts for unfortunates of every description. Is he not the presiding genius of the company for relieving the Poles? A vice-providing genius for relieving the destitute authors, destitute actors, destitute clergymen's widows, destitute half-pay officers' widows? Is he not patron of the Mendicity Society, patron of the Lying-In, Smallpox, Lock, and Fever Hospitals? Is his name not down for large amounts in aid of funds of every description for lessening human wants and pangs? How conspicuous and eager a part, too, he took in giving the poor blacks their liberty! Was not his aid strongly and gratefully felt by the friends of Catholic emancipation? In short, is not every one aware that Lord Birmingham has spent a long and brilliant life in acts of public and private philanthropy? Tis true he lives in England, and rarely in his life in Ireland, never in Mohill. Could he be blamed for this? Could he live in two countries at once? Or would the world have been benefited had he left the Parliament and the Cabinet to whitewash Irish cabins, and assist in the distribution of meal? This would be his own excuse, and does not it seem a valid one? Yet shall no one be blamed for the misery which belonged to him? For the squalid sources of the wealth, with which Poles were fed, and literary paupers clothed? Was no one answerable for the grim despair of that half-starved wretch, whom but now we saw, looking down so sadly on the young sufferers to whom he had given life and poverty? That can hardly be. And if we feel the difficulty which, among his numerous philanthropic works, Lord Birmingham must experience in attending to the state of his numerous dependents, it only makes us reflect more often that from him to whom much is given, much indeed will be required. But we're getting far from our story. Going a little further down the hill there is a lane to the right. This always was a dirty, ill-conditioned lane, of bad repute and habits. Father Matthew and the rigours of the police have of late somewhat mended its manners and morals. Here, too, one now sees, but a short way from the main street, the grand new stirring poorhouse, which ten years ago was not in being. In this lane, at the time to which we allude, the widow Mulrady kept the Shabine shop, of which mention has before been made. In her business Mrs. Mulrady acquired much more profit than respectability, for, whether well or ill-deserved, she had but a bad name in the country. In spite of this, however, to the company assembled here on Wednesday evening, the same evening that Thady dined with Father John, we must introduce our readers. The house, or rather cabin, consisted of only two rooms, both on the ground, and both without floor or ceiling, the black rafters on which the thatch was lying above, and the uneven soil below. Still, this place of entertainment was not like the cabins of the very poor. The rooms were both long, and as they ran lengthwise down the street, each was the full breadth of the house. In the first sat the widow Mulrady, a strong, red-faced, indomitable-looking woman about fifty. She sat on a large wooden seat with a back, capable of containing two persons. There was an immense blazing fire of turf on which water was boiling in a great potato-pot, should any of her guests be able to treat themselves to the expensive luxury of punch. A remarkably dirty small deal table was beside her, on which were placed a large jar, containing a quantity of the only merchandise in which she dealt, and an old battered pewter measure, in which she gave it out. In a corner of the table away from the fire was cut a hole through the board, 
in which was stuck a small flickering candle. No further implements appeared necessary to Mrs. Mulrady in the business which she conducted. A barefooted girl with unwashed hands and face, and unbrushed head, crouched in the corner of the fire, ready to obey the behests of Mrs. Mulrady, and attend to the numerous calls of her customers. This Hebe rejoiced in the musical name of Kathleen. The Mohill resort of the wicked, the desperate, and the drunken was not certainly so grand, nor so conspicuous, as the gas-lighted, mahogany-fitted, pilistered gin palaces of London. But the freedom from decent restraint, and the power of inebriety at a cheap rate, were the same in each. There was a door at the further end of the room which opened into the one where Mrs. Mulrady's more known and regular visitors were accustomed to sit and drink. And here rumour said that a Ribon Lodge was held. There was a fire also here, at the further end, and a long narrow table ran nearly the whole length of the room under the two windows, with a form on each side of it. Opposite this was Mrs. Mulrady's own bed, which proved that whatever improprieties might be perpetrated in the house, the careful widow herself never retired to rest till they were all over. The assembly on the night in question was not very numerous. There might be about twelve in it, and they were all of the poorer kind. Some even had neither shoes nor stockings, and there was one poor fellow had neither hat nor coat, nothing but a tattered shirt and trousers. The most decent among them all was Pat Brady, who occupied a comfortable seat near the fire, drinking his tumbler of punch and smoking like a gentleman. Joe Reynolds was sitting on the widow's bed with a spade in his hand. He had only just come in. They were all from Drumleesh, with one or two exceptions. The man without his coat was Jack Byrne, the brother of the man whom Captain Usher had taken when the malt was found in his brother's house. "'Kathleen Agra,' hallooed Joe Reynolds. "'Bring me a glass of spirits, will you?' "'Send out the rint, Joe,' hallooed out the wary widow, and Kathleen came in for the money. "'Sorrow to your soul, then, Mother Mulrady. Do you think I'm so bad already, then, that they haven't left me a price of the glass?' and he put three halfpence into the girl's hand. "'Oh, Joe,' said Brady, "'don't be taking your spirits that way. Come over here like a decent fellow, and we'll be talking over this.' "'Oh, that's all right for you, Pat. You've nothing to be driving your life out of your very heart. I am cold within me, and a divil a word I'll speak, till I drive it out of me with the spirits.' And he poured the glass of whisky down his throat as though he was pouring it into a pitcher. "'And now, my boys, you'll see Joe Reynolds'll talk may be as well as any of you. Give us a draw of the pipe, Pat.' He took the pipe from Pat's hand and stuck it in his mouth. "'Well, Jack, I seed your brother in Carrick, and I told him how you'd done all you could for him, and pawned the claws off your back to scrape the few shillings together for him. And what do you think he'd have me do, then?' Why, he told me to take the money to Hyacinth Geegan Esquire, just to stand to him and get him off. Why, he couldn't do it, not av he was to give his soul. And that's not his own to give, for the divil has it. And av he could, he wouldn't walk across to Carrick to do them a good turn. Though, by Jesus, he'd be quick enough pocketing the brads. Be gad, Jack, it's cold you're looking without the freeze. Come and warm your shins, my boy, and take a draw out of Pat's pipe. And Joe, said Pat, what magistrates were there in it? Why, there were Sir Michael, and Councillor Webb, and there were that black ruffian Jonas Brown. And they just sent him back to Gale again, Joe. No, they didn't. Councillor Webb stuck to the boys hard and fast while he could, both his own boys and the poor Tim, that he may never sup sorrow, for he proved himself this day the real friend of the poor man. But it wore all no good in the end. Divil a good, that thief of the world, old Brown, after axing Usher a sight of questions, was strong for sending him back. And then Councillor Webb axed Usher how he could prove that the boys knew the stuff was in it, 
and e the black-arted viper said that warn't necessary so long as they were in the same house and then they drawed it out ever so long and usher said how the old country though war worse than ever with the stills and councillor webb said that war the fault of the landlords and brown said he hoped they'd take every mother's son of him as he could lay hands on in the country and bring him there and so they drawed it out a long while and then sir michael who'd never said a word at all good or bad or indifferent said as how paddy byrne and smith were to pay each twenty pounds and tim ten or else go to gaol as long as the bloody old barrister chose to keep em there jack said one of the others did paddy do you remember happen to have an odd twenty pound in his breeches pocket because if so he might just put it down genteel and walk out afore them all well then corney answered jack with pat brady's pipe in his mouth if paddy had sich a trifle about then i disremember it entirely but sure why wouldn't he he'd hardly be so far as carrick in sich good company too without a little change in his pocket but to go and put twenty pound on them boys observed the more earnest joe the like of them to be gettin twenty pounds mightn't he as well have said twenty thousand and tin pounds on tim too more power to you jonas brown tin pounds for a poor boy's worm in his shins and gaggin over an old hag's bit of turf but joe said brady is it in carrick they're to stop not at all they're to go over to the bridewell in balinamore captain greenock was there a lot of his men is to take them to balinamore to-morrow unless indeed they all has the trifle of change in their pockets corney was axing about and supposing now joe said jack the boys paid the money or some of the gentlemen put it down for him who'd be getting it sorrow of a one me rightly knows who'd be getting the brad's pat av they were paid who'd be getting them why who would have em but master usher do you think he'd be so keen after the stills if he were not to make something by it where do you think he'd be making out the hunters and livin there better nor the gentlemen themselves if he didn't be getting the fines and rewards and things for sizing the whisky choke him for fines said jack that the gay horse he rides may break the wicked neck of him sorrow is a good in there in cursing boys continued joe av there war any of you really have the art to be doin anything what did we be doin joe kickin our toes again carrick gale till the police comed and spiked us the boys is now in gale and they're like to be for anything we'll do to get them out again joe reynolds was now puzzled a little so he fumbled in his pockets and bringing out another three halfpence hallooed to kathleen kathleen d'ye hear ye young divil's imp bring me another half noggin of spirits and he gave her the halfpence and here bring a glass for jack too send out the rint joe my darlin again bawled the widow proving that very little said in the inner room was lost upon her oh sink you your rint old hag but he paid for the glass for his friend and may i bid if they ain't the very last coppers i've got long life to you joe said the other as he swallowed the raw whisky me i'll be able to stand to you the same way some of these days bad as things is yet you is all to be up at ballyclora and after to-morrow with the rain say brady what'll you be saying to the young master joe joe was now somewhat elated by the second glass of whisky what'll i be saying to him is it well i'll tell you what i'll be saying i'll just say this i owes two years rent mr macdermot for the trifle of bog in the cabin i holds up at drumlish and there's what i got to pay it and i'll show him what he may put in his eye and see none the worse and i'll go on and i'll say 
Now, Mr. McDormand, there is a bit of oats up there, as I and poor Tim broke the back of us dry in the land for last winter, and there is the bit of pratties, and I didn't yet be cutting of the one nor digging of the other, and if you like she may go and do both, and take them with her for me, and you may take the roof off the bit of cabin I built myself over the old mother, and you may turn out the old hag to die in the cold and the bog, and you may send me off to get myself into the first gale as it is open to me. That's what you can do, Mr. McDermott, and when you've done all that, there'll be one as would have stood betwixt you and all harm, and then go as far enough to give you back your own in the hardships that you've drove him to. And then I'll go on and I'll say, and you can do this, and you can tell me to go and be that, as you did many a day, and give me what bad language you like, and you can send back to me next day or so, just to tell me to sell the oats, and bring in what trifle I can, and then, Mr. Thaddy, there'll be one who'll not let a foot nor finger of that hellhound gig and go on Ballycloran. There'll be one. And when there's me, my boys, there'll be lots more, as I'll keep you safe and snug in your own father's house, though all the Keegans and Flanleys and County Lightrim come to turn you out. And that's what I'll say to the master. And now, Pat, for he tells you pretty much all, what'll the master be saying to that? What'll he be saying to it, Joe? Fix, then, I don't know what he'll be saying to it. His little mind, I think, he'll have to be saying much comfort to any of you, for he'll be vexing out with everything, just at present. He doesn't like the way that Captain Usher is shaming with his sister. Like it? I wonder he have did a black-hearted Protestant like him. What business is it of a McDermott would have taking up with the likes of him? That's not neither, Joe. But he thinks the Captain don't mean fair by Miss Feemy. And by the blessed Virgin he ain't far wrong. Then why don't he knock the life out of the traitor? Or have there is reasons why he shouldn't do it hisself, why he don't get one of the boys as be glad of the job to help him? Look here, Pat. And Reynolds went over to the fireplace, and with his arm against the back wall, and leaning down over the seat where Brady was sitting, began whispering earnestly in his ear. And then Brady muttered something dissenting in a low voice. And Reynolds went on whispering again, with gesticulations and many signs. This continued for a long time, till Corney exclaimed, "'What the devil, boys, are you colloquing about there? Aren't we all sworn friends, and what need you be whispering about? Why can't you speak what you've got to say out like a man instead of ogery muggering there in the corner with Brady, as though any one ear wasn't through to ye all?' "'Wist, Corney, you born idiot! Ye don't know, I suppose, what long ears the old hag there has, and ye'd be wantin' or to ang two or three of us, I suppose. Divil a ang, Joe, I've no one told of any but her we'd be safe enough that way. But what is it you're saying? But instead of answering him, Reynolds continued urging something to Pat Brady. At last he exclaimed, Dear and ages, why wouldn't he side with the boys as lives on his own land? If he don't make friends of them, where will he find friends? Is it among the great gentlemen of the country? By dad, they don't no more think of him nor they do of us. And is it the likes of Captain Usher as'll be good friends to him? He's thinking of his own schemes, and taking the honest name from his sister. Is that his friend, Pat? Didn't I tell you, Joe? He hates Usher a sight worse nor you nor I. There's little need to say anything to him about that. Why wouldn't he join us, then? Who else is there to help him at all? Won't he be as bad as we are if Lanley drives him and the old man out of Ballycloran? But if he'll stick to us, divil a lawyer of him shall put a keeper on the lands. And I said before, and I say it again, and av I prove a lawyer, may I never see the blessed glory. Av young McDermott'll help the boys to write themselves, 
the first foot Keegan puts on Ballyclorran, he shall leave there by g But, Joe, suppose now Mr. Daddy agreed to join you here. What'll you have him be doing at all? Oh, I'd have him lend a hand to punish the mothering ruffian as have got half the country drove into gales, and is playing his tricks now with his own sister. But what could any of you do? You wouldn't dare knock the chap on the head. Who wouldn't dare? By that tarnal I'd dare it myself. Isn't there two of us here, whose brothers is now in gale along of him? Wouldn't you dare, Jack, if he was up there again in the country, to teach him how to be seizing your people? Boy, Dad, I'd do anything, Joe, but I don't know justice to murdering. I'd do as bad to him as he did to Paddy. Have they hung him, I'd murder him, and we'll come. But Paddy'll be out of that some of these days. And I think, therefore, Joe, if we striped his ears, it'd do this go. Jack Burns' equal justice pleased the majority of his hearers, but it did not satisfy Joe. As for Pat, he continued smoking and said nothing. "'Oh, my boys, that's nonsense,' said Joe. "'Either do the job or let it alone. "'Have you a mind to let Captain Usher walk into your cabins "'and take any of you off to Carrick, just as he pleases? "'Why, you can, but I am d- if I does. Oh, "'I've had enough of him now, and by the tarnal powers, "'though I swing for it, putting Tim in gales shall cost him his life.' "'Joe was very much excited and half tipsy, "'but he only said what most of them were waiting to hear said, "'and what each of them expected. "'Not one voice was raised in dissent. Pat said nothing, but smoked and gazed on the fire. "'Master Thaddy'll been at the wedding to-morrow, Pat. "'Oh, in course he will. "'Will you be axing him, then? "'Axing him what? "'Is it to murder Usher? "'No, in course not that. "'But will you be trying him? "'Will he join with us to rid the country of him?' Oh, "'I tell ye, Joe, he's willing enough to be shut of him entirely, "'if he knew how.' "'Oh, yes, Pat, I dare say he'd be willing any poor boy'd knock him on the head, and so be rid of him. And of that he who did do it, did be hung for it, what matter in life to him? That may do very well for Master Thaddy, but by the powers it'll not do for me. "'Well, you can be spaken to him yourself to-morrow. "'Yes, but you must be getting him just to come out and speak to us.' "'Just draw him out a bit, you know.' "'Well, then, boys, I've said as much to the master already, "'and he expects to meet you up there.' "'That's the sort, Pat, "'and I will but join us divil a fear at all for Captain Usher. "'Come, my boys, we'll drink the gentleman's health, "'as would be only decent and proper of us, "'seeing the great trouble he's at with us.' "'But where you get the whisky, Joe?' said Corney. I don't think Mother Mulready be too quick giving you thrust. That's true, anyway. Which of he's got the rint among yer? Come, Pat, pour out for once. Isn't it for all of ye? I'll stand a glass for myself and one for Joe. Well, Jack, said Corney, you and I'll have a drop together. You shan't say I let you go away dry. The rest made it up among them, and Kathleen, having duly received the price in advance, brought in a glass of spirits for each. The widow Mulready had only two glasses, and they therefore had to drink one after the other. Joe took his first, saying, "'And there's more power and success to you, Captain Usher, and it's a foine gentleman is the only name for ye, but af you're above the sod this day three months, may none of us that is in it this night ever see the blessed glory.' And they all drank the toast which their leader gave them. They now prepared to leave, but not so quickly that Mrs. Mulrady had to give them very forcible hints that she wanted quiet possession of her bedroom. And much animated conversation passed on the occasion. "'And now ain't you a pretty set of boys, the whole of ye blackguards that ye are, that ye can't drink your spirits quietly in a lone woman's house, but you must bring in the town on her, by your d- ructions, and have I never saw the foot of any of ye again, it's little I'd be grieving for ye. Quit that, you old hag of the devil, or I'll give you more to talk about than'll plague you. 
is it you joe by the more too then if you don't quit that you'll soon be having a stone roof over your head by the blessed virgin i'll be hanging of you if you don't be keeping yourself to yourself is it hanging you're talking of and where you be yourself not but hanging's twice too good for you come corney is you coming up to loch sheen after a few more exchanges of similar civilities between the landlady and her guests the latter at length took their departure and the widow having duly put away the apparatus of her trade that is having drank what whisky there remained in the jug betook herself to her couch in her usual state of intoxication joe reynolds and pat brady each had about three miles to go home and the greater part of the way they walked together talking over their plans and discussing the probability of their success the two men were very different the former was impoverished desperate all but houseless he had been continually at war with the world and the world with him whether he had been more fortunate he might have been an honest man is a question difficult to solve most certainly he had been a hard-working man but his work had never come to good he had long been a maker of poteen and from the different rows in which he had been connected had got a bad name through the country the effect of all this was that he was now desperate ready not only to take part against any form of restrictive authority but anxious to be a leader in doing so he had somehow conceived the idea that it would be a grand thing to make a figure through the country and as he would have said himself avi were hanged what arum pat brady was a very different character in a very poor country he enjoyed comparative comfort he had never been rendered desperate by want and oppression poor as was the ballycloran property he had always by his driving and ejecting and by one or another of rural law which is always sure to be paid for managed to live decently and certainly above want it was difficult to conceive why he should have been leagued with so desperate a set of men sworn together to murder a government officer yet in the conversation they had going home he was by far the most eager of the two he spoke of the certainty they had of getting young macdermot to join them the next evening told reynolds how he would get him if possible to drink and when excited would bring him out to talk to the boys in short planned and arranged all those things about which reynolds had been so anxious but as to which he could get so little done at the widow's when there pat had been almost silent at any rate he had himself proposed nothing it had never occurred to the other poor fellow that brady was making a tool of him that though the rent collector was now so eager in proving how easily young macdermot might be induced to join their party he would commit himself to nothing when they were congregated at the widow mulrady's had reynolds not been so completely duped he would have seen that brady made him take the part of leader when others were present who might possibly be called upon as witnesses but that when they were alone together he brady was always the most eager to press the necessity of some desperate measure on the present occasion reynolds was half drunk whereas brady was quite sober so said the latter on their way home them boys is fixed in gale for the next twelve months anyway tim warn't thinkin he'd get lodgings for nothin so long when he went up to widow smith's there at loch sheen well pat a year is a dreary long time for a boy to be locked up all for nothing and poor tim won't bear up as well as most might but he that put them there will soon be sent where he'll be treated even worser than tim at ballinamore and he won't get out of that soon by g i'd sooner be in tim's shoes this night than in captain usher's fine gentleman he thinks hisself but joe will them boys from loch sheen let tim and the others be taken quietly to ballinamore won't they try a risky on the road there aren't them spirit left in em pat and how should it what is the like of them with their shillelahs and maybe a few stones again them pilers in the daylight if it had been night we might have tried a resky but the spirit ain't in em at all i axed em to go snacks with me and doin the job but they was afeard and no wonder well you'll be up at mary's wedding to-morrow and see what the young master'll be saying and so the two friends parted to their different homes. End of section eleven. Mo Hill.
Section 12 of the McDermott of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 12. Mr. Keegan, Part 1. It will be remembered that the priest left Feemy after his stormy interview in a somewhat irritable mood. She was still chewing the cud of the bitter thoughts to which the events of the last few hours had given rise, and was trying to make herself believe that her brother and Father John and Pat Brady and all the rest of them were wrong in their detestable surmises, and that her own Miles was true to her, when another stranger called at Ballycloran, and a perfect stranger he must have been, for he absolutely raised the lion-headed rusty knocker, and knocked at the door, a ceremony to which the customary visitors of the house never dreamed of having recourse. So unusual was this proceeding that it frightened the sole remaining domestic, Caddy, out of all her decorum. It will be remembered that Mary Brady had absconded with Biddy. Poor Caddy did not well know how to act under the trying emergencies of the case. She could not get to the door of Miss Feemy's parlour, as a strange gentleman was standing in the hall, so she ran round the house, and ascertaining that the intruder was well in the hall and could not see her, she clambered up to her mistress's window and exclaimed, Hist! Miss Feemy, there's a stranger gentleman a rappin' at the big knocker, and I think it's the fat lawyer from Carrick. What'll I do then, miss? Why, you fool, whispered Feemy through one of the broken panes of glass, go and ask him who he wants, and tell him Thady ain't at home. So Caddy dropped from the window sill again, and went to receive the gentleman into the house by following him in at the hall door. By the time, however, that she had entered herself, old Larry McDermott had been roused out of his lethargy by a third knocking of the stranger, and on opening his own parlour door was startled to see Mr. Hyacinth Keegan, the attorney from Carrick on Shannon, standing before him. Mr. Hyacinth Keegan requires some little introduction, as he is one of the principal personages of my tale. As Father Cullen before remarked, his father was a process server living at a small town called Drumshambo. That is, he obtained his bread by performing the legal acts to which Irish landlords are so often obliged to have resort in obtaining their rent from their tenants. This process server was a poor man, and a Roman Catholic, but he had managed to give his son a decent education. He had gotten him a place as an errand boy in an attorney's office, from whence he had risen to the dignity of clerk, and he was now not only an attorney himself, but a flourishing one, and a Protestant to boot. His great step in the world had been his marriage with Sally Flannelly, that Sally whom McDermott had rejected, for from the time of his wedding he had much prospered in all worldly things. He was a hard-working man, and in that consisted his only good quality. He was plausible, a good flatterer, not deficient in that sort of sharpness which made him a successful attorney in a small provincial town, and he could be a jovial companion when called on to take that part. Principal had never stood much in his way, and he had completely taught himself to believe that what was legal was right, and he knew how to stretch legalities to the utmost. As a convert, Mr. Keegan was very enthusiastically attached to the Protestant religion and the Tory party, for which he had fought tooth and nail at the last county election. Mr. Keegan boasted a useful kind of courage. He cared but little for the ill name he had acquired by his practice in the country among the poorer classes, and to do him justice had shown pluck enough in the dangerous duties which he sometimes had to perform, for he acted as agent to the small properties of some absentee landlords, and for a man of his character such duties in County Leitrim were not at that time without risk. He had been shot at, had once been knocked off his horse, and had received various threatening letters, but it always turned out that he discovered the aggressor, and prosecuted, and convicted him. One man he had transported for life, in the last case the man who had shot at him was hung, and consequently the people began to be afraid of Mr. Keegan. Our friend was fond of popularity, and was consequently a bit of a sportsman, as most Connet attorneys are. He had the shooting of two or three bogs, kept a good horse or two, went to all the country races, and made a small book on the events of the Curra. These accomplishments all had their effect, and as I said before, Mr. Keegan was successful. In appearance he was a large, burly man, gradually growing corpulent, with a soft, oily face, on which there was generally a smile. And well for him that there was, for though his smile was not prepossessing, and carried the genuine stamp of deceit, it concealed the malice, treachery, and selfishness which his face so plainly bore without it. His eyes were light, large, and bright, but it was that kind of brightness which belongs to an opaque and not to a transparent body. They never sparkled. 
his mouth was very large and his lip heavy and he carried a huge pair of brick-colored whiskers his dress was somewhat dandified but it usually had not a few of the characteristics of a horse jockey in age he was about forty-five his wife was some years his senior he had married her when she was rather falling into the yellow leaf and though mr hyacinth keegan was always on perfectly good and confidential terms with his respected father-in-law report in carrick on shannon declared that great battles took place beside the attorney's fireside as to who was to have dominion in the house the lady's temper also might be a little roused by the ill-natured reports which reached her ears that her handsome hyacinth lavished more of his attentions and gallantry abroad than at home such was the visitor who now came to call at ballycloran mr mcdermott was very much surprised for mr keegan's business with ballycloran was never done by personal visits if money was received thady used to call and pay it at keegan's office if other steps were to be taken he employed one of those messengers so frequently unwelcome at the houses of the connaught gentry and this usually ended in thady calling at mr keegan's for a fresh bill for his father to sign old mcdermott was therefore so surprised that he knew not how to address his visitor this together with his hatred of the man and his customary inability to do or say anything made him so perplexed that he could not comprehend mr keegan's first words which were not only conciliatory and civil but almost affectionate ah mr mcdermott how do you do how do you do i'm glad to see you very glad to see you looking so well too why what a time it is since i last had the pleasure but then i'm so tied by the leg so much business mr mcdermott indeed though i was determined to drop in this morning as a friend still even now i've just a word to say on business you see i must join business and pleasure so if you are not very much engaged and could spare a minute or two why i have a little proposal to make you acting for mr flannelly you know which i think you'd not be sorry to hear the attorney had been obliged to begin his story thus far in the hall as the old man had shown no inclination to ask him into the parlor nor did larry even now move from the door and indeed he did not look as though he was a fit subject to enter on business with an attorney he had not shaved or rather been shaved since sunday last his eyes though wide open looked as if they had very lately been asleep and were not quite awake his clothes were huddled on him and hung about him almost in tatters the slaver was running down from his half-open mouth and his breath smelt very strongly of whiskey keegan finding that his host did not seem bent on hospitality was edging himself into the room when feemy who had heard his address to her father came out to the old man's relief and told the visitor that he was not just himself that morning that thady was out but that she would desire him to call at mr keegan's office the next day ah miss feemy how's your pretty self this morning and is it the fact that we hear down at carrick that we're to have a wedding soon at ballycloran ah well of course you wouldn't be after telling me but i was very glad to hear it that i was miss feemy but mr mcdermott it was your father miss feemy i was wishing to see this morning not mr thady if you could allow me ten minutes or so just a message from our old friend flannelly and by this time keegan had wedged his way into the room out of which any one who knew him would be very sure he would not stir until he had said what he had come to say larry hobbling back after him sat himself down in his accustomed chair and feemy as if to protect her father in her brother's absence followed him it's very hard then mr keegan that you should come up here as if sending your processes and latitats and distraining weren't enough but now you must ah my dear sir it's not about such disagreeable business at all we're done with all that it's not about such business at all when i've disagreeable jobs to do of course we must have disagreeable jobs sometimes why i always send some of my disagreeable fellows to do it but when i've good news why i like to bring it myself and that's why i rode down this morning larry stupid as he was couldn't be talked round by the attorney so easily if it's good news you have why shouldn't thady hear it then i am sure poor fellow he hears enough bad news from you one way or another and i tell you i can't understand business to-day and flannelly's bill doesn't come round till next month i know that and so if you plays that he can hear what you have to say at carrick on saturday or monday or any day you plays feemy my darling get something for mr keegan to eat i'll be glad to see you eat a bit but i can't talk any more and the old man turned himself away and began groaning over the fire you see mr keegan my father can't go to business this morning when shall i tell thady to call down but wouldn't you take a glass of wine feemy was going to say but she knew she had none to offer 
not a taste in life of anything thank you miss feemy not a drop i'm very much obliged to you but i'm sorry to find your good father so bent on not hearing me as i have something to propose which he couldn't but be glad to hear well father will you listen to what mr keegan has to say don't i tell you feemy that the bill doesn't come round before november and it's very hard he won't lave me in pace till that time comes you see continued feemy that he won't hear anything don't you think you'd better wait and see thady down at carrick now this was what mr keegan did not want in fact his wish was to talk over larry mcdermott to agree to something to which he feared thady would object but he had had no idea the old man would be so obstinate he however was at a loss how to proceed when feemy declared that thady was seen approaching well then miss feemy as your brother is here and as your father isn't just himself this morning i might as well do my business with him but as it is of some importance and as mr flannelly wishes to have your father's answer as soon as possible he will not object i hope to giving his opinion when he shall have heard what i have to say by this time thady was before the door and on feemy's calling to him informing him that mr keegan was in the house waiting to speak to him he came up into the parlour how do you do this morning said the lawyer shaking thady by the hand how do you do i've just ridden up here to bring a message to your father from mr flannelly about this mortgage he holds but your father doesn't seem quite the thing this morning and therefore it's as well you came in of course what i have to say concerns you as well as him of course mr keegan i look after the affairs at ballycloran mostly now don't you know it's me you look to for the money and i'm sorry you should have to bother my father about it just step out of the room feemy and the young lady retreated to her own possessions why now mr thady how you all put your backs up because an unfortunate attorney comes to call on you what i'm come to say is what i hope and think you'll both be glad to hear and i trust you've too much good sense to put your father against it merely because it comes from me you may be sure i shall not put my father against anything which would be good for him or feemy well mr thady so far so good and i'm sure you wouldn't besides what i've got to say is greatly to your own advantage well mr keegan out with it why you see mr mcdermott and the attorney turned to the father who sat poring over the fire as if he was determined not to hear a word that passed you see mr mcdermott mr flannelly is thinking how much better it would be to settle the affair of this mortgage out mr flannelly is thinking how much better it would be to settle the affair of this mortgage out and out he's getting very old mr mcdermott why thady he's more than thirty years older than your father and you see he wants to arrange all his money matters between us and the bedpost by the by i wish he didn't think so much of those nephews of his however he wishes the matter settled and i explained to him that after knowing one another so long it wouldn't be fair though for the matter of that of course it would be fair but in fact the old man doesn't exactly wish it himself that is you know to foreclose at once and sell the estate here he paused while larry merrily fidgeted in his chair and thady said well mr keegan so you see he just wishes the affair to be settled amicably i fear mr thady your father hasn't just got the amount of the principal debt oh you know that of yourself mr keegan you know he hasn't the interest itself till i screw it out of them poor devils of tenants well mr mcdermott as you haven't the money to pay the principal debt of course you can't clear the estate why you see the interest amounts to one hundred and ninety pounds odd shillings a year and before that's paid time is so bad you see mr flannelly is obliged obliged in his own defence you see to run you to great expense well now perhaps you'd say if flannelly wants his money at once you'd borrow it on another mortgage that is sell the mortgage mr thady but money's so scarce these days and the property is so little improved and the tenant so bad that you couldn't raise the money on it you couldn't possibly raise the money on it why mr keegan father pays mr flannelly five pounds per cent and the property is near to four hundred pounds a year even now well of course if you think so i wouldn't advise you to the contrary only if so mr flannelly must foreclose at once in which case the property would be sold out and out but perhaps you could effect a loan in time well mr keegan what was it you said you had to propose what mr flannelly proposes you mean of course i'm only his messenger now what he proposes is this you see the property is so unimproved and bad why the house is tumbling down it's enough to kill your father now he's getting a little infirm well well mr keegan what is it mr flannelly wishes to do with us wishes to do oh he doesn't wish anything of course the law is open to him to get his own in fact the law would give him much more than he wishes to take but he proposes to buy ballycloran himself buy ballycloran screamed larry 
well well father let's hear what mr keegan has to say well mr keegan does he propose giving anything but what he has got himself already or does he propose to take the estate for the mortgage and cry quits so that father and feemy and i can walk out just where we please of course not of course not it's to make your father what he thinks a fair offer that i'm come up and it's what i'm sure you must think is a generous offer well out with it well then what he proposes to do is to settle an annuity on your father for his life and give you a sum of money down for yourself and your sister let's hear what he offers said thady larry whose back was nearly turned to the chair where the attorney was sitting said nothing but he gave an ominous look round which showed that he had heard what had passed but it did not show that he by any means approved of the proposition i'm coming to that you see the rent is mostly all swallowed up by this mortgage now can you say you've fifty pounds a year coming into the house i'm afraid not mr thady i'm afraid not and then all your time is occupied in collecting it and scraping it and if it's true what i hear to be plain i fear you'll hardly have the interest money this november and if you like mr flannelly's proposal he'll give in that half year so that you'd have something in hand to begin and how comfortable mr mcdermott would be in lodgings down at carrick you've no idea how reasonable he might board there say at dargan's for instance for about ten shillings a week and i'm very glad i can assure you to hear of the very respectable match your sister is making usher is a very steady nice fellow knows what's what and won't be less ready to come to the scratch when he knows he'll have to touch a little ready cash you'd better let us know what your offer is and lave my sister alone it doesn't do to bring every old woman's story in when we're talking business so if you plays we won't calculate on feemy's marriage end of section twelve mr keegan part one section thirteen of the mcdermott's of ballycloran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by k hand the mcdermott's of ballycloran by anthony trollope section thirteen mr keegan part two well well i didn't mean anything more than that i just heard that a match was made between them so mr mcdermott mr flannelly will settle fifty pounds a year on you paid as you like or come say a pound a week as you would probably like to pay your lodgings weekly and he would give one hundred pounds each to your son and daughter ready money down you know mr thady what do you say mr mcdermott and he got up and walked round so as to stand over the side of larry's chair didn't i tell you then i wouldn't be bothered with your business if you must come up here jawin and talkin can't you have it out with thady there well thady what do you say you see how much your father's comfort would be improved and as i suppose after all your sister is to be married you couldn't well keep the house up and i'll tell you what more mr flannelly proposes for yourself i don't want what mr flannelly will do for me but i'm thinking of the old man and feemy there well don't you see how much more comfortable he must be nothing to bother him you know no bills coming due and as for yourself you should have a lease say for five years of any land you liked say forty acres or so and with your ready money you know sure isn't the land crowded with tenants already said thady ah yes those wretched cabin holders with their half acres mr flannelly would soon get shut of them he means to have no whiskey making on the land let me alone to eject those fellows by dad i'll soon clear off most of them what strip their roofs yes if they wouldn't go quietly but they most of them know me now and i give you my word of honour indeed flannelly said as much you should have any forty acres you please at a fair rent say what the poor devils are paying now without any capital you know no mr keegan i wouldn't have act or part in driving off the poor creatures that know me so well nor would it be safe if i did nor for the matter of that could i well bring myself to be one of mr flannelly's tenants at ballycloran but i won't say that i won't be advising the old man to take the offer if you'd only make it a little fairer consider mr keegan the whole property nigh four hundred pounds a year besides the house and mr flannelly's debt in it only two hundred pounds ah four hundred pounds a year in the house is very well said mr keegan but did you ever see the four hundred pounds and isn't the house half falling down already whose fault is that who built it then mr keegan bad luck to it for a house 
well i don't know it's much use going into that now but you can't say but what the proposal is a fair one ah mr keegan one pound a week is too little for the old man make it one hundred a year for his life and give feemy three hundred so that she poor girl may have some chance of neither begging or starving if she shouldn't get married and i'll not go against the bargain i'd get a bit of land somewhere though i couldn't be a tenant on ballycloran deed for the matter of that if we must part it i don't care how long it is before i see a sod of it again nonsense mr thady one hundred pounds a year is out of the question why your father's hardly to be called an elderly man yet i couldn't think of advising mr flannelly to give more than he has already proposed don't you think mr macdermot and he began speaking loudly to the old man one pound a week regularly paid you know would be a nice thing for you now that your daughter is going to get married and that thady here thinks of taking a farm for himself i told you before i'd nothing to say about it and i will say nothing about it the bill don't come round till november and it's very hard you should be bothering the life out of me this way keegan turned away and taking thady by the collar of his coat led him to the window he began to find he could do nothing with larry you see macdermot he said in a half whisper it is impossible to get your father to listen to me and therefore the responsibility must rest upon you as to advising him what he'd better do and now let me put it to you this way you know that you have not the means of raising the money to pay off this debt and that flannelly can sell the estate any day he pleases well suppose you drive us to this and suppose the thing fetches a little over what his claim is don't you know there are great expenses attached to such a sale all would have to come out of the property and your father's other creditors would come on the little remainder and where would you be then you see my boy it's quite impossible the estate should ever come to you now by what i propose your father would sell the estate while he still had the power he would get comfortably settled and i'd take care to manage the annuity so that the other creditors couldn't touch it and you'd get a handful of money to set you up something more decently than the way you're going on here with your tenants but my sister mr keegan when the house came to be taken over from her head what would become of feemy she and the old man could hardly live on a pound a week and when the old man should die why nonsense man isn't your sister as good as married or if not a strapping girl like her is sure of a husband besides when she's a hundred pounds in her pockets she won't have to go far to look for a lover there's plenty in carrick would be glad to take her take her mr keegan do you think i'd be offering her that way to any huckster in carrick that wanted a hundred pound or that she would put up with the like of that bad as we are we ain't come to that yet there you go with your family pride thady but family pride won't feed you and the offer i've made will so you better bring the old man around to accept it make it eighty pounds a year for my father and two hundred and fifty pounds for feemy and i'll do the best i can not a penny more than i offered indeed mr flannelly would get the property cheaper if he sold it the regular way under the mortgage so that he doesn't care about it only he'd sooner you got the difference than strangers well you won't get the old man to take the offer eh i can't advise him to sell his property and his house and everything so for nothing then you know we must sell it for him will you give me till monday said thady till i ask some friend what i ought to do some friend what friend do you want to be asking some attorney dolan i suppose who of course would tell you not to part with the property that he might make a penny of it no master thady that won't do either yes or no no or yes i don't care which but an answer if you please as flannelly is determined he will do something it's no lawyer i want to speak to mr keegan i've had too much of lawyers but it's my friend father john what the priest thank ye for nothing i'll have no damned priest meddling and to tell you the truth at once it's either now or never and think where your father'll be if this house is sold over his head before he has a place to stretch himself in oh you know and i know you can't sell it out of hand in that way all at once deed but we can though and by god if you mean to be stiff about it you shall be out of the place before the may rents come due would you want me to go and sell all that's left in the family without giving me a day to consider without asking my friends what's best to do for the old man and for poor feemy surely mr keegan surely nonsense you see how it is i want to give flannelly an answer he's not asking anything of you he's offering a provision to you all which you might go far to look for if the law takes its course as of course it will do if you oppose his offer but perhaps you're thinking we can't sell the estate and from the old man's state because he's not compos you can get ballycloran into your own hands if that's the game you're playing you'll soon find yourself in the wrong box my lad it's not of myself i'm thinking and it's only you such as you would be saying so of me 
but supposing now the old man consented to this bargain how would he be sure of his money sure of his money why wouldn't it be settled on him wouldn't it be named as one of the conditions of the sale he'd be a deal surer of that than he is now of his daily dinner for that i believe he's not very sure of as things are going at ballycloran thady looked at the attorney as though he longed to answer him in the same strain but he said nothing of the sort he remained looking out of the window for a short time considering what he should do well mcdermott i can't be here all day you know what do you say to it i'll spake to my father it's he must decide you know at last and not me larry you heard what mr keegan said didn't you and he explained to his father the nature of the offer and tried to make him understand that at any rate ballycloran must go and that it would be better to go at once with some provision to look to than to stay there and be driven out without any and that mr flannelly would not be content any longer with getting the interest for his money but that he was determined to get the principal either by having the property sold or by taking possession of it himself it was long before he could make the old man precisely understand what it was that was required of him during which time keegan remained at the window as if he was not hearing a word that passed between the father and the son and does he want us to go clean out of it thady root and branch father for ivor and ivor and they'll be the finish of the mcdermott's of ballycloran but larry and he put his hand with more tenderness than seemed to belong to his rough nature on his father's arm but larry you know you'll never want for anything then you'll be snug enough just where you plays and your money come and due and paid every week you'd be better than in this wretched place eh larry and what's to become of feemy why we must get feemy a husband till then she'll stay with you and she'll have a thrifle of money herself you know she'll be poor enough though god knows it's the thought of her that troubles me most and yourself thady where would you go till you got ballycloran again got ballycloran again why larry you're to sell it outright clane away altogether as for me i must get a bit of land i suppose or list or do something go into america perhaps and it was keegan wanted to buy ballycloran oh it's between them i suppose but what does it matter keegan or flannelly and what did you say thady what did i say oh i could say nothing you know it's for you to do it but larry i think it's the best for you and you may be sure i'll not be complaining after or saying ill of you for what you did when you could do no other and you didn't tell the blackguard ruffian robber to be gone out of that when he asked you to drive your own family out of your own house whist father whist when keegan heard old mcdermott break out in this way he was obliged to turn round so he walked up to the fire and said mr mcdermott may i ask who you are speaking of Larry was again commencing, when Thady held him down gently and said, It's not so easy, Mr. Keegan, for an old man to hear for the first time that he's to leave his house and his home forever, where he and his father and his grandfather have lived. You'd better let me talk to him a while. Oh, for the matter of that, I don't care for his passion, but if he means to come to reason, let him do so at once, for as I said before, I won't wait here all day. Nobody wants you to wait. Nobody wants you to wait, said the father. Whist, Larry, whist. Be easy a while. I won't whist, and I won't be easy. So, Mr. Keegan, if you want to have my answer, take it, and carry it down to that old bricklayer in Carrick, whose daughter has the divil's bargain in you, and for the like of that you're not bad matched. Tell him from me, Larry McDermott, tell him from me that I'm not so old yet, nor so poor, nor so silly, that he can swindle me out of my lands and house that way. So clever as you think yourself, Mr. Keegan, you may walk back to Carrick again, and don't think to call yourself the master of Alley Cloran yet a while very well mr mcdermott very well my fine fellow look to yourself and mind i tell you i'll have a cheaper bargain of the place by this day six months than i should have now by the terms i'm offering myself you dirty main ruffian if it was only myself you was wantin to turn out of it but to be robbin the boy there of his property that has been working his soul out these six years for that dirty old bricklayer and you want to place all to yourself do you mr keegan fay and a fine estate of gentlemen you'd make anyhow well now you'll repent the day you made yourself such a fool however good morning mr mcdermott good morning i'll tell them down at carrick to keep a warm corner for you in that lane there where them old beggars sleep at night kick him out thady kick him out will ye have ye none o the old blood left round your heart that you'll not kick him out of the house for a pettifogging scheme and blackguard and larry got up as though he meant to have a kick at the attorney himself be aisy father and let him go of himself he'll go fast enough now sit down a while sit down till i come back and thady followed the attorney down the steps on to the gravel road you'll see my boy said keegan and now the benevolent attorney had altogether lost his smile you'll see my boy whether i won't make the two of you pay for this a eh? and the whole family too for a set of proud beggarly starved out paupers by god i'll sell every rotten stick of old furniture left in the house on the sixth of next month and the three of you shall be trampin in the roads before the winter's over 
"'You're worse than the old man with your passion, Mr. Keegan,' said Thady. Ten times worse. "'You know I did what I could to advise him, "'and even now, if you'll lave him to me, I'll bring him round.' "'Be damned to you with your bringing round. "'I'll have no more to do with the pack of you.' "'Would you go on to remember the passionate words of an old man "'that's lost his senses, Mr. Keegan? "'For shame on you. "'If you'll stick to the offer you made before, "'I'll bring the old man round yet. "'I tell you I'll do no such thing, Master Thady, "'but root and branch I'll have you out of that, "'and that right soon, a pack of beggars like you. "'What right have you to be keeping a respectable man out of his money?' respectable indeed very respectable look at the house mr keegan for which you want to take the whole property tumbling down already and you call that respectable and to be threatening to be driving an old man past his senses out of his house for a few foolish words and a poor innocent defenceless girl too thady himself was beginning to get in a passion now and since you will have it the old man was not far wrong for it is robbers you are both of you and that's your respectability robbers are we and what are you and your innocent sister? You know, Thady, she can go to Usher. He says he'll keep her. She won't be a huckster's wife, you say? Better that than a captain's mistress, as all agree she is now. As Keegan said this, he seemed to expect that he would be answered by some personal violence. The two were together, standing at the end of the avenue, all but on the public road. Keegan had a stout walking stick in his hand, and he walked out into the road as he said the last words, turning round as he did so, so as to face Thady. The young man stood still for a second or two, as if the meaning of the words had hardly reached him, and then rushed at the attorney with his clenched fist. But the man of law was too quick for him, for striking with the stick, he cried, "'By the Lord of heaven, if you come nearer, I'll brain you!' And as the young man endeavored to get within the sweep of the stick, he received a blow in the arm and elbow, which for the moment disabled him, and the pain was so sharp as to prevent him from any further immediate attack. "'Mr. Keegan, by the living Lord, this day's work shall cost you dear.' and then indulging that ready profuseness of threats in which the less educated of his countrymen are so prone to indulge he returned within the gateway of the avenue and proceeded a short way towards the house here he reached a felled tree lying somewhat across the path on which he sat down for he felt that he could not go to the house before he had considered in his sad heart what he would say there and how he would say it keegan when he found that his antagonist like a dog cowed by a blow was not inclined to come again to the fight turned on his heel and walked back to the place where he had left his horse for some time thady did not recover from the immediate sharp pain arising from the blow and during these minutes firm determinations of signal vengeance filled his imagination damped by no thought of the punishment to which he might thereby be subjecting himself but the luxury of these resolves for they had a certain luxury was soon banished by the thoughts that crowded on his mind when pain gave him liberty to think Firstly, his own impotence with regards to retaliating on Keegan. Secondly, the horrid charge brought against Feemy, and the conviction that the scurrility of it would not have occurred to Keegan had it not previously been rumoured or suggested by others, and the dreadful doubt, for it was dreadful to Thady, whether there could be any grounds for it, then the recollection of their defenceless state, the certainty that Flannelly would take every legal step against them, and that Keegan's threat, that they should be turned out to wander through the roads, would be realised. All these things forced themselves on his recollection, and he could not go up to the house. He could not meet his father and tell him that between them they had destroyed all hopes of conciliation, that they must wander forth as beggars to starve. He could not ask counsel from Feemy. His inability to protect her made him averse to see her. In his misery, and half broken hearted as he was, he all but made up his mind to join the boys, who he knew were meeting with some secret plans for proposed deliverance from their superiors. Better at any rate join them now, thought he, than to be driven to do it when he was no better than them, as would soon be the case, and if he was to perish, better first strike a blow at those who had pressed him so low. And then it occurred to him that at any rate he would first go to his only good counsellor, and he accordingly retraced his steps to the bottom of the avenue, resolved, if he could find him, to tell all his new sorrow to Father John. End of section 13《Section 14 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 14. Pat Brady. When Thady reached the end of the avenue where the fracas had taken place between himself and Keegan, he met Pat Brady. 
as i fear that this talented young man must by this time be subject to heavy suspicions that his faith and honesty must be greatly doubted and as even with those who may still look upon him as a trusty servant it would be impossible to keep up the delusion much longer i may as well now make his character no longer doubtful by explaining some passages which had occurred in his life during the last few months in the first place however we must return for a short time to mr keegan it will be remembered that this gentleman was the son-in-law of larry mcdermott's creditor mr flannelly and it had been arranged between the two worthy relations that if by some law craft or other means keegan could obtain possession of the estate of ballycloran in payment of the debt due by the proprietor it should become his keegan's property now this gentleman had long looked forward to the day when he should be able to describe himself as hyacinth keegan esq of ballycloran having been aware that after his father-in-law's death all right in the property would become his own but since he had induced the old man to make a gift instead of a legacy of the debt his passion to become an estated gentleman had hourly increased an ambitious man in his own way was hyacinth keegan he had first longed to obtain admission into the more decent society of carrick on shannon that he had some time since achieved he then sought to mix among the second-rate country gentlemen and by making himself useful to them by plausibility by some degree of talent and by great effrontery he had become sufficiently intimate with many of them to shake hands with them at race-courses and ordinaries and to talk of them to others as blake brown and jones to some few who now usually called him hyacinth and occasionally invited him to drinking parties at their houses he had lent small sums of money on good security and now he was looking to obtain the sub shrivalty of the county and to be hyacinth keegan esq of ballycloran since the immediate probability of realizing this brilliant vision had occurred to him he had left nothing undone which could as he thought lead to its completion from the constant business which he had with thady he pretty well knew all the difficulties of the mcdermott's and the great poverty of their house and he had observed how completely pat brady was in young mcdermott's confidence he also knew that if any direct legal steps were necessary in selling the estate under the mortgage or if any underhand scheming should be required to drive the mcdermott's into further difficulties pat brady could and probably would for a consideration give him his zealous cooperation there were also other reasons why he desired the assistance of our friend pat it was a part of mr keegan's daily practice to obtain what information he could of the habits of those with whom he was likely to form any connection and it was generally believed through the county that he could usually tell those who were and who were not guilty of the common crimes of the times illicit distillation and secret conspiracies among the poor to injure their superiors or to redress their fancied wrongs it was from his accurate information on these points that he was usually employed in their defense when they were brought to trial and that he had been able to detect and punish those by whom he had himself been attacked this moreover as his character became known had materially led to his own safety for the boys knew that he knew everything through the county and thus had learnt to become afraid of him he felt therefore that as it was probable that ballycloran would become his own pat brady's assured services might be of great utility and he found but little difficulty in obtaining them pat was clever enough to foresee that the days of the mcdermott's were over and that it was necessary for him to ingratiate himself with the probable future master and though he of course made sufficiently good market of his treachery he felt that in all ways he consulted his own best interest in making himself useful to keegan he had dim prospects too of great worldly advantages which might accrue from being chief informer to so conspicuous a man as mr keegan was likely to prove himself and with no false self-vanity he felt himself qualified for such a situation there was considerable danger in being always among people of a wild and savage nature to entrap and ensnare whom would be his duty and he felt that he had the requisite courage moreover there was a certain cunning and prudence necessary and in that also he with some truth fancied himself not deficient and as mr keegan's scheme opened upon him the idea of entrapping his young master into the difficulties which lay around offered not a bad opportunity for the display of his talents that such a man as brady is described to be should exist and find employment in a country is a fact which must shock and disgust but that it is a fact in great parts of ireland those who are most conversant with the country will not pretend to deny 
it is true that by paid spies and informers real criminals may not unfrequently be brought to justice but those who have observed the working of the system must admit that the treachery which it creates the feeling of suspicion which it generates but above all the villainies to which it gives and has given rise in allowing informers by the prospect of blood money to give false informations and to entrap the unwary into crimes are by no means atoned for by the occasional detection and punishment of a criminal let the police use such open means as they have and god knows in ireland they should be effective enough but I cannot but think the system of secret informers, to which those in positions of inferior authority too often have recourse, has greatly increased crime in many districts of Ireland. I by no means intend to assert that this system is patronized or even recognized by government. I believe the contrary most fully. But those to whom the execution of the criminal laws in detail are committed, and who look to obtain advancement and character by their activity, do very frequently employ what I must call a most iniquitous system of espionage. A very few years since I was walking down the street of a small town with a gentleman who was at that time in the immediate employment of the government. It was a fair day and we were strolling through the crowd, which was moving slowly hither and thither as though in absolute idleness. The dusk was fast commencing and he pointed out to me two or three men who had come in from the country like the others, telling me that they were waiting till it was dark to speak to him, that they did not dare to speak to him during the light, that they were in his pay and that they had information to give him respecting illegal societies and hidden arms. He ridiculed me when I questioned the propriety of his system. In fact, he was so accustomed to it that he could not conceive the possibility of going on without it. In the same way, I have had men pointed out to me by the officer leading a party of revenue police in quest of illicit stills, who were dressed as policemen, though not belonging to the force, and who were brought in that disguise that they might not be known by their neighbors whose haunts they were going to disclose. The momentary success no doubt reconciles this usage to the officer employing it, but the result must be to create suspicion of each other among the poor, and fearfully to increase instead of diminishing crime. Now that our friend Brady's character is perfectly understood, we will return to our story, first, however, explaining that he had witnessed the scene between the attorney and his master, and had determined to make the most of it. Thady had turned on the road towards the priest's house without taking any notice of his dependent, but this Pat could not allow. "'Well, Mr. Thady, you'll live to be even with him yet, the born ruffian. "'Fakes, and a good sight more, nor even, else it'll be no one's fault but your own.' "'Even with who?' "'With who, now? Why, didn't I see it with mine own eyes? "'The born thief of the world. Didn't he knock flashes out of your shoulder with the shillelagh he had? "'Mr. Keegan, I mean? And if it weren't that you hadn't, bad cess to the luck of it, "'your own bit of a stick in your hand, wouldn't you have knocked the life out of him for the name he put on your sister, Miss Feemy, the blackguard? And did you hear him, Pat? Sure I did, your honor. And did you see him? See him, yes, sure. I seed him read his big stick, and I thought it was nigh kilt you were. And you heard him call your mistress the name he called, and you saw him strike at me the way he did, and I having nothing but my fist to help me? And were you so afraid of a man like Keegan you wouldn't step forward to strike a blow for me? "'Afraid of Keegan? No, Master Thady, I aren't afraid of him, but you wouldn't have had me come up just to witness you are the first to strike at him.' "'Nonsense. Wasn't he the first to call my sister the name he did?' "'Ah, but that weren't a breach of the pace. You see, Mr. Thady, them devils of lawyers is so cute, and if I had come to help you, or strike a blow, or riz my stick, he'd have had both before old Jonas Brown tomorrow morning. And where'd we've been then?' But, Mr. Thady, as I said before, you'll be more nor even with Mr. Keegan yet, anyway. How'll I be even with him, Pat? But where are you going, Mr. Thady? Sure ain't it your dinner time at the house? And remember, you've got to be at the wedding tonight. Oh, damn the wedding. Do you think I'd be playing the fool at weddings tonight after what just took place? I want to see Father John, and I'll go and catch him before he goes down to your sister. What, Mr. Thady? to tell about the blow and the dishonor the ruffian put on you and miss feemy surely you wouldn't be doing that and why not won't all carrick have it before long there's no rule why you should be going and telling father john about it yourself and won't he be putting you against revenging yourself and you wouldn't mr thady with the old blood in your veins and in miss feemy's may the devil's curse blacken him for the name he give her you wouldn't be putting up quiet and aisy with what he's done and the like of him too by this time Thady had stopped, and was beginning to waver in his determination of going to the priest. 
He felt that what Brady had said was true, that the priest would implore him not to avenge himself, in the manner in which his heart strongly prompted him to do. He felt he could not forego the impulse to inflict personal punishment on Keegan. And after all, what could Father John do for him? Besides, Mr. Thady, now I think of it, Father John ain't in it at all, for he was to be at Drumsna before the wedding, and I know he's to dine with Mrs. McKeon. He does mostly when he's in Drumsna this time of day, so I'm sure he aren't in it. Satisfied by this, Thady allowed himself to be led back again, and they walked together in silence a little way. You've only to say the word, continued Pat in a low voice. You've only to say the word to them boys as they'll be there tonight, and they'll see you righted with Keegan. What boys? And how righted? How righted? Why, how should you be righted after what he's after doing? And I tell you, them's the boys as will not see your father's son put upon that way. Which them do you mean, Pat? Oh, there's a lot of them up to anything. There's Jack Byrne, and Joe Reynolds is mad to be having a fling at Usher. You know their brothers is in jail about the malt they found away at Loch Sheen. And there's Corny Dolan, and McKeon, and a lot more of them. I knows them all, and it'll be just as good to them to be making a job at Keegan as the other. I wouldn't have the ruffian murthered, Pat. You don't think I want to have him murthered? Whist, Mr. Thady, might be the children about in the trees there would hear you. Who says anything of murder? No, but just give him a baitin that would go nigh tacklin him in the taste of being murder, and the same for Master Usher, for I tell you, may the tongue of the cowardly ruffian be blistered for putting the name he did on your sister. But he was only repeating what Usher has said himself, and that more nor once nor twice. Thady made no reply, but walked on slowly. He gave no assent, but he showed no indignation at the kind of revenge which was proposed to him. And what was he saying about the estate? Keegan, I mean, Mr. Thady before you came to be quarrelling that way. He was saying what'll be through enough, that Ballycloran'll be sold right away before next May, and that he himself will be the purchaser, and that we'll be wandering the road like any other set of beggars. And did he say he'd buy Ballycloran? He did. And turn you all out, Mr. Thady? And he'll do it too, said Thady. Tunder and ages! Man, and would you be letting him come over ye that way? If any blackguard of a lawyer could be selling an estate that way, because money may be a little scarce or so, would there be so many gentlemen in the country, enjoying themselves in their own houses, just keeping the right side of the door? Only take care the old man don't be showing hisself that way he does be doing on the big steps there, and take care the door is kept shut instead of right open, and make Biddy understand she ain't to open it for any one at all, at all except yourself, Gist, and Father John, or the like, who wouldn't mind going round to the back door. I tell you that all the Flanleys and Keegans in Ireland can't sell Ballycloran unless they first got a hold of the old man. But can't they put resavers on every acre of the land, and wouldn't that be all one as selling it? Oh, let the boys alone for that. Stick to them, and they'll not let a resaver do much among them. Fakes, I'm thinking, I for one wouldn't like to go resaving rents up to Drumsley for any one, but the master himself. But anyway, you'll be coming down to the boys and spaking to them yourself this night. You wouldn't go, Mr. Thady, not to be at Mary's wedding. You know that ruffian Usher'll be there, and I don't want to be meeting him. But that's just it. Don't let him be there playing what tricks he plays with Miss Feemy, and you're not there to protect her. And there's all them boys expect you. You won't let Keegan run off with the land in the house, and all without a blow strick? They'll all be up at Ballycloran tomorrow, and I'll hear what they have to say then. But I tell you, they won't be there at all tomorrow unless you come down to them tonight, answered Pat. Do they mean to say they refuse out and out to pay the rent? Not at all. But they'll be getting stiff if they think you're so thick with them as their enemy. And isn't that natural, too? It's only to come down and say a kind word or so to em yourself. You'll find em all right, and ready to stand by you and yours to the last, Mr. Thady. Well, Pat, I'll be down there. Father John would think it odd if I weren't there. By this time they had got round to the back of the house, where the outhouse stood, and the young man told Brady to go into the kitchen and get him a coal for his pipe, and to tell the girl to say he wouldn't be in to dinner. And won't you be wanting your dinner, Mr. Thady? No, Pat, I'll just sit and have a smoke in the stable till it's time to go down to you. I couldn't face the old man and Feemy after what just happened. So we will, for the present, leave him smoking in the stable, and return to the inmates of the house. It will be remembered that when Father John left Feemy after his morning visit, she remained alone till Mr. Keegan came, and that she was dismissed from the dining-room when they began to talk on business. 
she then betook herself to dress for the evening amusement that is to make herself something decent before she met usher to brush her hair and to dismiss all traces of the disenchanting dishabill which i have attempted to describe whilst at her toilet feemy turned over in her mind all that her brother and father john had said and firmly resolved not to let the evening pass without telling her lover the comfort it would be to have some decided steps taken as to their engagement and yet she almost shuddered at the thoughts of doing so there was a frown which occasionally came over usher's face which made her dread him and she couldn't but feel that if he wished to take any such step he would do so without her asking him in fact that it would be much better that he should do so unasked and then if he got angry if he should tell her that as she could not wait and trust him they must part how could she bear the idea of losing him what could she say or do if he answered her sternly if he scolded her or perhaps worse absolutely quarrelled with her poor feemy began to wish the evening over to which she had looked forward as the source of so much pleasure she feared to neglect the warning she had received and she felt that things could not go on always as they were but she trembled at the idea of telling this to usher her silent dinner was soon over she made her father's punch and sat down to wait for her lover larry kept up a continual growl about thady's absence suggesting that keegan had cozened him off to carrick to sign the estate away accusing him of conspiracy with the attorney to rob him his father wondering why he wouldn't come to dinner etc to all which feemy made no reply she never noticed his grumblings she sat absorbed in her own thoughts meditating what she would say to usher till she heard his horse's feet at the head of the avenue and then she jumped up to meet him at the hall door how are you miles and well feemy how's yourself and then having reached the hall door he took the fond girl in his arms and kissed her ah don't then miles there's caddy on the stairs come in then and take your punch and they entered the room where larry was sitting over the fire how are you this evening sir said usher this fine night the old man always brightened up a little when usher came in how do you do captain i'm glad to see you did the captain get his dinner then feemy you don't ask captain usher whether he got his dinner feemy knows she needn't ask about that that's one of the things i always take care of but where's thady mr mcdermott i wanted to speak to him about keegan that sworn friend of his and usher began to make himself comfortable with the hot water sugar etc thady is it you're asking after deed then i don't know where he is and as for keegan but you don't make your punch captain as for keegan the ruffian he was here this blessed morning wanting me and feemy and thady too to walk clean out of the place but i walked him off the like of him to be buying ballycloran and his father a process server and his wife's father that damned bricklayer flannelly hullo mr mcdermott so you've had a breeze with the attorney have you and was thady here at the time he was in it all the time and divil a word he'd say for himself or feemy or his father or the old place either but just wanted me captain to give it all up to them at once the ruffians and when i wouldn't he went off with keegan to carrick there's my own son joined with him again me and he'll help to drive me out he will and fee me too poor girl in vain usher endeavoured to make him believe that his son had not conspired against him to deprive him of his property the old man had taken it into his head that thady had gone off to carrick with keegan and was determined to make the most of this new grievance and would not be comforted he seemed cunning enough in his determination to thwart the attorney in his plan of buying the estate and explained to usher that he had made up his mind not to be taken personally assuring him that from time to time nothing should induce him to leave his own fireside or so much as show himself at the hall door that he would have the hall door barricaded and in short that he would himself take all those precautions which brady had enumerated to his son as proper to be put in practice on such an occasion and from that time with one sad exception it was many months before larry mcdermott was seen to cross his threshold he strictly adhered to his resolution and although during that time many attempts to arrest him were made he eluded them all he could not however be brought to understand that for the present this was useless that no one could arrest him till after christmas the dread of losing his property had come upon him and he would not allow himself even to be seen by any one but those of his own household and by usher after listening to his grievances as long as he thought necessary usher followed feemy into her own room and here we will leave them till we meet them again at dennis mcgovery's wedding merely remarking that poor feemy though more than once prepared to make her dreaded speech to her lover each time hesitated and stopped and at last made up her mind that it would be just as well to put off the evil hour till her pleasure was over and finally determined to have the conversation on the return home for she well knew that usher would walk back with her to ballycloran where his horse would be left 
End of section 14, Pat Brady. Section 15 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 15. The Wedding, Part 1. When Usher first came into the parlor at Ballycloran, he asked after Thady, and it will be necessary to explain why he did so, the terms on which the two men stood towards each other not being such as to render it probable that either should be very anxious for the presence of the other. It had come to the knowledge of Dennis McGovery that Brady had asked to the wedding a lot of men from Drumleash, and some also from Mohill, characters with whom Dennis was not apt to consort himself, and whom he looked on as paupers and rapparees. He had also made out, it is presumed with the aid of his affianced, that some other motive was probably ensuring their attendance than merely that of doing honour to his, Dennis's, nuptials. Pat Brady was not likely to have made a confidant of his sister, or of Dennis, on the occasion, but nevertheless the bridegroom had discovered that the meeting was, to some extent, to be a political one, and moreover that Thady McDermott was expected to be there. Now McGovery, although it must be presumed that, in common with all Irishmen of the lower order, he conceived that he was to a certain degree injured and oppressed by the operation of the existing laws, nevertheless had always thought it the wiser course to be with the laws, bad as they might be, than against them. When, therefore, he learnt that the brothers of the men whom Usher had put into prison were to be of the party, and that many of their more immediate neighbours would be there, and remembered also that Captain Usher himself had promised to come to the diversion, mighty fears suggested themselves to him, and he began to dread that the occasion would be taken for offering some personal injury to the latter. In which case, might not all be implicated? And among the number, that dear person for whom Dennis felt the tenderest regard, that is, himself. Actuated by these apprehensions, Dennis, on the morning of the wedding, had gone to Usher to unfold his budget of dreadful news, to assure the captain that his only object, quote, was to get himself married, end quote, and to see that the, quote, pigs and the thrifle of change were all right, end quote, and strongly to advise the captain to stay away, quote, not that it wouldn't be a great honor for a poor boy like him to see his honor down there, for he had the greatest respect in life for him, and all that wore the king's sword. But there war no knowing what them boys might be after when they get the drink in them." Usher thanked Dennis for his communication, but at the same time begged him not to disquiet himself, told him that there was no danger in life, and declared that he felt so confident of the good feeling of the men through the country towards him, particularly those at Drumleash and Mohill, that he should always feel perfectly safe in their company. In fact, that he looked on their presence as a protection. Poor Dennis stared hard at him, but as he soon perceived that the captain was laughing at him for his solicitude, he retreated with a grin on his face, remarking that he had meant all for the best. Though Captain Usher affected to set no value on McGovery's tale, he nevertheless thought that there might be something in it. He determined, however, not to be deterred from going to the wedding. Though in many respects a bad man, Usher was very vigilant in the performance of his official duties, and, as has been before said, was possessed of sufficient courage. It had been part of McGovery's disclosure that Thady McDermott was to be at the wedding, and it occurred to Usher that at any rate no personal violence would be offered as long as young McDermott was with him. He therefore determined to see him first, and tell him what he had heard. It is true he had no great love for the poor fellow. Still, he would have been sorry to see him, from any cause of uneasiness or distress, throw himself into the hands of men who might probably induce him to join in acts which would render him subject to the severest penalties of the law. 
Usher understood Thady's character tolerably well, and though he had no real sympathy for his sufferings, still he had manly feeling enough to wish to save him, as Feemy's brother, from the danger into which he believed him so likely to fall. It was for the purpose of talking on this subject that he asked for Thady. But when he found he was not in the house, nor expected home to dinner, he was obliged to postpone what he had to say till he met him at Mary Brady's wedding. About seven o'clock, Feemy and her lover arrived at Mrs. Meehan's little whiskey shop, where the marriage was to take place. The whole party were already there. Father John was standing with his back to a huge turf fire in the outer room, the usual drinking room of the establishment, amusing the bystanders with jokes, apparently at the expense of the bridegroom. Mary Brady was dressed in a white muslin gown, which, though it was quite clean, seemed to have been neither mangled nor ironed, so multitudinous had been the efforts to make it fit her ungainly person. She had a large white cap on her head, extending widely over her ears, and her hair, parted on her left brow, was smeared flat over her forehead with oil. Her arms were bare and quite red, and her hands were thrust into huge white cotton gloves, which seemed to make them so ashamed of themselves as utterly to unfit them for their ordinary uses. Everyone that entered said, "'Well, Mary,' or, "'Well, Alana, how's yourself?' or some greeting of the kind, to which she answered only with a grin. She and her future husband seemed totally unacquainted with each other, for since he came in he hadn't spoken to her. In fact, poor Mary, as she expressed herself to Feemy, couldn't get her spirits up at all, and felt quite cowed-like. Biddy, from Ballycloran, was her bridesmaid, and she, though she did not emulate the bride in her white dress, had also thrust her head into a huge cap, which, if it did not much add to her beauty, at any rate made her sufficiently remarkable to show she was one of the principal characters of the evening. Dennis had procured himself a second-hand light brown coat, with metal buttons. This was the only attempt at wedding finery which he had made, but even this seemed to make him somewhat beside himself and gave him a strong resemblance to that well-known martyr to unaccustomed grandeur, a hog in armor. Pat seemed to scorn the party altogether, though he was to officiate in giving away the bride. He was talking apart to Reynolds and one or two others, and seeing to the proper arrangement and distribution of the good things which were to follow the wedding. Thady was not in the place. He had not yet arrived. "'Ah, Feemy!' began Father John as she walked in, followed by Usher. "'How are you? And this is kind of you, Captain.' "'Long life to you, Miss Feemy, and you too, Captain dear,' said Mary, at last excited to speak by the greatness of the occasion. "'Your honours are welcome, Miss, your honours are welcome, Captain Usher,' said Dennis, forgetting that, for the present, he was only a guest himself. And then Shamuth na Pibwa, the blind piper from County Mayo, who had made the music out of his own head all about O'Connell, and then Biddy and Mrs. Meehan and all the boys and girls one after another, got up and ducked their heads down in token of kindly welcome to the young mistress and her lover. And though most of these present at other times would have said that it was a pity their own Miss Feemy should be marrying a born enemy of the country, like a revenue officer, and a black Protestant, too. It wasn't now, when she had come to honour the wedding of one of themselves, that they would be remembering anything against her or her lover. "'Well, Mary, so the time's nearly come,' said Feemy, as she sat down on the bench by the fire, that Mary, regardless of all bridal propriety, wiped down for her with the tail of her white dress, saying as she did so, what harm? Sure won't the dust make it worse when the dancing comes on, and— Whisper, Mary. What is it, miss? Whisper, then. Ah, now, you'll be at me like the rest of em. And she put her big face down over Feemy's. Are the sheets done, Mary? Ah, now, miss, you're worse than em all. And Mary put her big hand, with the big cotton glove, with the fingers widely extended, before her face to hide the virgin blush. "'What's that, Feemy?' said Father John, 
"'What's that I heard?' "'Go easy now, Father John, do.' And Mary gave the priest a playful push, which nearly put him into the fire. "'For God's sake, miss, don't be telling him now. You won't, darlin'. "'What is it, Feemy? All's fair now, you know.' "'Only just something Mary was to get ready for her husband, then, Father John. Nothing particular. You'll never be married yourself, you know, so you needn't ask.' "'Oh, part of the fortune, was it? Trust Dennis, he'll look to that. Is it the pigs, eh, Dennis?' "'No, Father John, it just ain't the pigs,' said Mary. "'Come, what is it? Out with it, Dennis.' "'Sorrow a one o' me knows what you're talking about,' said Dennis. "'It ain't the calf at last, Dennis, is it?' "'Bad luck to it for a calf,' exclaimed McGovery. And then, sidling up to the priest, you wouldn't be setting all the boys laughing at me, Father John, and them strangers, too. Well, well, Dennis, but why didn't you tell me the whole? When Usher had first entered, Brady had come up, expressly to welcome him, and there was something in his extreme servility which made Usher fear all was not quite right. But Usher had become habituated to treat the servility of the poor as the only means they had of deprecating the injuries so frequently in his power to inflict. He had, too, from his necessity of not attending to their supplications, acquired a habit of treating them with constant derision, which they well understood and appreciated, and the contempt which he always showed for them was one of the reasons why he was so particularly hated through the country though now a guest of Brady's, he could not help showing the same feeling. Moreover, Usher, who, as far as the conduct of man to man is concerned, had nothing of treachery about him, strongly suspected Pat's true character, and was therefore less likely to treat him with respect. "'Thank you, Brady, I'll do very well. Don't you expect Mr. Thady here?' "'Is it the young master, Captain? In course we do.' Mary wouldn't be married ef he weren't to the fore. Indeed, I didn't know you'd so much respect for Mr. McDermott as that. Is it for the master, Captain? For the matter of that, Brady, you wouldn't much mind how many masters you had if they all paid you, I'm thinking. And that's true for you, Captain, said Pat, grinning in his perplexity, for he didn't know whether to take what Usher said for a joke or not. "'Keegan, now, wouldn't be a bad master,' said Usher. "'And what puts him in your head, Captain Usher?' "'Only they say he pays well to a sharp fellow like you.' "'Deed, I don't know who he pays. They do be saying you pay a few of the boys, too, an odd time or two yourself.' "'Is it I? What should I be paying them for?' "'Just for a sight of a whiskey still, or a little white smoke in the mountains on a fine night or so.' They say that same would be worth a brace of guineas to a boy I could name. You're very sharp, Mr. Brady, but should I want such assistance, I don't know any I'd sooner ask than yourself. Don't go for to trouble yourself, for I don't want to be hold of a night yet. And that's what'll happen them that's at that work, I'm thinking, and that afore long. Not that I'm blaming you, for in course everyone knows it's only your duty." You're very kind, but when will Mr. Thady be here? Deed I wonder he ain't here, Captain, but were you wanting him? Not in particular. Is it true the brothers of those poor fellows I took up at Loch Sheen are here tonight? They is, both of em. There's Joe Reynolds sitting behind there, in the corner where I was when you and Miss Feemy come in. It's lucky he wasn't with his brother, that's all, and he'd better look sharp himself, or he'll go next. Oh, he's a poor harmless boy, Captain. He never does nothing that way. Though, in course, I knows nothing of what they do be doing. How should I? How should you, indeed, though you seem to be ready enough to answer for your friend Reynolds. However, I don't want to be talking any more of the boys at Drumleash. So if he's a friend of yours, you'd better warn him, that's all. And he walked away. And it's warning you want yourself, Captain, dear, said Pat to himself. How clever you think yourself, with your Mr. Keegan and your spies, and your fine lady miss there. But if you ain't quiet enough before Christmas, it's odd, that's all. They were called into the inner room now, as Father John was going to perform the ceremony, 
and such marshalling and arranging as he had, trying to put people into their proper places who would be somewhere else, shoving down the forms out of the way, moving the tables, removing the dishes and plates, for the supper was to be eaten off the table at which the couple were to be married. And though all the company had probably been at weddings before, and that often, they seemed new to the proceedings. "'Dennis, you born fool, will you come here where I told you? And don't keep the mutton spoiling all night.' And he shoved McGovery round the table. "'Mary Brady, if you wish to change the ugly name that's on you this night, will you come here?' and he seized hold of the young woman's arm and dragged her round. "'And who's wanting you, Biddy?' as the girl followed close behind her principal. "'Sure, Father John, hain't I to be bridesmaid, then?' "'You, bridesmaid, and Miss Feemy to the fore. Stay where you are. Come, Feemy.' "'Oh, Father John, I ain't bridesmaid.' "'Oh, but you will be. And as Thady ain't here, Captain Usher'll be best man. Come round, Captain.' And Usher came round. And mind, Captain, he said, whispering, when I come to salute nostra, those are the last words, you're to kiss the bride. You are to kiss her first, and then you'll be married yourself before the year's out. But I'm not at all ambitious that way. Never mind, do as I tell you, and don't forget to have a half-crown in your hand or so when I bring the plate round. Come, Pat, where are you? You've to give her away. She'll just give herself away then, Father John. By dad, she's ready and willing enough. Do as I tell you, and don't stand bothering. You want to keep those shiners in your pocket. I know you. And Brady, shamed into compliance, also went into his place. Now, Dennis, the other side of her, boy. Why, you're as awkward to marry as shoeing a colt. Why, then, Father John, that's through. For I shod many a colt and never was married. You'll not be so long, Avic and maybe you'll know more about it this time next week. But here's the plate. What do you mean to give the bride? You must put something handsome here for Mary. Thanks, then, I forgot about that. And he put his hand into his pocket and forked out half a crown, which, with a sheepish look, he put in the plate. Half a crown, indeed, for a tradesman like you. There's Corny Dolan there, who don't seem to have a coat that fits him too well, would do more for his wife if it was God's pleasure he was to have one this night. Well, there, and Dennis put in another half-crown. This money, which is always put down just before the marriage, is a bridal present to the bride and becomes her exclusive property. Well, Mary, you must be getting the rest of it from him another time. Let her alone for that, your reverence, said Corney Dolan, who considered that Father John's allusion to his coat privileged him to put in his joke. Let her alone for that. She knows how to be getting the halfpence, and to hold them, too. It's a great deal you're knowing about it, I'm thinking, Mr. Dolan, retorted Dennis. It's a pity you couldn't keep the holt of any yourself. Wished, boys. How am I to marry you all if you go on in this way? Come, Mary, off with that glove of yours. Now for the ring, Dennis." and Mary hauled away at the glove, which the heat of her hand prevented her from pulling off. Dread it for a glove, then. Ah, Alana, gloves come so natural to your pretty hand, they don't like to lave it at all. At last, however, Mary got her hands ready for action. The ring was in the plate with the two half-crowns. Father John was standing between the two matrimonial aspirants. Usher and Feemy were close behind Mary, and Brady was sitting down on the right hand of Dennis, and the priest opened his book and began. The marriage ceremony took about five minutes, but during this time Father John found occasion to whisper Usher to come up close to the bride, and then, after hurrying over a great part of the service almost under his breath, he pronounced the final words, Salute Nostra, in a loud voice, adding at the same time to Usher, Now, my boy! Usher, in obedience to the priest's injunction, seized hold of the bride at one side to kiss her, while McGovery, determined to vindicate his own right, pounced on her on the other, justly thinking that the first kiss she should have after her wedding ought to be given to her by her lawful married husband. But alas, both aspirants were foiled, and Mary got no kiss at all. 
she in her dismay at the energy of the two aspirants tucked her head down nearly to the level of the table and dennis in his zeal and his hurry struck usher in the face with his own forehead with no slight force the captain retreated half stunned and not very well pleased with the salute he had received and dennis was so shocked at what he had done that he forgot his wife and apparently even the pigs and the money in his regrets and apologies egad captain said father john that's more of a kiss than i meant to get you why you're as awkward mcgovery as a bull calf who'd have thought to see you butting at the captain like an old goat on his hind legs fakes then your reverence i didn't intend to be traitin' the captain in that way but anyway the captain's head is almost as hard as my own for the flashes isn't out of my eyes yet never mind said usher and if you always take care of your wife the same way my good fellow you'll be sure she'll not come to any harm for want of looking after in the meantime mary had escaped from the salute intended for her and was with the aid of biddy mrs meehan and sundry others of her visitors engaged in extracting two legs of mutton a ham and large quantities of green cabbages from the pots in which they had been boiling in the outer room god bless you sally dear and will you drain them praties they'll be biled to starch and mrs meehan darling my heart's broke with the big pot here will you lend me a hand good luck to you then there's dennis and pat bad manners to them they'd see me kilt with all the bother and stand there doing nothing under the sun and poor mary mcgovery as we must now call her toiled and groaned under the labors of her wedding day till the perspiration ran from under her wedding cap and her wedding dress gave manifold signs of her zeal in preparing the wedding supper End of section 15 the wedding part 1section 16 of the mcdermott's of ballycloran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the mcdermott's of ballycloran by anthony trollope section 16 the wedding part 2 whilst mary was dishing the mutton etc father john was employed in the not less important business of collecting his dues between McGovery and Pat Brady he had succeeded in getting two thirty-shilling notes, which lay in the bottom of the plate and formed a respectable base for the little heap of silver which he would collect, and if he did not get as much as the occasion would seem to warrant, the deficiency arose from no delicacy in asking or want of perseverance in urging. "'Now, Captain, you're the only Protestant among us. Show these Catholics of mine a liberal example.' show them what they ought to do for their priest here captain usher put a couple of half crowns in the plate there boys see what a protestant does for me well feemy i never ask the ladies you know but i shan't let thady off though he ain't here i shall settle that in the rent oh yes father john make thady pay for himself and me mrs brennan has got all my money but where's thady feemy dear i hope you and he are good friends now oh yes father john i didn't see him since morning but will he be here to-night he said he would but you'd best ask pat he knows most about him this conversation took place in an undertone and the priest walked on with his plate come mr tierney how's yourself i see you're waiting there quite impatient with your hands in your pocket it's nothing less than a crown piece i'll go bail deed then crown pieces ain't that plenty in the country these days father john the likes of them and he put a half crown in the plate are scarce enough the speaker was an old man rather decently dressed in knee breeches and gaiters he was one of those who even in bad times manage by thrift and industry to get among the poor the reputation of comparative wealth and that's true for you mr tierney and thank you kindly they do however say that however scarce they are in the country you've your share of them go on father john go on you do be saying more than you know and by degrees the priest went through them all from most of them he got something 
from some a shilling, from some only sixpence, some few gave nothing at all, these in general endeavoured to escape observation behind the backs of the donors, but Father John let none of them off, and those who were unprepared, and who alleged their poverty, and their inability, he reproved for their idleness, and hinted rather strongly that their visits to Mrs. Mulready's, or similar establishments, were the cause of their not being able to do what he called their duty by their priest. Standing in a corner, at the further end of the room, and resting against a wall, was Joe Reynolds. As Father John had a bad opinion of this man, and as he was not a parishioner of his, he was returning without speaking to him, when Joe said, "'You're in the right of it, Father John, not to be axing such a poor divil as me. You know, betwixt them all, they've not left me the sign of a copper harp.' I know, Reynolds, you're too fond of Mrs. Mulready's to have much for your own priest, let alone another. Fakes, then, Father John, you shouldn't spake again Mother Mulready, for she's something like your reverence, and a poor boy with an empty pocket will get neither comfort nor good works from either of ye. Father John did not think it to be consistent with his dignity to answer this sally, so he returned to the other end of the room, carefully counting as he went and pocketing the money which he had collected in the meantime the bride with such assistance as she could get had succeeded in putting the supper on the table a leg of mutton at the top reclining on a vast bed of cabbage a similar dish at the bottom and a ham with some garniture in the middle the rest of the table was elegantly sprinkled with plates of smoking potatoes and what knives and forks and spoons and plates could be spared from the head of the table, where a few were laid out with some little order for the more aristocratic of the guests, were collected together in a heap. At first no one seemed inclined to sit down, every one was struck with a sudden bashfulness, till Father John, taking up the knife and fork at the top of the table, called McGovery to bring his wife to supper. "'Now, Dennis, my man, don't be thinking of those two pigs,' but bring your better half with you, and let's see how you can behave as a married man. "'Come, Miss Feemy,' said Mary, "'if you and the captain now would just sit down and begin, there's a dear Miss Do.' "'Oh, Mary, nobody must sit down before you to-night.' "'Never mind me, Miss. If I could only get you and the captain seated, Your Honour, and she turned round with a curtsy to Usher, "'there's Dennis and Pat there will do nothing in life to help me.' and the poor woman seemed at her wit's end to know how to arrange her guests. At last, however, Usher and Feemy sat down at one side of the priest, Dennis and his wife at the other, and by degrees the table got quite full, so much so that when the boys saw one another taking their seats, they were as eager as before they had been slow, and they hustled each other at the bottom of the table till they were so crowded that they hadn't room to use their arms. Pat sat at the bottom, and he and the priest emulated each other in the zeal and celerity with which they cut up and distributed the joints before them. At Pat's end of the table plates were scarce, and the boys round him took the huge lumps of blood-red mutton in their fists, and seemed perfectly independent of such conventional wants as knives and forks, in the ease and enjoyment with which they dispatched their repast. At last Brady had done all to the joint that carving could do, and having kept a tolerably sufficient lion's share for himself, he passed the bone down the table, which was speedily divided into as many portions as nature had intended that it should be. Matters were conducted in a rather more decorous manner among the aristocrats at Father John's end of the table, though even there they were carried on in a somewhat rapid and voracious fashion. The priest helped Feemy and Usher, Mary and her husband, and then remarking that he had done all the hard work of the evening, and that he thought it was time to get a bit himself, he filled a moderate plate for his own consumption, and passed the joint down to be treated after the same manner as its fellow. As long as the eating continued there was not much said, but when the viands had disappeared, and the various bottles came into requisition, the clatter of tongues became loud and joyous, and though the first part of the entertainment had to all appearance come to a rather too speedy termination for want of material to carry it on, there seemed, from the quantity of whiskey produced, 
little chance of any similar disappointment in what the greater portion of the guests considered the more agreeable part of the entertainment. "'Well, Dennis,' said Father John, "'I believe I've done all I can this time, and as I know you'll want to be looking after the cow that's in calf, no, not the cow, but the pigs, I'll be off.' folly on father john folly on it's always the way with your reverence to be making your game of a poor boy like me but you're not going out of this till you've drunk mary's health here and heard a tune on the pipes anyway not a drop dennis thank ye and father john got up and now boys and girls good night and god bless you and behave yourselves fakes then your reverence said joe reynolds from the bottom of the table you may tell by the way the boys take to the bottle that they'll behave themselves decently and discreetly, like Christians. Indeed, then, Reynolds, where you are and the whiskey with you, I believe there's likely to be little discretion but the discretion of drunkenness, and not much of that. Thank ye, Father John, and it's you have always the kind word for me. But, Father John, began Mary, you're not really going to go without so much as a tumbler of punch— not a drop, Mary, my dear. I took my punch after dinner, and I can't stand too much. Good night, Feemy. You'll stay and have a dance, I suppose. Good night, Captain Usher. And Father John got up from table and went out of the room. As soon, however, as Dennis saw that he was really going, he rose and followed him out the door. Sit down, Dennis, sit down. Don't be laving your company such a night as this but I want to have just a word with your reverence. Well, what is it? Just step outside then, Father John. Well, Dennis, is it anything about Betsy Kane, or has Ginty come home and he is wanting the pigs? No, but would you just step outside here, Mr. McGrath, where those long-eared ruffians won't be hearing me? And he and the priest walked a little distance from the door of Mrs. Meehan's house. I'm afeard, Father John, them born divils from Drumleash and Mohill, as Pat brought here tonight, are maining more than good to Captain Usher. And what makes you think that, Dennis? Why, Father John, Mary was saying that Pat told her a lot of his own friends would be up with him, and that if they war talking together, she and those as are with her dancing and the like, weren't to be disturbing them and then I knows them boys is very mad with the captain about that whiskey business up at Loch Sheen, and then Joe Reynolds and Jack Byrne are in it, and their brothers are two of them as war sazed, and are now in Ballinamore Bridewell, and I know there is something of the sort going on through the country, and fakes, Father John, I wouldn't for money that anything happened, and I in it the while, for a poor boy is always made to be mixed up in them affairs, if by bad luck he is anywhere near at the time. But what do you think they'd do with the captain tonight, Dennis? Fakes, then, your reverence, I don't know what they'd be doing. Murther him, maybe. God forbid. But, Dennis, those men from Drumleash could hardly know Captain Usher was going to be at the wedding tonight. Oh, your reverence, they'd know it well enough from Pat Brady. But you don't think your wife's brother would join a party to murder Usher? Why, then, Father John, I think it's just that he would be putting the others up to it. Good gracious, Dennis, and what would he get by such deeds as that? Isn't he comfortable enough? It isn't them as is poorest is always the worst. But anyhow, Father John, if you'd come back, and your reverence wouldn't mind for the once just sitting it out, just drinking a drop at an odd time, or colloguing a bit with old Mr. Tierney, till we get the captain out of that, sure they'd never be doing anything out of the way as long as your reverence is in it it isn't here in the house where there are so many together they'd attack him even if they meant to do so and i don't think they mean it to-night but it's on his way home and my going back would not in any way prevent that but why don't you at once tell captain usher and warn him that you fear he is not safe among those fellows at night that's just what i did then but he's so foolish and so bold, there's no making him mind what one would say. I did tell him, Father John, that I was afeard that there would be some lads in it wouldn't be his well-wishers. But he laughed at me, and told me there are none of the boys through the country were so fond of him as those Reynolds and Burns, and all them others down at Drumleash. Well, Dennis, and what can I do more? If he laughs at you, why wouldn't he also laugh at me?' 
why your reverence you and he are friends like besides he wouldn't trate the like of you as he would such a one as i why i believe he don't think the poor are christians at all it's true enough for some of them but what would you have me do i couldn't walk back to mohill by his horse's side and i tell you if they attack him at all it will not be at the house there but on his way home deed then father john any way i wish he was well out of that it seems dennis it's yourself you're thinking of more than the captain sure and why wouldn't i and i just married a pretty thing for me just now to be took up among a lot of blackguard ruffians for murdering a king's officer well dennis i won't go back now it would look odd and do no good so do you go back and drink a tumbler of punch with the men and dance a turn or two with the girls as you should on your wedding night and by and by i'll come down again as if to see what's going on and to walk home with miss feemy the captain must go back to ballycloran for his horse and if he can be persuaded that there is any danger he can go up and sleep at the cottage for i tell you if they mean to hurt him at all it's on the road home to mohill they'll make the attempt do you go in and say nothing about it and i'll be down by and by father john walked away towards his house and dennis mcgovery went back with a heavy heart to dance at his own wedding for though his solicitude for the king's officer would not have been of the most intense kind had he thought that he was to be murdered anywhere else he had a great horror at the idea of any evil happening to that important personage when it could in any way affect his own comfort when dennis returned into mrs mehan's big kitchen the amusements of the evening dancing and drinking were on the point of commencing shamuth of the pipes the celebrated composer and musician was sitting in the corner of the huge fireplace with a tumbler of punch within reach of his hand preparing his instrument squeaking and puffing and blowing in the most approved preparatory style mary was working and toiling again for the benefit of her guests carrying kettles of boiling water into the inner room emptying pounds of brown sugar into slop basins and mugs telling the boys to take their punch taking a drop herself now and again with some one who was wishing her health and happiness and comfort with the man she'd got inciting the girls to go and dance and scolding her brother and husband because bad manners to them divil a hand they'd lend to help her and she was so much to do and so many to mind and now miss feemy if you'd only get up and begin dear the others would soon folly come captain usher would your honour just stand up with miss feemy oh no mary you're the bride you know captain usher must dance with you first oh laws miss but that'd be too much honour entirely no mrs mcgovery but it's i that'll be honoured so if you will be good enough to stand up with me i shall be glad to shake a foot with you and the gallant captain led mary into the middle of the floor but captain dear sorrow a cup of drink did i see you take this blessed evening sure then you'll let me get you a glass of wine before we all begin just to prevent your being smothered with the dust like sure your honour hasn't taken a drop yet i won't be long mary but i won't have the wine yet i'll wash the dust out with a tumbler of punch just now here's your husband you must make him dance with the bridesmaid i'm afraid he ain't much good at dancing oh but he must try come mcgovery there's biddy waiting for you to take her out and there's shamuth waiting you don't think man he'd begin till you're ready come dennis said his gentle spouse i never see such a man can't ye stand up and be dancing and not keeping every one waiting that way mind yourself mary and you'll have enough to mind come biddy alanna let's have a shake together all for luck and the happy husband led forth biddy of ballycloran she with the big cap who was only now beginning to regain the serene looks which had been dispelled by father john's not permitting her to act as bridesmaid and now shamuth his preparatory puffs having been accomplished struck up patty carey with full force and energy as this was the first dance no one stood up but the two couples above named there were therefore the more left to admire the performance and better room left for the performers to show their activity fakes then mary 
said one, it's yourself that dances illigant. The Lord be praised, only look to her feet. Well, dear, Dennis, sure no one thought you were that good at a jig. Give him a turn, Biddy, don't spare him, he's able for you and more. Ah, but see the captain, Kathleen, it's he that could give the time to the music. Ain't he and Mary well met? You must put more wind into the pipes, Shamuth, before they're down but if you want to see the dancing, wait till Miss Feemy stands up. It's she that can dance. You'll stand up with the captain, Miss Feemy, won't you? Indeed I will, Corney, if he asks me. Axes you? Ah, there's little doubt of that. It's he that's ready and willing to ax you now and always. Ah, Mr. McGovery, sure man, you're not bait yet. You wouldn't give in to Biddy that soon. Poor Dennis was giving signs of having had enough of the amusement. There was a tolerably large fire on the hearth, near which he had been destined to perform his gyrations, which, if not very graceful, had at any rate been sufficiently active, and the exertion, heat, and dust were showing plainly on his shining countenance. "'Ah, oh, Mr. McGovery,' panted Biddy, "'sure you're not down yet, and I only just begun.' "'Indeed, then, Biddy, I am, and quite enough I've had, too, for one while.' here corney come and take my place and dennis deposited a penny in the little wooden dish by the piper's side by dad dennis said corney you'll sleep to-night anyways to look at you that's just what he won't then for it'll be morning before he's in bed and mary'll have too much to say to him when he is there to let him sleep never mind boys do you dance and i'll get myself a drink for i'm choked with the dust and here's mr thady why, Mr. Thady, why didn't you come in time for the supper, then? Just as Dennis McGovery gave over dancing, Thady entered the house, having anything but a wedding countenance. He had been, since the time we parted from him after his interview with Keegan, lying in the stable, smoking. He had eaten nothing, but had remained meditating over the different things which conspired to make his heart sad. His father's state, the impossibility of carrying on the war any longer against the enmity of Flannelly and Keegan, his own forlorn prospects, the insult and blow he had just received from the overbearing, heartless lawyer, but above all Feemy's condition, and his fears respecting her, were too much for him to bear. After his sister and usher had left Ballycloran, he had gone up to the house and had swallowed a couple of glasses of raw whiskey, to drive, as he said to himself, the sorrow out of his heart, and he had now come down to seek the friends whom Brady had recommended to him, and determined, at whatever cost, to revenge himself by their aid against Keegan, for the insults he had heaped upon him, and against Usher for the name which, he believed, he had put upon his sister. It was with these feelings and determinations that Thady had come down to McGovery's wedding, and, as he entered the room, Usher and Feemy were just standing up to dance. End of section 16. The Wedding, Part 2. Section 17 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 17. How the Wedding Party Was Concluded. Part 1. When Thady entered the room where the party was dancing, the welcomes with which he was greeted by McGovery and his wife prevented him from immediately seeking Pat Brady, as he had intended for he was obliged to stop to refuse the invitations and offers which he received that supper should be got for him and it was well for those that made the offers that he did refuse them for every vestige of what was eatable in the house had been devoured and had he acceded to mary's reiterated wishes that he would take just the last bit in the world it would have puzzled her to make good her offer in the most literal sense of the words Luckily, however, Thady declined her hospitality, and was passing through to the inner room, 
when he was stopped by usher who as we have before said was standing up to dance with feemy the last time the two young men had met was at the priest's house when it will be remembered thady had shown a resolution not to be on good terms with the captain and subsequent events had not at all mollified his temper so when usher good-humouredly asked him how he was and told him he wanted to speak to him a word or two as soon as he should have tired feemy dancing or what was more probable feemy should have tired him thady answered him surlily enough saying that if captain usher had anything to say to him he should be within but that he didn't mean to stay there all night and that perhaps captain usher had better say it at once well macdermot perhaps i had so if your sister will excuse me i won't be a minute just step to the door a moment will you and thady followed him out well captain usher what is it i don't know why it is macdermot but for the last two or three days you seem to want to quarrel with me if it is so why don't you speak out like a man is that what you were wanting to say to me indeed it was not for it's little i care whether you choose to quarrel or let it alone but i heard something to-night which though i don't wholly believe it may like enough be partly true and if you choose to listen i will tell you what it was perhaps you can tell me whether it was all false and if you cannot what i tell you may keep yourself out of a scrape well McGovery tells me that he thinks some of the boys that are here tonight are come to hold some secret meeting and that from the brothers of the two men i arrested the other day being in it he thinks their purpose is to revenge themselves on me and if it was so captain usher what have i to do with it usher looked very hard at thady's face but it was much too dark for him to see anything that was there probably not much yourself but i thought that as these men were your father's tenants you might feel unwilling that they should turn murderers and as i am your father's friend you might for his sake wish to prevent them murdering me and it is from what such a gaping fool as mcgovery says you have become afraid that men would murder you who never so much as raise their hand again any of those who are from day to day crushing and ruining them if i had been afraid i should not have come here indeed it was to show them that i am not afraid of coming among them without my own men at my back that i came here but though i am not afraid and though it is not what mcgovery says i mind and he is not such a fool as some others nevertheless i do think in fact from different sources i know that there is something going on through the country which will bring the poor into worse troubles than they've suffered yet and if as i much think they've come here to talk of their plans to-night and if you know that it is so you're foolish to be among them is that all you've to say to me captain usher not quite i wanted to ask you on your honour as a man and an irishman do you know whether there is any conspiracy among them to murder or do any injury to me usher paused for a moment and as thady did not answer him he went on and i wanted to warn you against one who is i know trying his best to ruin you and your father who is that captain usher i believe i know my own friends and my own enemies said thady who thought the revenue officer alluded to keegan answer my question first and suppose i don't choose to answer it why if you won't answer it i cannot but think you are aware of such a conspiracy and that you approve of it do you mean to say captain usher that i have conspired to murder you no i say no such thing but surely if you heard of such a scheme and thought there was such an intention in the country wouldn't you tell me or any one else that was so doomed that they might be on their guard you're very much frightened of a sudden captain that's not true macdermot you know i'm not frightened but will you answer the question thady was puzzled he did not know what to say exactly he had not absolutely heard that the men whom he was going to meet that night and whom he knew he meant to join intended to murder usher but brady had told him that they were determined to have a fling at him 
and it was by their promise to treat the attorney in the same way that thady had been induced to come down to them it had never struck him that he was going to join a body of men pledged to commit murder that he was to become a murderer and he was to become so that very night his feeling had been confined to the desire of revenging himself for the gross and palpable injuries with which he had been afflicted whilst endeavouring to do the best he could for his father his sister and his house but now confronted with usher asked by him as to the plots of the men whom he was on the point of joining and directly questioned as to their intentions by the very man he knew they were determined to destroy thady felt awed abashed and confused then it occurred to him that he had not at any rate as yet pledged himself to any such deed or even in his mind conceived the idea of such a deed that there was no cause why he should give his surmises respecting what he believed might be the intentions of others to the man whom of all others perhaps not excepting the lawyer he disliked and hated and that there could be no question why he should warn captain usher against danger though these things passed through thady's mind very quickly still he paused some time leaning against the corner of an outhouse till usher said well macdermot surely you'll not refuse to answer me such a question as that though god knows why we mayn't be friends you would not wish to have such ill as that happen to me i don't know why you should come to me captain usher to ask such questions if you were to ask your friends that you consort with in course they would feel more concerned in answering you than i can not that i want to have art or part in your blood or to have you murdered or anyone else but to tell you god's holy truth if you were out of the country entirely i would be better pleased as would be many others and since you are axing me i'll tell you captain usher that i do think the way you do be going on with the poor in this country driving and sazing them and having spies over them isn't such as is likely to make you friends in the country except with such as jonas brown and the like and though mind you i know nothing of plots and conspiracies among the boys i don't think you're over safe while staying among them you have been treating that way and if they were to shoot you some night it's no more than many would expect to tell you the truth then captain usher i think you'd be safer anywhere than at mohill thady considered that he thus made a just compromise between the faith he thought he owed to the men with whom he was going to leak himself and the duty which he could not but feel he ought to perform of warning usher of the danger in which he was placed usher felt quite satisfied with what thady had said he was not at all surprised at his expressions of personal dislike and he felt confident from the manner in which young macdermot had spoken of his perilous situation that even if any conspiracy had been formed of which he was the object there was no intention to put it into immediate operation and that at any rate in macdermot's opinion no concerted plan had yet been made to attack him a good many reasons also induced usher to think he stood in no danger of any personal assault in the first place though the country was in a lawless state though illicit distillation was carried to a great extent though many of the tenants refused to pay either rent tithes or county cesses till compelled to do so the disturbances arising from these causes had not lately led to murder or bloodshed he had carried on his official duties in the same manner for a considerable time without molestation and custom had begotten the feeling of security moreover he thought the poor were cowed and frightened he despised them too much to think they would have the spirit to rise up against him in fact he made up his mind that thady's intention was to frighten him out of the country if possible and he resolved that he would not allow anything he had heard on the subject either to disturb his comfort or actuate his conduct well macdermot that's fair and above board and what i expected though it's neither friendly nor flattering and i am not vexed with you for that for if you don't feel friendly to me you shouldn't speak as if you did and therefore i'm obliged to you and i will say that if i am to be shot down like a dog whilst performing my duty to the best of my ability at any rate 
I won't let the fear of such a thing frighten me out of my comfort before it happens and now if you'll let me say a word or two to you about yourself I'm much obliged to you captain Usher, but if you can take care of yourself so can I of myself Why how cranky you are man if you hate me hate me in God's name But don't be so absurd as to forget you're a man and to act like a child I listen to you and why can't you listen to me? Well speak on I'll listen Mind I don't pretend to know more of your affairs than you would wish me But as I am intimate with your father I cannot but see that you in managing your father's concerns put great confidence in the man within there What Pat Brady? Yes Brady now if you only employed him as any other farm servant He would not probably have much power to injure you but I believe he does more than that that he collects your rents and knows the affairs of all your tenants Well, I have very strong reason to think that he is also in the employment or at any rate in the pay of mr Keegan the attorney at Carrick What makes you think that captain Usher? I could hardly explain the different things which make me think so But I'm sure of it and it is for you to judge whether if such be the case your confidence will not enable him under the present state of affairs at Ballycloran to do you and your father much injury He is also to my certain knowledge joined in whatever societies all of them illegal are being formed in the country And he is a man therefore not to be trusted I may add also that if you listen too much to his advice and counsels You will be likely to find yourself in worse troubles than even those which your father's property brings on you Don't alarm yourself about me I don't be in the habit of taking a servant's advice about things captain Usher There's your back up again. I don't mean to offend you. I tell you however if you remember what I have said to you It may prevent much trouble to you and Usher walked into the house Prevent trouble soliloquized Thady. There is no way with me to prevent all manner of trouble I believe I'll go in and get a tumbler of punch and determined to adopt this mode of quieting troubles if he could not prevent them he followed usher usher was now dancing with feemy and the fun had become universal and incessant there were ten or twelve couples dancing on the earthen floor of mrs meehan's shop the piper was playing those provocative irish tunes which like the fiddle in the german tale compel the hearers to dance whether they wish it or no and they did dance with a rapidity and energy which showed itself in the streams of perspiration running down from the performers faces not much to their immediate comfort a huge fire was kept up on the hearth but the unnecessary heat thus produced was atoned for by the numerous glasses of punch with which they were thereby enabled to regale themselves when for a moment they relaxed their labors this pleasant recreation began also to show its agreeable effects in the increased intimacy of the partners and the spirit of the party all diffidence in standing up had ceased and now the only difficulty was for the aspirants to get room on which to make their complicated steps and oh the precision regularity and energy of those motions although the piper played with a rapidity which would have convinced the uninitiated of the impossibility of dancing to the time every foot in the room fell to the notes of the music as surely as though the movements of the whole set had been regulated by a steam machine and such movements as they were not only did the feet keep time but every limb and every muscle had each its own work and twisted shook and twirled itself in perfect unison and measure the arms performed their figure with as much accuracy as the legs take a sup of punch now miss tierney sure you're fainting away entirely for the want of a drop the lady addressed was wiping with the tail of her gown a face which showed the labor that had been necessary to perform the feat of dancing down the whole company to the tune of the wind that shakes the barley and was now leaning against the wall whilst her last partner was offering her punch made on the half and half system take a sup miss tierney then sure you're wantin it thank you mr kelly but i'm after taking a little just now and the head's not strong with me after dancing she took the tumbler however Faith, mr. Kelly, but it's yourself can make a tumbler of punch with any man 
deed then there's no spirits in it at all only a trifle to take the weakness off the water come miss tierney you didn't take what'd baptize a babby it'd be a big babby then one like yourself maybe here's long life to the first you have yourself anyway miss tierney and he finished the glass of which the blushing beauty had drunk half might a boy make a guess who'd be the father of it go easy now master morty the swain rejoiced in the name of mortimer kelly it'll be some quiet decent fellow that ain't given to chafing nor too fond of spirits by dad my darling and ain't that me to a hair's breadth is you a decent daisy boy sure if it ain't me where's such a one in the country at all and it's i'd be fond of the child and the child's mother more especial and he gave her a loving squeeze which in a less energetic society might have formed good ground for an action of violent assault ah oh, don't go easy i tell you morty but come ain't you gonna dance instead of wasting your time here all night and the pair reinvigorated by their intellectual and animal refreshment again commenced their dancing whilst the fun was going on fast and furious among the dancers those in the inner room were not less busily engaged brady was still sitting in the chair which he had occupied during the supper at the bottom of the table though he had turned round a little towards the fire at the further end of it thady was seated with a lighted pipe in his mouth and a tumbler of punch on the shelf over the fireplace joe reynolds was seated a little behind but between thady and pat brady and a lot of others were standing around or squatting on the end of the table leaning against the fireplace or sitting two on a chair wherever two had been lucky enough to secure one between them they were all drinking most of them raw spirits and all of them smoking at the other end of the room three or four boys and girls were standing in the doorway looking at the dancing and getting cool after their own performances and dennis mcgovery was sitting in the chair which father john had occupied with his head on the table apparently asleep but more probably intent on listening to what was going on among them at the other end of the room whom he so strongly suspected of some proposed iniquity the noise however of the music and the dancing the low tones in which the suspected parties spoke and the distance at which they sat must have made dennis's occupation of eavesdropping difficult if not impracticable thady had just been speaking and it was evident from the thickness of his voice that the whisky he had drunk was beginning to have its effects on him instead of eating his dinner he had been drinking raw spirits in the morning to which he was not accustomed for though when cold or when pressed by others he could swallow a glass of raw whisky with that facility which seems to indicate an iron throttle he had been too little accustomed to give way to any temptation to become habitually a drunkard now however he was certainly becoming tipsy and therefore more likely to agree to whatever those around him might propose aisy mr thady said pat there's that long-eared ruffian mcgovery listening to every word he can catch be spaking now as if you were axing the boys about the rint and isn't that about what he is axing asked joe but how can he get the rint or we be paying it unless he gives us his hand to rid the country of them as robs us of our mains and destroys him and us and all them as should be friends to him and the old master and to ballycloran you know all of ye that i never was hard on you continued thady when god knows the money was wanted bad enough at ballycloran you know i've waited longer for what was owed than many a one has done who has never felt what it was to want a pound did i ever pull the roof off any of you and though queer tenants you've most of you been ain't the same set on the land now mostly that was there four years ago there's none of you can call me a hard man i think and when i've stuck to you so long it isn't now i'll break away from you long life to you mr thady long life to your honour and may ye live to see the estate your own yet and not owe a shilling it's true for the master what he says why should he turn again his own now god bless him such were the exclamations with which thady's last speech was received and i'll tell you what it is and he now spoke in a low thick whisper i'll tell you what's on my mind 
those that you hate i don't love a bit too well you all know hyacinth keegan i think deed we do may the big devil fetch him home well then would you like him for your landlord out and out such a fine gentleman as he is blast him for a gentleman said joe i'd sooner have his father he were an honest man more by token he were no protestant he served processes for richard payton up by loch allen well then continued thady if you don't like him boys i can tell you he don't like you a bit better and if he can contrive to call himself master of ballycloran as i can tell you he means to try it's not one of you he'll have on the land End of section 17 how the wedding party was concluded part 1section 18 of the mcdermott's of ballycloran this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lynn thompson the mcdermott's of ballycloran by anthony trollope section 18 how the wedding party was concluded part 2 did he tell you that himself mr thady whispered brady now though young mcdermott was nearly drunk quite drunk enough to have lost what little good sense was left to him after being fool enough to come at all among those with whom he was at present drinking still what usher had said about his follower was not forgotten and though he did not absolutely believe that brady was a creature of keegan's what he had heard prevented his having the same inclination to listen to pat or the same confidence in what he said faith then he told me so much with his own mouth and it isn't only the others would be going but you'd have to walk yourself master pat and why wouldn't i do you think i'd be staying at ballycloran after you were gone mr thady don't be making any vows pat maybe you wouldn't be at and maybe av you were you wouldn't refuse to eat your bread though it were keegan paid for it that the first mouthful may choke me that i ever ate of his paying for well however boys hyacinth keegan will strip the roof off every mother's son of you if he ever contrives to put his foot in ballycloran but by god he never shall mind boys he can never do that till he can lay his hands on the old man and where'll you all be i wonder to let him or any one he sends do that or take a sod of turf or a grain of oats off the land either by dad you're right mr thady said one of them sure wouldn't we have him in a bog hole or as many as he'd send and then they might take away that they could carry in their mouths i'll tell you what sir said joe reynolds and he laid his hand on thady's knee and leant forward till his mouth was near the young man's ear so near that not only could not mcgovery overhear his words but of the whole party round the fire only brady and byrne besides thady himself could catch what he said i'll tell you what sir keegan shall never harm you or yours if you'll be one of us one of us heart and soul and i know you will and i know it's not in you to put up with what they're putting on you and dearly he'll pay for the blow he strike you and the word he said surely mr thady and he whispered still lower into his ear let alone the estate and the house and all that you'd never put up with what he has been about this day paceable and in quiet you're true in that joe by gee well then won't we see you righted let the bloody ruffian come to ballycloran and then we'll see the way he'll go back again to carrick will you say the word mr thady will you join us agin them that is as much and a deal more agin you than they are agin us what is it you mean to do that's what you'll know when you've joined us but you know it isn't now or here we'll be telling you that which maybe will put our necks in your hand but when you've taken the oath we've all taken we'll be ready then not only to tell you all but follow you anywhere the young man paused isn't it enough for you to know that our enemies is your enemies that them you wishes ill to we wishes ill to isn't keegan the man you've most cause to hate and won't we write you with him don't we hate that bloody captain that is this moment playing his villain's tricks 
with your own sister in the next room there and sure you can't feel very friendly to him by the holy virgin when you're one of us it's not much longer he shall trouble you if you can put up with what the likes of them is doing to you if you can bear all that why mr thady you're not the man i took you for but mind divil a penny of rent'll ever go to ballycloran again from drumleash for the matter's up now you're either our friend or our enemy but if mr thady you've the pluck they all says you have and which i ever see in you god bless you it's not only one of us you'll be but the head of us all for there isn't one but'll go to hell's gate for your word and then the first tenant on the place that pays as much as a timpany to keegan or to any but just yourself by the cross he may dig his own grave what thady immediately said does not much signify before long he had promised to come over to mrs mulready's at mohill with pat brady on an appointed night there to take the oath of the party to whom he now belonged though it was agreed that the secret determinations of the party were not to be divulged to him until he had joined them there it nevertheless was pretty clearly declared that their immediate and chief object was the destruction of usher and if possible the liberation of the three men who had lately been confined in ballinamore bridewell for the malt that had been seized in the cabin by loch sheen however to prevent the evil arising from this carelessness in the performance of their duties as conspirators thady was requested to swear on a cross made with the handles of two knives that he would not divulge anything that had occurred or been said in that room that night with which request he complied by the time this was done most of them were drunk but none were so drunk as poor macdermot his intoxication moreover was unfortunately not of that sort which was likely to end in quiescence and incapability it was a sign of the great degradation to which macdermot had submitted in joining these men that in talking over the injuries which usher had inflicted on them all he had quietly heard them canvass usher's conduct to his sister and that in no measured terms this had gone much against the grain with him at first because he could not but strongly feel that in abusing usher they were equally reproaching feemy but the fall of high and fine feelings when once commenced is soon accomplished even when the fall is from a higher dignity than those of thady's had ever reached and though a few hours since he would have allowed no one but father john even to connect his sister's name with usher he had soon accustomed himself to hear the poorest tenant on his father's property speak familiarly on the subject when urging him to join them in common cause against his enemy but though he had so far sacrificed his sister's dignity in his drunken conversation with these men he was not the less indignant with the man whose name they had so unceremoniously joined with hers and he got up with the resolution to inform usher that the intercourse between him and feemy must immediately cease the spirits he had taken gave him a false feeling of confidence that he should find means to carry his resolution into effect without delay when he got into the outer room usher and feemy were not there the dancing and drinking were going on as fast as ever shameth the piper was in the same seat with probably not the same tumbler of punch beside him and was fingering away at his pipes as if the feeling of fatigue was unknown to him and mary the bride was still dancing as though her heart had not been broken all the morning with the work she had had to do biddy also the ballycloran housemaid was in the seventh heaven of happiness for hadn't she music and punch galore and though the glory of her once well starched cap was dimmed if not totally extinguished by the dust and heat her heart was now too warm with the fun to grieve for that especially when such a neat made boy as barney egan was dancing for an her it did not however add to her happiness when after being addressed once or twice in vain she heard her young master's voice biddy you hear and be deed you is your mistress gone home deed mr thady i think she be and why the devil then ain't you gone with her do you mean to be dancing here all night now thady was in general so very unobservant so little inclined to interfere with if he could not promote the amusements of his dependents moreover so unaccustomed to scold 
that biddy and the others round her soon saw that something was the matter what you staring at your born fool if miss feemy's gone up to ballycloran you follow her thady's thick voice red face and sparkling eyes showed that he was intoxicated and biddy if not preparing to obey him for the temptation to stay was too strong was preparing to pretend to do so when mary mcgovery by way of allaying mcdermott's wrath said i don't believe then mr thady that miss feemy's gone home at all at all i think she and the captain is only walked down the lane a bit just to call themselves for sure it's hot work dancing thady did not stop to ask any more questions but hurried out of the door and turning away from ballycloran walked as fast as his unsteady legs would carry him towards mohill and unfortunately usher and feemy were strolling down the lane in that direction when pat brady saw mcdermott hurry out of the house he said to his sister be gab mary you'd better hurry down the lane if captain usher and miss feemy is in it just to take care of her for he and the master'll have a great fight of it this night the master's blood's up and the two'll be slating one another afore they're parted goodness gracious exclaimed mary why don't you go yourself pat mr thady's taken a drop and maybe he'll be hurting miss feemy or the captain dennis dear her husband came in the room just then there's a ruction between the captain and mr thady in god's name go and bring away miss feemy usher and feemy had not been out of the house many minutes it was a beautiful mild moonlight night in october and as the girl had said they had come out to cool themselves after the heat and noise and dirt of the room in which they had been dancing miles was in one of his best humours he had persuaded himself that he had no real danger to fear from the men who as he was told were so hostile to him Feemy too had looked very pretty and nice and had not contradicted him and Whereas what Thady had drunk had made him cross Usher had only just had enough to make him good-humored Feemy too was very happy she had contrived to forget her brother's croaking and father John's warning or at least the misery which they had occasioned her and was very happy in usher's good humor it were bootless to repeat their conversation or to tell how often it was interrupted by some unchided caress on the part of usher feemy however had not forgotten her resolution and was bringing up all her courage to make some gentle hint to miles on the subject of which she had promised father john to speak to him when her heart sunk within her on hearing her brother's voice calling to her from behind good heavens miles there's thady what can he be wanting here usher's arm fell from the fair girl's waist as he answered never fear dear don't you speak to him leave him to me by this time thady had nearly joined them is that you feemy here at this hour what the dear you doing here this time of night here take my arm and come home it's time you had someone to mind you i'm thinking feemy saw that her brother was intoxicated and was frightened she turned though she did not take his arm and usher turned too your sister's not alone mcdermott as i'm with her i don't think you can have much cause to fear because she is about a mile from ballycloran may be captain usher your being with her mayn't make her much safer at any rate you'll let me manage my own affairs i suppose i can take my sister to her own home without your interference and he took hold of his sister's arm as if to drag it within his own good heavens thady what are you after sure ain't i walking with you don't be dragging me it appears to me macdermot said usher that though your sister was in want of no protector before you came she is in great want of one now she wanted it then and she wants it now and will do so as long as she's fool enough to put herself in the way of such as you by g as long as i'm with her she shall have it and he dragged her along by the arm but thady said the poor girl afraid both of her brother and her lover and hardly knowing to which to address herself but thady you're hurting me and i'll walk with you quiet enough i was only getting a little cool after the dancing and what's the great harm in that well there and he let her go i'm not hurting you now it's very tender you've got of a sudden when i touch you captain usher if you're pleased to go on or stay behind i'll be obliged for i want to speak to feemy and there's no occasion in life for my troubling you to hear what i've to say 
you can say what you like mcdermott but i shan't leave you for though feemy's your sister you're not fit to guide her or yourself either for you're drunk and there you lie captain usher you lie that's what you're used to but it's the last of your lies she'll hear ah you're drunk replied usher besides you know i'd not notice what you'd say before your sister if however you're not so very drunk as to forget what you've called me tomorrow morning and would then like to repeat it i'll thrash you as you deserve then by jesus you'll have your wish you asked me to-night if i had a mind to quarrel with you and now i'll tell you if i find you at ballycloran scheming again you'll find me ready and willing enough that's where you'll find me tomorrow morning then for i'll certainly come to ask your sister how she is after the brutal manner you frightened her this night and then perhaps you'll have the goodness to tell me what you mean by what you call scheming i'll tell you now then it's scheming to be coming with your lies and your blarney after a girl like feemy only meaning to deceive her it's scheming to go about humbugging a poor silly old man like my father and it's the height of scheming and blackguardness to pretend to be so friendly to a family when you know your men in them all the harm in your power to do but you'll find my fine captain it ain't so easy to play your tricks at ballycloran as you think though we are so poor Feemy, when the young men had begun to use hard words to one another had commenced crying and was now sobbing away at a desperate rate don't distress yourself Feemy," said usher your brother will be more himself tomorrow morning he'll be sorry for what he has said then and if he is so i'm not the man to remember what one says when they've taken a little too much punch they had now come near enough to mrs mehan's to see that there were a number of people outside the door as soon after thady's departure as dennis mcgovery and the rest had been able to make up their minds what it would be the best to do in the emergency of the case dennis and his wife sallied forth the former to carry home whichever of the combatants might be slaughtered in the battle and mary to give feemy what comfort and assistance might be in her power pat brady prudently thought that under all circumstances it would be safest for him to remain where he was the married pair however bent on peace if possible and if not on assuaging the horrors of war had barely got into the road when they encountered father john returning to the wedding party oh if it's your reverence's welcome again this blessed evening god be praised that sent you for it's yourself will be wanted i'm afeard and that immediately it was some time before the priest could learn what was the matter at last he discovered that usher and feemy had gone out walking that thady had got drunk and had gone after them and he was inquiring whether he had gone towards mohill or towards ballycloran which none of them knew when the three came in sight father john instantly walked up to them and if he had learnt it from nothing else soon discovered from feemy's tears that something was the matter how are you thady he said putting out his hand to take the young man's which was given with apparent reluctance how are you is there anything wrong that feemy is crying so oh you know father john there's a d deal wrong and i've just told the captain what it is that's all i'll not have the girl humbugged any longer that's all there must be a great deal wrong thady when you've cursed that way before me i can't be picking my words now for priest or parson they were now surrounded by the whole crowd out of the house who were staring and gaping and absolutely shocked at thady's impudence to his friend and priest feemy was sobbing and on usher offering her his arm to take her from the crowd took it by gee exclaimed thady if you touch that ruffian's arm again i'll never call you sister or shall you ever call me brother so now choose betwixt us feemy dropped her hand from usher's arm but turning to the priest she said for heaven's sake take him away father john he's drunk drunk or sober you may choose now it's either me or him but if you disgrace yourself you shall not disgrace me father john took feemy's arm on his and telling the people to go back to their dancing laid his hand on thady's shoulder and said at any rate thady come a little out of this if you must speak to your sister in that way you don't wish all the parish to hear what you're saying what matters father john what matters sure they've all heard too much already 
don't they all say she's the blackguard's mistress oh thady how can you repeat that word of me sobbed the poor girl why did you let them say it why don't you tell the man that's blackening your name while he's disaving you to be laving you now and not following you through the country like a curse by this time the whole party consisting of father john the two young men and feemy were walking on rapidly towards ballycloran feemy was crying but saying nothing usher was silent although thady was heaping on him every term of abuse he could think of and father john was in vain attempting to moderate his wrath thus they continued until they came to the avenue leading up to the house and on usher's proceeding with them through the gate thady put himself in the way stopping him you'll not come a step in here captain if i know it you might follow us along the road for i couldn't help it but by gee you don't come in here nonsense man do you think i'll stop out for a drunken man's riot let me pass set a foot in here you blackguard and i'll stretch you thady had an alpine in his hand and was preparing to strike a blow at the captain exactly on the spot where keegan had struck him when the priest pushed his burly body in between them i'll have no blows boys at any rate while i'm with you put your stick down thady and he forced the young man's stick down run up to the house feemy and get to bed i'll see you in the morning feemy however did not move now captain usher i am not saying a word on the matter one way or the other for i don't well know how the quarrel began but do you think it's well to be forcing your way in here when the master desires you not but mr mcgrath i've yet to learn that this drunken fellow is master here besides i suppose it is not a part of his project to rob me of my horse which is in his father's stable thady was at length persuaded to allow usher to go to the stables for his horse and the captain after what had passed did not now wish to go into the house he was however going up to feemy to shake hands with her when the priest caught him by the arm saying why would you anger a drunken man and that too when the feeling in his heart is right i'll tell you what captain if what that young man fears is true you're almost as much worse than him as vice is than virtue spare me your sermon now father john if i see you to-morrow i'll hear it in patience and he galloped down the avenue thady and feemy went into the house and we hope each got to bed without further words and father john walked slowly home thinking of all the misery he saw in store for his parishioners at ballycloran end of section eighteen how the wedding party was concluded part two section nineteen of the mcdermott's of ballycloran this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 19. Dennis McGovery's Tidings. Chapter 14. Dennis McGovery's Tidings. As soon as he had finished his breakfast on the morning after the night's events just recorded, Father John took his hat and stick and walked down to Drumsna, still charitably intent on finding some means to soften, if he could not avert, the storm which he saw must follow the scenes he had witnessed on the previous evening. Usher would have considered it one of pluck to stay away because Thaddy had told him to do so. Feeney also would encourage his visits, and would lean more to her lover than her brother, especially as her father if it were attempted to make him aware of the state of the case, would be sure to take Feeney's part. Father John felt it would be impossible to induce the old man to desire Usher to discontinue his visits, and he was confident that unless he did so, the captain would take advantage of the unfortunate state of affairs at Ballycloran and consider himself as an invited guest, in spite of the efforts that he might make to induce him to leave it. But what the priest most feared was, that the unfortunate girl would be induced to go off with her lover, who he knew under such circumstances would never marry her, and his present object was to take her out of the way of such temptation. Father John gave Feemy credit for principles and feelings sufficiently high to prevent her from falling immediately into vice, but he at the same time feared 
that with the strong influence Usher had over her, he might easily persuade her to leave her home, partly by promising at some early time to marry her, and partly by threatening her with desertion. He thought that if she were at present domiciled at Miss McCann's, Usher might then be brought to hear reason, and be made to understand that, if he was not contented to propose for and marry Feeney in a proper decent manner, he must altogether drop her acquaintance. He was not far wrong in the estimate he formed of both their characters. Though Usher loved Feemy, perhaps as well as he was ever likely to love any woman, circumstances might easily have induced him to give her up. It was the impediments in the way and the opposition he now met with, which would give the affair a fresh interest in his eyes. He certainly did not intend to marry the poor girl. Had she had sufficient tact, she might perhaps have persuaded him to do so. But her fervent love and perfect confidence, though very gratifying to his vanity, did not inspire him with that feeling of respect which any man would wish to have for the girl he was going to marry. I do not say that his premeditated object had been to persuade her to leave home, but Father John was not far wrong in fearing that unless steps were taken to prevent it, it would be the most probable termination of the whole affair. With regard to Feemy, he was quite right in thinking that her love of Usher was strong enough to induce her to take almost any step that he might desire, and that that love joined to her own obstinacy and determined resistance to the advice of those to whom she should have listened was such as to render it most unlikely that she should be induced to give him up. But though he so well understood the weakness of her character, he was not aware of, for he had no opportunity of trying, its strength. As long as Feemy had her own way, as at the present time she had, she would, as we have seen, yield entirely to her strong love. But this was not all. Had circumstances enabled her friends to remove her entirely out of Usher's way, and had they done so, her love would have remained the same. Her passion was so strong that it could not be weakened or strengthened by absence or opposition. When Father John calculated that by good management, Usher might be brought to relinquish Feemy, he was right, but he was far from right when he thought that Feemy could be taught to forget him. She literally cared for no one but him. Her life had been so dull before she knew him, and so full of interest since. He so nearly came up to her beau ideal of what a man should be, for she had seen, or at any rate had known, no better. He so greatly excelled her brother and father, and was so much better looking than young Cassidy, and so much more spirited than Frank McCann, that to her young heart he was all perfection. She had lately been vexed, tormented, and even frightened, but her fear was merely that Usher did not love her as she did him, that he might be made to leave her, and she was learning to hate her brother for opposing, as she would have said, the only source of her happiness. As to being induced by prudence or propriety to be cool to her lover, as to taking the first step herself towards making a breach between them, Nothing that her brother or the priest had said, nothing that they could ever say, could either make her think of doing so, or think that it would be advisable, or in any way proper that she should do so. For this strong feeling Father John did not give our heroine credit, but he still felt that she was headstrong enough to make it very difficult task for him to manage her in any way, but as his charity was unbounded, so were his zeal and courage great. His present plan was to induce his friend, Mrs. McCann, to ask Feemy to come over and spend some time with her and her daughters at Drumsna. There were difficulties in this, for in the first place, although Feemy and the Miss McCanns had been very good friends, still the reports, which had lately been afloat, both about her and the affairs of her family, might make Miss McCann a prudent woman unwilling to comply with the priest's wishes, though indeed it was not often that she contradicted him in anything. Then, after he had talked Mrs. McCain over, when he had aroused her charitable feelings and excited the good nature, which, to tell the truth, was never very dormant in her bosom, he had the more difficult task of persuading Feemy to accept the invitation. Not that under ordinary circumstances she would not be willing enough to go to Mrs. McCain's, but at present she would be likely to suspect a double meaning in everything. Father John had already mentioned Mrs. McCain's name to her, in reference to her attachment to Usher, and it was more than probable that if he now brought her an invitation from that lady, she would perceive that the object was to separate her from her lover, 
and that she would obstinately persist in remaining at Ballycloran. As Father John was entering Drumsna, he met his curate Cullen and McGovery, who, considering that he had only been married the evening before, and that if he had not been dancing himself he had been kept up by his guests doing so till four or five in the morning, had left his bride rather early, for according to custom he had slept the first night after his wedding at his wife's house, and though it was only ten o'clock he had been on a visit to Father Cullen, with whom he was now eagerly talking. On the previous evening, when feigning to be asleep, he had managed to overhear a small portion of what had passed between Fatty, Joe Reynolds, and the rest. But what he had overheard had reference solely to Keegan, for when they began to speak of Usher, everything had been said in so low a voice that he had been unable to comprehend a word. He had contrived, however, to pick up something in which Ballycloran, Rents, Keegan, and a bog hole were introduced in marvelous close connection, and he was not slow in coming to the determination that he had been wrong when he fancied that Usher was the object against whom the plots were being formed, and that Keegan was the doomed man. But what was worse still, he was led to imagine that the perpetrators of Mr. Keegan's future watery grave were instigated by young McDermott. He was well aware that Flannelly and Keegan, for they were all one, had the greater portion of the rents out of Ballycloran. But he now plainly saw that the more active of this firm was to be made away with while collecting or attempting to collect the rent. Dennis was puzzled as to what he should do. His conscience would not allow the man to be murdered without his interference. He had no great love for Mr. Keegan, and his sympathies were not more strongly excited than they had been when he thought Usher was to be the victim. Should he tell Mr. Keegan? That would be setting the devil in arms against his wife's brother, against his wife's brother's master, and against his wife's brother's master's tenants. This was too near cutting his own throat to be a line of action agreeable to Dennis. Then it occurred to him to have recourse again to Father John. But Father John had made light of his former warning. Besides, the fact of his having been wrong in his last surmises would have thrown stronger doubts on those he now entertained. Father John, too, was always quizzing him, and Dennis did not like to be quizzed. After much consideration, McGovery resolved to go to Father Cullen and disclose his secret to him. Father Cullen was a modest, steady man, and would neither make light of or ridicule what he heard. And if after that Keegan was drowned in a bog hole, it would be entirely off Dennis's conscience. When Father John met the pair, they had just been discussing the subject. Cullen was far from making light of it, for in the first place he believed every word McGovery told him, and in the next he was shocked and greatly grieved that one of his own parishioners, and one also the most respectable of them, should be concerned in such a business. He felt towards Keegan all the abhorrence which a very bigoted and ignorant Roman Catholic could feel towards a Protestant convert, but he would have done anything to prevent his meeting his death by the hands or with the connivance of Thaddy McDermott. As soon as Cullen had heard McGovery's statement, which, by the by, had been made without any reference to his previous statement to Father John or his warning to Captain Usher, he determined to tell it all to the parish priest and to take McGovery with him. His plan did not, however, suit Dennis at all, and he used all his eloquence to persuade Father Cullen that if he told Mr. McGrath at all, he, Dennis, had better not make one of the party and he was at the moment considering what excuse he could give for refusing to go into the priest's cottage when they met Father John on the road, coming into Drumsna. Dennis was greatly disconcerted, but Cullen, full of his news and as eager to communicate it as if it had been arranged definitely that Keegan was to be put into the bog hall at noon precisely, was very glad to see him and instantly opened his budget. "'I'm very glad to meet you this morning, Mr. McGrath,' he began." and it's well since you're out so early that it's not the other way you went, for I'd been greatly bothered if I hadn't found you. But here I am, you see, and if it was only after me you were going, I suppose you can turn, for I'm going to Drumsna. Oh, to be sure I can. Don't you be going, Dennis McGovery. Dennis had taken off his hat, and muttering something about his wife, and good morning, your reverence, was decamping towards Ballycloran. Why, man, said Father John, what business have you so far from your wife at this hour of the morning after your wedding? Have you been to take the two pigs home? Ha <laughs> ha, Father John, you'll never have done with them pigs, but the wife will be waiting for me, and as your reverence says, I mustn't be balking her the first morning. Stay a while, as you've come so far without her, you can stop a moment. 
Oh, yes, said Cullen. Wait till you've told Mr. McGrath what you told me. Dennis was unwillingly obliged to remain and repeat to Father John the whole story he had told Cullen. Though he could hardly tell why himself, he softened down a little the strong assurance he had given Cullen that Thaddy himself had been urging the boys to make away with Keegan. Father John listened to all in silence till Dennis ended by wishing that the two young men got home safe last night and that there were nothing worse nor harder than words betwixt them. Get home safe, you fool, answered Father John. And why wouldn't they? Don't you know the difference yet between a few foolish words said in half fun and a quarrel? To be sure they got home safe. And let me tell you, Dennis, for a sensible fellow as you pretend to be, you'd be a deal better employed minding your business than thinking of other people's quarrels or trying to pick up stories of murders and heaven knows what, filling your own mind and other people's too with foolish fears for which there are no grounds. And now if you take my advice, you'll go home and leave your betters to take care of themselves, for you'll find it quite enough to take care of yourself. And mine, McGovery, if I find this cock-and-bull story of yours gets through the country so as to reach Mr. McKeegan's ears or to annoy Mr. McDermott, I shall know where it came from, and perhaps you're not aware that a person inventing such a story as you've been telling Mr. Cullen might soon find himself in Carrick jail. It would be impossible to say whether Cullen was the most astonished or McGovery disconcerted by Father John's address. But, began Cullen, if the man really heard the plan proposed, Mr. McGrath, and if Mr. Thaddy was one of them, ah, nonsense, Cullen. But I haven't invented a word, Father John, said McGovery. I heard it every word, and sure, after hearing it all with my own ears, I was to let the man be shot in a bog hole without saying a word to no one about it, Father John? Ah, you're a nice boy, Dennis, and why did you pass my gate to come all the way down to Father Cullen to tell the him the dreadful tale? Why didn't you come to me when you knew not only that I was nearer you than Mr. McCullen, but also nearer to the place where all this was to happen? Why then, Father John, not to tell you a lie, it's because you do be going on with your gagging at me so. Nonsense, man. How can you say you're not going to lie when you know you've a lie in your mouth at this moment? Sorrow a lie is there in it all, Father John. I wish the tongue of me had been blistered this morning before I said a word of it. I wish it had been. Why, Colin, it was only last night that he wanted to persuade me that a lot of boys were to meet at the place where he was married to agree to murder Usher. And to hear the man, you'd think it was all arranged, who was to strike the blow and all. And now here he is with you, with a similar story about Keegan. He was afraid to come to me because he knew he'd have to humbug me with his other story last night. But I tell you, Father John, I heard it with my own ears this time. And I tell you, you were dreaming. Do you think you'd make me believe that such a young gentleman as Mr. Thaddy would turn murderer all of a sudden? Now go home and take my advice. If you don't want to find yourself in a worse scrape than Captain Usher or Mr. Keegan, don't repeat such a tale as that to anyone. McGovery sneaked off with his tail, allegorically speaking, between his legs. He didn't exactly know what to make of it, for though, as has been before said, he did not wish on this occasion to make Father John the depository of his fears, he did not expect even from him to meet with such total discomfiture. He consoled himself, however, with the recollection that if anything did happen now, either to the revenue officer or the attorney, and he almost hoped there would, he could fairly say that he had given warning and premonitory tidings of it to the parish priest, which, if attended to, might have prevented all harm. With this comfortable feeling to atone for Father John's displeasure, and now, not quite sure whether he had overheard any allusion last night to Keegan and a bog hole or not, he returned to his wife. As soon as he was gone, Cullen, as much surprised as McGovery at the manner in which Father John had received the story, asked him if he thought it was all a lie. Perhaps not a lie, answered the priest. Perhaps he heard something about Keegan, not very flattering to the attorney. No doubt Thaddy was asking the boys about the rent and threatening them with Keegan as a receiver over the property or something of that sort. And very likely one of those boys from Drumsley said something about a bog hole, which maybe Thaddy didn't reprove as he ought to have done. I've no doubt it all came about in that way, but the fellow with his tales and his stories will get his ears cut off some of these days and serve him right. Why, he wanted yesterday to make me believe that these fellows, who are to drown Keegan this morning, were to shoot Usher last night. 
He's dressed the fellow to do more harm in the country than all the stills, if he were listened to. Well, Cullen, good day. I'm going into Mr. McKeon's here. And Cullen went away, quite satisfied with Father John's view of the affair. Not so, Father John. For Thaddy's sake, to screen his character, and because he did not think there was any immediate danger, he had given the affair the turn which it had just taken. But he himself feared, more than feared, felt sure that there was too much truth in what the man had said. Thaddy's unusual intoxication last night, his brutal conduct to his sister, to Usher, and to himself, the young man with whom he had been drinking, his own knowledge of the feeling the young man entertained towards Keegan, and the hatred the tenants felt for the attorney, all these things conspired to convince Father John that McGovery had too surely overheard a conversation, which, if repeated to Keegan, might probably, considering how many had been present at it, give him a desperate hold over young McDermott, which he would not fail to use, either by frightening him into measures destructive to the property, or by proceeding criminally against him. Father John was not only greatly grieved that such a meeting should have been held, with reference to its immediate consequences, but he was shocked that Thaddy should so far have forgotten himself in his duty as to have attended it. But with the unceasing charity which made the great beauty of Father John's character, he in his heart instantly made allowances for him. He remembered all his distress and misery, his want of friends, his grief for his sister, his continued attempts and continued inability to relieve his father from his difficulties, and he determined to endeavor to screen him. His success with McGovery, whom he had made to disbelieve his own senses, and with Cullen, who was ready enough to take his superior's views in any secular affair, had been complete, and he did not think that either would now be likely to repeat the story in a manner that would do any injury. We shall, in a short time, see what steps he took in the matter with Thaddy himself. In the meanwhile, we will follow him into Mrs. McCain's house, at whose door he had now arrived. End of section 19. Dennis McGovery's Tidings. Section 20 of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The McDermott's of Ballycloran by Anthony Trollope. Section 20. The McEwans, Part 1. When Father John opened the wicket gate leading into the small garden which separated Mrs. McEwen's house from the street, he saw her husband standing in the open doorway, ruminating. Mr. McEwen was said to be a comfortable man, and he looked to be so. He was something between forty-five and fifty, about six feet too high, with a good-humoured red face. He was inclined to be corpulent, and would no doubt have followed his inclination, had he not accustomed himself to continual bodily activity. He was a great eater, and a very great drinker. It is said he could put any man in Connaught under the table, and carry himself to bed sober. At any rate, he was never seen drunk, and it was known that he had often taken fifteen tumblers of punch after dinner, and rumour told of certain times when he had made up and exceeded the score. He was comfortable in means as well as in appearance. Though Mr. McEwen had no property of his own, he was much better off than many around him that had. He had a large farm on a profitable lease. He underlet a good deal of land by Conacre, or Cornacre. Few of my English readers will understand the complicated misery to the poorest of the Irish which this accursed word embraces. He took contracts for making and repairing roads and bridges, and altogether he contrived to live very well on his ways and means. Although a very hard-working man, he was a bit of a sportsman, and usually kept one or two well-trained horses, which, as he was too heavy to ride them himself, he was always willing, and usually able, to sell at remunerating prices. He was considered a very good hand at a handicap, 
and understood well no one better the dangerous mysteries of knocking he was sure to have some animal to run at the different steeple chases in the neighborhood and it was generally supposed that even when not winning his race tony McEwen seldom lost much by attending the meeting there was now going to be a steeple chase at carrick on shannon in a few days and McEwen was much intent on bringing his mare playful a wicked devil within twenty yards of whom no one but himself and groom could come into the field in fine order and condition in addition to this mr McEwen was a very hospitable man his only failing in that respect being his firm determination and usual practice to make every man that dined with him drunk he was honest in everything barring horseflesh was a good catholic and very fond of his daughters louis and lydia his wife was a kind good easy creature fond of the world and the world's goods and yet not selfish or niggardly with those with which she was blessed she was sufficiently contented with her husband whose friends never came out of the dining-room after dinner and therefore did not annoy her she looked on his foibles with a lenient eye for she had been accustomed to such all her life and when she heard he had parted with her car in a handicap or had lost her two fat pigs in a knock she bore it with great good humor she was always willing to procure amusement for her daughters and was beginning to feel anxious to get them husbands she was a good neighbor and if she had a strong feeling at all it was her partiality for father john her daughters had nothing very remarkable about them to recommend them to our attention they were both rather pretty tolerably well educated to the extent of a two years sojourn in a convent in sligo were both very fond of novels dancing ribbons and potato cakes and both thought that to dance at a race ball with an officer in his regimentals was the most supreme terrestrial blessing of which their lot was susceptible we have however kept the father too long standing at his own door while we have been describing his family well father john said McEwen, how are you this morning why then as luckily i didn't dine with you mr McEwen. i'm pretty much as i usually am and thank god that's well i'm told you had those poor fellows that were with you last night laid on a mattress and that you sent them home that way to carrick in a country car and that they couldn't move leaving this at six this morning oh nonsense father john who was telling you them lies but wasn't it true didn't they go home on one of the cars off the farm and young michael driving them and they on a mattress and sure father john you wouldn't have had me let them walk home to carrick after dinner they were little fit for walking i believe why they couldn't so much as sit up in the car will you never have done mr McEwen? don't you know the sin of drunkenness the sin of drunkenness me know it indeed i don't then when did you ever see me drunk come which was a case last father john you or i god forgive me but i believe some boys did make me rather tipsy the first day i ever was in france and my head should have been full of other things and i believe if you were to swim in punch it wouldn't hurt you but you know as well as i can tell you it's worse for you to be making others drink so much who can't bear it as you can than if you were hurting yourself and you know as well as i can tell you that yourself would be the last man to take the whiskey off the table as long as the lads that you were with chose to be drinking it and i think when i sent them boys off to carrick as comfortably asleep as if they were in bed so that they wouldn't be too late at business this morning i acted by them as i'd wish anybody to act by me if i had an accident and if that ain't been a good christian i don't know what is so leave off preaching father john and come round to the stables till i show you the mare that'll win at carrick at least it'll be a very good nag that'll take the shine out of her i hope you'll win mr McEwen, in spite of your villainy in making those young fellows drunk but i'll not look at the mare just at present more by token i'm told she's not very civil to morning visitors ah nonsense man she's as quiet a mare as ever went over a fence when she's well handled but you see i can't handle her well 
and as i want to see the good woman that owns you if you please i'll go into the house instead of into the stable well every man to his choice and i'll see playful get her gallop but i'll tell you what father john if you don't mind what you're after with mrs McEwen, i'll treat you a deal worse than i did with those two fellows i sent home to carrick on a mattress so mr McEwen walked off to superintend the training of his mare and the priest in spite of the marital caution he had received walked into the dining-room where he knew that at that hour he should probably find the mother and daughters surrounded by their household cares when the usual greetings were over and the two girls had asked all the particulars of mary brady's wedding and mrs McEwen had got through her usual gossip father john warily began the subject respecting which he was so anxious to rouse his friend's soft sympathies as mrs McEwen had gone so far herself as to ask him whether anything had been settled yet at ballycloran about usher and whether he thought that the young man really intended to marry the girl the way this question was asked was a great damper to father john's hopes if there had been any kindly feelings towards poor Feemy at the moment in her breast she would have called her by her name and not spoken of her as the girl it showed that mrs McEwen was losing or had lost whatever good opinion she might ever have had of Feemy and when louis ill-naturedly added oh laws not he the man never thought of her father john felt sure that there was a slight feeling of triumph among the female McEwens at the idea of Feemy's losing the lover of whom perhaps she had been somewhat too proud still however he did not despair he knew that if they spoke with ill nature it arose from thoughtlessness and that it was at any rate with the mother only necessary to point out to her the benefit she could confer to arouse a kindly feeling within her i think you're wrong there miss louis said father john i think he not only did think of her but does think of her and i tell you what i know that if feemy mcdermott had the great blessing which you have and that is a kind good careful mother to the fore she'd have been married to him before this but father john said the kind good careful mother what is there to prevent them marrying if he's ready i always pitied feemy being left alone there with her father and brother but if captain usher is in earnest i don't see how twenty mothers would make it a bit easier for her don't you mrs McEwen? then it's little you know the advantage your own girls have in yourself don't you think a man would prefer taking a girl from a house where a good mother gave signs that the daughter would make a good wife than from one where there was no one to mind her but a silly old man and a young one like thady a very good young man in his way but not very fit mrs McEwen, to act a mother's part to a girl like feemy that's true enough but then why did she make all the world believe he was engaged to her if he wasn't and if he wasn't why did she let him go on as though he was being at all hours i'm told with her at ballycloran and if they are not to be married why does her brother let him be coming there at all i know you're fond of them father john and i'll be sorry to think ill of your friends but i must say it begins to look odd you're right anyhow in saying i'm very fond of them indeed i am and so is yourself mrs McEwen and i know though you speak in that way to me you wouldn't say anything that could hurt the poor girl anywhere but just among ourselves if it wasn't in a kind mother with such a heart as your own especially in one she'd known so long in whom could a poor motherless friendless girl like feemy expect to find a friend god forbid i should hurt her father john and indeed i'd befriend her if i knew how but don't you think yourself now she's played a foolish game with that young man why as i never was a young lady in love i can't exactly say how a young lady in love should behave but my dear woman look at it this way i suppose there's no harm in feemy wishing to get herself married more than any other young lady oh dear no father john quite right she should and every one seems to think this captain usher would be a proper match for her why barring that he's a protestant of course he's a very good match for her oh as to his being a protestant we won't mind that now well then mrs McEwen, under these circumstances what could feemy do better than encourage this captain i never blamed her for encouraging him 
only that she should have gone the length she has unless he downright proposed for her but he has downright proposed for her no father john said louis he has though really exclaimed liddy has he though really exclaimed liddy then why in the name of the blessed virgin don't he marry her said the mother that's poor Feemy's difficulty you see mrs McEwen. now if any man you approved of were to make off with miss liddy's heart and i'm sure she'll never give it to any one you don't approve of why of course he'd naturally come to you or her father and the matter would be settled but Feemy has no mother for him to go to and her father you know can't mind such things just now but she has a brother in short if he meant to marry her it would soon be done where there's a will there's a way but that's where it is you know young men and what they are a deal better than i do and you can understand that a young man may propose to a girl and be accepted and afterwards shilly-shally about it and perhaps at last change his mind altogether merely because the girl's friends don't take care that the affair is regularly and properly carried on now isn't that so mrs McEwen? indeed father john it's all true well that's just feemy's case may be after as you say having given the young man so much encouragement she'll lose him because she has no mother to keep him steady as it were and fix him and no blame to her in the matter either is there mrs McEwen? why if you look at it in that way of course she's not so much to blame of course not said father john obliged to be satisfied with this modicum of applause of course not but it's a pity for the poor girl you'll think he'll jilt her altogether then i don't think he means it just yet but i think he will mean it soon unless indeed mrs McEwen, you'd befriend her now me father john if you'd take a mother's part with her for a week or so it would all be right and i don't know a greater charity one christian could do another this side of the grave than you could do her what could i do father john said the good woman rather frightened for she would now be called on to take some active part in the matter which perhaps she might not altogether relish what could i do you see ballycloran is three miles out of this and i couldn't always be up there when usher was coming and though i believe i'd be bold enough where my own girls was concerned i'd be shy of speaking to a man like captain usher when it was no business of my own as for that i believe you'd never want wit or spirit either to say what you'd wish to say to any man and that in the very best manner it's true enough though you couldn't be always up at ballycloran but why couldn't feemy be down at drumsna father john paused a minute and mrs McEwen said nothing but looked very grave now be a good woman mrs McEwen, and ask the poor girl down here for a fortnight or so i know liddy and louis are very fond of their friend and feemy would be nice company for them and then as you are acquainted with captain usher of course he'd be coming after his sweetheart and then when feemy is under your protection of course you'd speak to him in your own quiet ladylike way and then take my word for it i'd be marrying them in this very room before christmas wouldn't we have dancing upstairs eh miss louis mrs McEwen still said nothing and even supposing usher did not come down here and nothing was done why it would be evident the match was not to take place and that usher was a blackguard then of course feemy must give up all thoughts of him and though maybe she'd grieve a while it would be better so than going on as she is now up at the old place with no one to give her any advice or tell her what she ought to do or say to the man anyway you see it would be doing her a great service come mrs McEwen, make up your mind to be a kind good neighbor to the poor girl and do you and the two young ladies go up to ballycloran and ask her to come down and spend a week or two with you here but perhaps said louis feemy won't like to leave ballycloran and come so far from her bow because she couldn't see him here as she does there you know father john 
Why, Miss Louie, I don't think you know how she sees him. I believe he goes and calls there, much as you'd like your beau to come and call here, if you had one. Indeed, Father John, when I do have one, I hope I shall manage better than to be talked about as much as she is, anyway. I hardly think it would do to ask her at present, Mother. You know Mr. Gaynor is to be here the night of the race ball, and we've only the one bed. Come, come, Miss Louie, I didn't expect to hear you say a word against your old friend. Why should you be less good-natured than your mother? You see she's thinking how she can best do what I'm asking. As for old friends, said Louis, I and Miss McDermott were never so very intimate, and as for being ill-natured, I never was told before that I was more ill-natured than mother. But of course mamma will do as she likes, only she can't very well turn Mr. Gaynor out of the house after having asked him to come for the races, that's all. And Miss Louis flounced out of the room. Come, Mrs. McEwen, continued Father John, think of the benefit this would be to Feemy, and you can't have any real objection. The race ball is only for one night, and the girls will be too tired after that to think very much of sleeping together. But you seem to forget. Very likely Mr. McEwen wouldn't like my asking her. You know I couldn't think of doing it without asking him. Oh, Mrs. McEwen, that's a good joke. You'll make me believe, won't you, that you're not as much mistress of your own house as any woman in Ireland. As if Mr. McEwen would interfere with your asking anyone you please to your own house. But you see the girls are against it. I hope they are not against anything that would be charitable and kind in their mother. But if they were, I'm quite sure their mother shouldn't give way to them. Wouldn't you be glad to have Miss Feemy here a short time, Miss Liddy? Indeed, I'd have no objection if Mamma pleases, Father John. There, you see, Mrs. McEwen, I am afraid I said something rude which set Miss Lewis back up, but I am sure in her heart she'd be glad of anything that would be of service to Feemy. Come, Mrs. McEwen, will you drive over to Ballycloran this fine morning and ask her? But suppose she won't come. End of section twenty. The McEwans, part one.